Monster Hunter has always been one of my favorite game franchises of all time. I have put hundreds of hours into Monster Hunter World as well as Monster Hunter Rise. I love the new Monster Hunter titles, but I always keep coming back to the more classic Monster Hunter games. I started my journey as a hunter with Monster Hunter Freedom 2. This was one of the hardest games I'd ever got my hands on at the time, and I still remember thinking that killing some of the easiest monsters in the game was a great achievement. Looking back now, I realized that I was just really bad at the game, and going back to fight these monsters again with the experience I have now feels even more rewarding than it did all those years ago. Slaying the Gyadrome in a matter of seconds has to be one of the best feelings when this guy was a headache for me when I first picked up the game. This is one of my favorite aspects of the Monster Hunter series, learning the game mechanics and using them to your advantage. Over the years, Monster Hunter has changed many of its game mechanics, some for better or worse. There are some new features that I feel like the game design has taken a step back rather than forward. I got the idea to make this video after watching many of Patrician TV's analysis videos on various different video games. He made a very lengthy Marwin video that led him to create an even longer Oblivion and Skyrim video. I write this now knowing that I never could have imagined I would make such a long video myself. Initially when I set out on writing the script to this video over a year ago, I thought it would only be an hour or two long. As I wrote more and more, it quickly grew to the length of the video we now have today. Monster Hunter is one of those games that rewards the player for understanding its mechanics. Being ignorant to the game mechanics will leave the hunter unprepared for the challenges the game has to offer. This stays true, for the most part, through most of the Monster Hunter titles, but over time some of the game mechanics have changed or been taken out completely. For instance, paintballs were the first and only reliable way to track a monster on a quest for 13 years until Monster Hunter World introduced the Scout Fly. The Scout Fly was a fresh, new way for the hunter to track a monster, and in a poll I did, most of you guys like the scout flies more than the paintball tracking method. Instead of paintballing a monster you would first need to locate, the scout fly method has your hunter locating clues to pick up on a monster's scent by finding tracks or markings left behind. The scout flies would then lead your hunter to more of the monster's tracks until you eventually found the monster, or enough clues for the scout flies to guide your hunter directly to the monster's location while also marking it on your minimap. I and many players love this fresh new approach to hunting monsters. So why did Capcom go for the brain dead approach with Monster Hunter Rise? Yeah, the maps are completely open now, but I refuse to believe this same scout fly method couldn't have been implemented to track the monsters, rather than just plopping the monsters on your minimap. That is why when I play Monster Hunter Rise, I use the paintball kunai mod so I can go back to actually hunting down the monsters the old fashioned way. Getting back on topic, learning how to use the paintball is a simple task, but it will save you hundreds of hours of your life searching for an unmarked monster. Especially if that monster is a Camellios that can go invisible, making it almost impossible to spot at a glance. Also, if you really wanted to know the monster's location, you could just use the auto tracker skill that will give you the Monster Hunter Rise experience. If you played the old Monster Hunter games upon release and you didn't have the internet, you would only have the game references to go off of for information about the game. While these references are extremely useful, some of the descriptions only hint at how certain skills or items work. Vague hints are nice, but solid information and numerical values are superior. This is one aspect that has been greatly approved upon in the newer games, having in-depth descriptions for the various different skills. Luckily, many years later we have a huge archive of information documented by the fans of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Much of the information provided in this video will be from various different wiki and game FAQ pages. So a big thanks to all the authors on the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite game FAQ, as well as the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite wiki page. I will do my best to credit these sources as I use them, but I will also have a credit section in the video's description. Now let's say you only had the game information to go off of, you could still find a ton of useful information within the game itself. Even without the references, the Monster Hunter experience is built off of trial and error. Do you keep bouncing off the monster? Upgrade your weapon to increase its sharpness level. Can't hit a fast moving target? 
Switch weapon types to accommodate the monster you are fighting. Do you always feel underprepared for the quest you are on? Spend more time before the quest preparing by eating a good hearty meal and checking your inventory to make sure you have all the items necessary for the monster and location you will be hunting at. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is constantly challenging the hunter with new monsters to slay and maps to fight at so you must adapt to the situation or triple cart trying. For example, Kezu is one of the urgent quests the hunter must complete in order to continue to the next level of difficulty. Before Kezu, all the monsters had eyes that could see you, giving you the ability to invincible dive. With this monster being blind, it technically can't see you so no monster theme music will play, making this an eerie fight while also taking away the ability to invincible dive. Kezu out of its rage state is a slower moving monster that uses electrical attacks to paralyze its prey. Fighting this monster head on without positioning in mind will most likely result in your hunter being carted back to base camp. I haven't talked about any weapons yet, but this is one monster I would recommend the player pick up a ranged weapon for. The heavy bow gun to be specific. See back in the older Monster Hunter games, guns can be upgraded with money instead of materials. You can use the very first heavy bow gun given to the player, then upgrade it and it will have some of the highest DPS available in the early game. When I first started playing Monster Hunter, I used the longsword, but now replaying the game I know the heavy bow gun is a better option as it is safer and more reliable. Along with this gun doing a ton of damage, it can also shoot fire elemental ammo. With the Kezu being weak to fire, this is one of the best weapons you can use against this monster early on in the game. While Longsword isn't a bad choice, if you overcommit to a combo, you will contribute to your own demise. Learning from my mistakes, I switched the gun because it is much easier to roll out of the way of an incoming attack from a distance than it is from being up close. Now, I am no writer, so this video probably has a thousand or so grammatical errors any proficient writer could probably point out. With that being said, I did have to rewrite and reread some of these sections in order for me to achieve the quality I was looking for. When I first set out making this video, I never imagined I could write a script that has more than 70,000 words while also being longer than your average movie. This video isn't meant to be watched in a single sitting, although if you do, I applaud you. Rather, it's meant to be more like an audiobook experience you can throw on time to time to chisel away at. Therefore, this video will have timestamps for more of a chapter-like experience. I will, however, still put up somewhat relevant background gameplay or pictures to complement what I'm talking about in each section of the video. Let's now take a look back at how Monster Hunter started and evolved over the years into the franchise it is today. One quick disclaimer before I get into anything, this is a Japanese game and I will be talking about a lot of Japanese words, so I am sorry if I mispronounce anything. Monster Hunter was developed by Capcom, a Japanese video game company established in 1979. But before Capcom became the company we know and love today, its success can be traced back to a single man, Kenzo Sujimoto, also known as the father of Capcom. Kenzo Sujimoto founded IPM in July 1974, that would later become IREM with Sujimoto as its president. Kenzo Sujimoto established IRM Corporation in May of 1979, later changing its name to Sambi in 1981. Sambi released IMP Invaders and Capsule Invaders during the Space Invaders arcade craze in the early 1980s. This was basically a ripoff of Space Invaders that use a color monitor instead of the original black and white. Due to poor performance, Kenzo Sujimoto was forced out of his position at Sambi after the Invaders boom. He would then go on to found Capcom two years later on June 11th, 1983. Capcom was originally a sales company for Sambi and Sujimoto was the president as well as the representative director for the company. Later that year, Capcom would release its first arcade coin game, Little League. Capcom and Zombie would go on to release another arcade game, Fever Chance then finally releasing their first home video game, 1942, a vertically scrolling shooter for the NES in 1985. Two years later, Capcom would release two separate games that would become some of their top performing game franchises to this day, these being Street Fighter and Mega Man, both released in 1987. As of this year, Street Fighter has sold 49 million copies across all its games. 
Mega Man also being a hit has sold 38 million copies across all of its games as of this year. In 1989, Zombie and the old Capcom would merge to become the Capcom as we know it today, with Sujimoto continuing to serve as its president. Kenzo Sujimoto's oldest son, Haruhiro, would later on go to serve as Capcom's president, taking his father's place in 2007, while Kenzo became the chairman of the company. Haruhiro has been a part of the company since graduating college in 1987, but it's Kenzo's younger son we owe our monster and addiction to, Ryozo Sujimoto. Ryozo being the third son in the Sujimoto family was not held to the same expectations as his older brothers allowing him to pursue his passion for game design. Ryozo started as a planner in his father's company in the year 1994. Ryozo has a part to play in online gaming as we know it today, working on both Auto Modalista and Resident Evil Outbreak, guiding the direction and planning of these games. Ryozo once said in a games interview by Kenza McDonald, In some ways, Monster Hunter was the accumulation of those games. The more we did with online features, the more experience we gained and the more we were able to implement better features. Monster Hunter was taking Capcom's renowned best-in-class action gameplay and putting it into an online cooperative environment. Ryozo being the producer and senior slash executive producer on all Monster Hunter games since Monster Hunter Freedom, the Monster Hunter franchise owes its success to the Sujimoto family. With Capcom beginning in Japan, we will now take a look at the impact Monster Hunter had on this country. Monster Hunter was first released in Japan for the PS2 way back on March 11th, 2004. It later made its way to the West that same year on the 21st of September. Monster Hunter is classified as a fantasy-themed action role-playing game, or ARPG. Taking a look back, one of the popular ARPGs back in the early 1980s was a game called Dragon Slayer. Later on came an even more popular ARPG, Zelda. These games paved the way for more in-depth action RPGs in the future. Games such as Ultima Underworld and The Elder Scrolls Arena come to mind when talking about RPGs in the early 2000s. So how does Monster Hunter fit into this genre? Well, you can't roleplay as a blacksmith or a farmer, you can play with a variety of different weapons and playstyles. Your role slash playstyle is even more relevant when you hunt online with other hunters. With armor skills and their accompanying abilities, you could be a high DPS hunter, focusing on doing as much damage to the monster as possible. Or you could be a support hunter with the wide range skill, giving you the ability to heal your teammates when necessary. Hammer users can stun a monster by bonking the head, while sword users can focus on the tail to sever it. I prefer to play as a gunner now, but I used to main longsword when I first picked up Monster Hunter Freedom 2. Only experimenting with different weapons in the training area or buying them because they looked cool. If you've played any of the older titles, you already know I was always broke because the weapons had such good designs. So how did Monster Hunter take Japan by storm to become a countrywide sensation? With the first Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter G, and Monster Hunter Dose all being made for the PS2, Capcom decided to test their product on a handheld device with Monster Hunter Freedom. Monster Hunter Freedom is basically just a western port of Monster Hunter G for the PSP instead of the PS2. Monster Hunter G added G rank as well as many of the subspecies we know and love. <laughs> Green Plessy on <laughs> today. With Pokemon increasing in popularity around this time, I suspect Capcom wanted a product to rival the success of Game Freak's new hit. Around the time of development for Monster Hunter Freedom, Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green were among the most popular handheld games at the time. With these games being on the portable console, the Game Boy, players could not only just play at home, but also on the commute to work, as well as on a lunch break. The only thing is, Pokemon was a single player game, one thing Capcom definitely capitalized on. While Monster Hunter Freedom wasn't as widely popular as Pokemon was, Monster Hunter encouraged players to hunt together to take on the more difficult quests in the multiplayer mode. Now let's fast forward to when Monster Hunter Portable 2nd G had come out in 2008. In the interview, Call Me Mr. Monster Hunter, the man who turned a Japanese curiosity into a global smash, Kenzo MacDonald wrote, Wherever you looked in Japan in 2008, someone was bent over a tiny PlayStation Portable Games console, 
PSP, and that someone was probably playing Monster Hunter. From clusters of young men playing on groomed lawns outside universities to suited salarymen on packed trains. The game had friends, family, and work colleagues banding together to track and fight gigantic fantasy creatures. You had a good chance of finding a game to join if you pulled out your PSP in any public place. This was all possible because the PSP had ad hoc connectivity that allows wireless communications between devices within a close proximity. This would allow up to four players to all hunt together in the same lobby. With such a high population density in Japan and the growing success of the Monster Hunter franchise, these quick hunts provided the perfect distraction for people on breaks or commutes to work. In fact, Monster Hunter Freedom became Capcom's first million copy seller with a huge majority of the sales coming from Japan. In another article, Toshi Nakamura had this to say about the success of Monster Hunter within Japan. The fact that friends are playing the game acts as an incentive for people to join in as well as keep playing. In Japan, a country with imperial origins, there is often enormous pressure to fit in communities. When something is popular among one's peers, it is best to get in on the action, or at the very least know what all the hubbub is about. While this mindset has lessened in the years of democratic rule, it remains embedded in a large part of society. I would have loved to live in Japan during this time, hunting with friends and family, co-workers and strangers. Instead, I had a hunting party of three, and we would fall in love with Monster Hunter Freedom 2 for the PSP. Monster Hunter Freedom 2, or Monster Hunter Portable 2nd as it was known in Japan, was the second Monster Hunter title made for the PSP. Releasing in Japan February 22nd of 2007, then six months later coming to North America on August 28th. In March, Monster Hunter Freedom 2 sold 348,000 units in Japan, equating to over 80% of Capcom's total sales in Japan for that month alone. Monster Hunter Freedom 2 would later become the first PSP game to sell 1 million units in Japan. To say the least, this game was a hit. I bought a PSP off Craigslist when I was in middle school. Lucky for me, the seller had a few games to go with the console, Monster Hunter Freedom 2 being one of them. I remember my brother, his friend and I all playing through the first few large monster hunts. I was terrible and could barely beat the Bouldrum, while my brother and his friend could slay the Kutku and Kezu. Eventually, they both got PSPs and we had our hunting party of three. Living in the West, I was lucky to have anyone to play with back in the day. None of my friends had even heard of Monster Hunter. These would have been my only fellow hunters until Monster Hunter Try years later, so we had to make do. We all used long swords for the most part, with Kirk using hammer or hunting horn here and there. I have fond memories of the three of us all hunched over in my brother's room, grinding out quests to upgrade gear or complete the next urgent. If you didn't know, each hunter had to post their individual urgence to complete it and continue to the next level. That means if we just got to the Shin Garin urgent, we had to fight it three times in a row for all of us to get into high rank. While this was nice if the monster we were required to fight had decent gear, but with quests such as the two high rank Tiger X was a nightmare to complete three times. Another example is the three urgents Yes, I said three urgents required to enter G rank. That meant the three musketeers had to complete nine urgent quests to become G level hunters. Often, Kirk would somehow solo quests and get ahead of my brother and I. Probably because he was more skilled, but this always baffled me. Now I know I was just a noob because I have soloed much of this game myself as the writing of this video, but doing hub quests online is definitely the way to go. Without a chat system, players relied on real-life communications to hunt efficiently and effectively. Many times the three of us would embark on a quest only for one of us to forget potions, hot slash cold drinks, whetstones, etc. Then ask the humiliating question, can you spare some x slash y? This happened more times than I can remember, but it was always nice to know that someone had your back. Nowadays, if you forget all your items, a quick trip to the tent and you will be fully restocked. The old Monster Hunter games really made you think about what items would be necessary to complete the quest. 
Monster Hunter Freedom 2 continued growing the roster of monsters from the first games in the series. IGN gave the game an 8.3 score compared to Monster Hunter that received a 3. Oh wait, no, that's the movie. Monster Hunter 1 received a score of 7.2. But what is odd to me is Monster Hunter Freedom Unite received an 8 by IGN. I'm guessing because in the review, Greg Miller stated... Unites in my UMD slot and every praise and complaint that I had with Monster Hunter Freedom 2 is here, along with a few new ones on both ends of the spectrum. Why you ask? Well it's because Unite isn't a sequel to Freedom. Unite is a special edition. I'm sure Capcom and the rapid set of Monster Hunter fans out there are going to try to convince you otherwise, but calling this a sequel is crazy talk. This review was wrote by Greg Miller, who I suspect never made it to high rank. While I don't believe you need to beat the game to write a review, especially with the older Monster Hunter titles playing by yourself, but Greg was not wrong. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is not its own game and merely expands on the base game. I do think the game really shines when you have at least one other hunter to play with. I do agree that anyone who's expecting a whole new game would be disappointed to find that Monster Hunter Freedom Unite only expands on Freedom 2. DLC was a thing, but not in the sense of a Skyrim DLC where you can buy an expansion to the base game. To be fair, Pokemon may be to blame for this expansion game where they would release Ruby and Sapphire, then Emerald later on, almost being the same game with a few new Pokemon and some new story elements. With Monster Hunter Freedom Unite just expanding on Freedom 2, I will now continue this discussion focusing on Freedom Unite while still mentioning what was added between Monster Hunter Freedom 2 and Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Upon starting the game, we have a few options to choose from. First we can choose our language, and then next to the main menu has the options of New Game, Continue, Gallery, Options, Download, and Data Install. For the most part, this menu is self-explanatory. I'll come back to this menu, but for now let's focus on the New Character option. Selecting New Game will present you with three different options. New Character Creation, Import Monster Hunter Freedom 2 Character, and Import Monster Hunter Freedom Unite Character. If you had a previous save for Monster Hunter Freedom 2, you could bring that character over or add an existing character. Selecting the Monster Hunter Freedom 2 import option, the character's name will be imported but the sex and appearance may be altered. This will also not affect your guild card. For the Monster Hunter Freedom 2 import character, your item box storage will be increased to 800 and bows can now be upgraded even further. Some gear and items have been adjusted between Freedom 2 and Unite. If you have changed your gender, some armors may be converted to their other gender counterpart, as some armors are exclusive to males or females. Also, all equipment will be unequipped due to the value adjustments or skill changes. Titles and awards will also be imported, but some previous titles and awards might not fulfill the requirements for those titles in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. However, your option settings, training school records, and some of the gallery, as well as downloadable quests will not be transferred over. While you did get to keep most of all your equipment from the Monster Hunter Freedom 2 import, the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite import works much differently. Selecting the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite import option will inform you that your old save will remain even after being imported over. While you can still change your sex, appearance, and even your name now, Weapons as well as armor will be converted to their monetary equivalent in Zenny. Also, items rarity 1 through 3 will be imported, but any items of rarity 4 or higher will be converted to their equivalent in Zenny as well. And lastly, your monster list will return to its default state. Despite these options, I will be creating a new character for the purposes of this video. I will be using a previous save for certain sections in this video referring to Samurai when needed. Now let's take a look at character creation itself. While you are limited in what's customizable with your hunter, most appearance changes will be hidden under armor anyways. First and foremost is the name of your hunter. You will not be able to change this after the completion of your character. Next is the hunter's gender. 
This is probably the most drastic changing option as male and female armors are completely different in their styles, with some armor being exclusive for each gender. These exclusive armors are just a ruse, different only in name as well as looks, with these skills remaining the same so you won't be missing out on anything for each gender. Going down the list, you can choose 8 different clothing types, 32 face types, 27 hairstyles, 16 hair color options, as well as the ability to change the values of the red, green, or blue. So if you want some anime pink or blue hair, it is possible. Coming to the last option, you can choose between 17 different voices. Now I'm sure most of you know that there is no voice acting in the older Monster Hunter games. The newer games do have voice actors, but the older games consist of Monster Hunter language for its characters while the hunter grunts and shouts during combat, or cries out in agony before carting back to base. Again, many of these options don't matter like the clothing that will be covered up by armor, but the hunter's voice will be ever present in every hunt, so don't pick anything too annoying as you'll be stuck with it for the rest of the game. One more thing, you will be able to change your hairstyle and clothing within the game, but you will not be able to change your hair color. With all that out of the way, your new hunter is ready to begin his or her journey. After creating a new character, the game begins with an intro cutscene of our hunter journeying into the snowy mountains, then showing us the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite logo, followed by a gruesome scene, a herd of popo lies dead at our feet. Next, a Tiger X, the flagship of Monster Hunter Freedom 2, appears at the peak of the mountain, jumping onto our hunter, sending us tumbling off the mountain as the screen fades to black. I assume we already carted twice on this quest because the last thing we can recall is plummeting to an icy grave, only to awake at Polk Village. We lay in a bed that once belonged to the hunter standing above us. The older fans of the Monster Hunter series know that the older games have very shallow story elements to them. This would get better with the release of Monster Hunter Tri having a plot revolve around the earthquakes shaking Moga Village. The village chief believes the earthquakes to be caused by the Lord of the Seas, Laggy Acris, so our hunter is tasked with slaying this beast. Monster Hunter 4 would achieve what some fans call the pinnacle of storytelling out of all the games in the series. If you wish to know more about Monster Hunter 4, I recommend you watch an analysis video on that game, as it is one of the few Monster Hunter titles I have never played. I still commend the writers of Freedom 2 and Unite for putting the small amount of effort they did into the story of this game. The plot is simple. We are the new hunter in town, taking on quests given by the Elder Chief. Most quests are requested by random NPCs, never to be seen in-game, but the urgent quests come directly from the village Elder Chief. We encounter Tiger X on one of our first quests gathering popo tongues in the local snowy mountains. This encounter reaffirms the notion that this monster is not to be trifled with. Well, not for a novice hunter at least. The setting is more vast. With Poke Village serving as our home base, the hunter may take on quests across the ever-expansive world. Eventually, with a high enough hunter status, we are able to embark on quests from the first Monster Hunter games, now referred to as the Old Jungle, Desert, etc. The cast of characters, however, is quite small if you exclude the plethora of quest givers. Besides the hunter or hunters of the world, most NPCs serve as quest givers or item shops, with a few NPCs simply serving as info dumps, dropping random trivia throughout the game. We are the protagonist, with the various monsters being our opponents. I would even go as far as saying that the Tiger X is our nemesis, a constant reminder that we must improve our skills to someday hunt this beast that threatens Poke Village. Monster Hunter takes place from the hunter's perspective, so make of what you will with how your character handles the problems presented. Lastly, the conflict is never ending. With over 400 quests to embark on, our hunter has a long journey ahead of them. The retired hunter stands over us as we doze in and out of consciousness. He informs us the snow had cushioned our fall, but we suffered from frostbite and had a large bruise on our back as well as a bruise to our ego. The screen fades back to black with the hunter telling us to rest up and regain our strength. 
Upon waking a second time, we are in a small room with a single chest. Newer fans of the series will quickly realize that within the village we may move our character, but the camera is in a fixed position, following the player around within the village. In the room, we see that the chest contains 11 different weapons and cold resistant armor. This is an early introduction into complete armor sets that have active armor skills. Before World and Rise, the player had to plan out mixed armor sets or make complete sets to have active armor skills. More on this later. After leaving the house, the entire village has something to say to the player. One of the villagers that we can talk to was the man standing over us when we awoke. He informs us that he saved us from the cold on the mountain and brought us back to the village. He was the local hunter for Poke Village, and now we are. The weapons and armor he once used have been donated to us. I wonder how he managed to hunt anything past a cut coup, considering we are given level 1 bone weapons with yellow sharpness. Excluding the bone shooter of course, that heavy bow gun, fully upgraded with a power barrel, can basically get the player all the way to high rank. But the heavy bow gun isn't upgraded. So that begs the question, how did this former hunter manage to hunt anything? Maybe the only monster he had to defend the village from was a low rank Gyadrome. I know these are supposed to be starter weapons, but don't tell the player that they are from the old hunter and then have them be terrible. A better alternative would have been telling the hunter that the weapons provided were donated by the blacksmith or his cat partner because they have a few extra swords lying around. My theory is this retired hunter probably sold most of his equipment to purchase power seeds for his demon drug addiction. If the game developers wanted this hunter to give us a weapon, they could have done something similar to the Argosi dude in Monster Hunter 3 Tri, gifting the player his longsword after we defeat Sedeus. Gifting the hunter a powerful weapon towards the end of low rank or even just before entering high rank. That way we would have something to take on Tiger Rex or at least be upgraded to do so. At least he admits they're crappy weapons and proceeds to tell us to use the sword? Is he referring to the sword and shield or the long sword? Maybe he is referring to the great sword. Is he intentionally vague, meaning for us to use the blade master weapons, or did he just forget to say shield after sword? This game was translated from Japanese, so I wonder what got lost between the versions of the game. This poor translation leads to many of the quest descriptions to be quite amusing if you choose to read them. Why would this hunter tell us to use the sword when the heavy bow gun is the superior choice? Well, I already know the answer to that question. Bow guns are expensive, especially early game when the hunter has little to no zenny. If you factor in the price of ammunition as well as combines, you will be spending hundreds, maybe thousands in between quests. Also, don't forget to purchase your book of combos 1, 2, and 3 because you don't want to be crafting garbage. On top of that, if you forget bullets or you did not bring enough, you're basically screwed. Normal level 1 does 10 HP per shot and there are no base camps to restock at. Your only hope of getting more ammo is checking the item box, which usually doesn't provide a lot of ammo. While gunning isn't the best option for new players, anyone familiar with bow guns in the newer game should have no problem. Although bow guns are expensive, the heavy bow gun can be a powerhouse. Bow guns don't upgrade in a tree like the rest of the weapons. Instead, you purchase the upgrades with Zenny, as well as add attachments to them. More on weapons later. We are also provided armor that grants cold resistance, since cold and hot drinks are a thing in this game. Now let's take a look at Poke Village itself as well as its inhabitants. This is an agricultural village in the Furahia Mountains located near the Snowy Mountains. The Snowy Mountains being the first accessible map through the village quests. Taking a look at the loading screen, we can get a rough idea of the surrounding locations with Poke Village dead center. According to the feline at the entrance of the village, a group of felines settled where Poke is located long ago. This would explain the numerous felines living in this village. Personally, I have a deep attachment to this village and its accompanying theme. While this village is quite small, I would like to believe the game designers were going for a quality over quantity approach. Poke Village consists of the player's home that has an attached kitchen, the guild hall outpost, and a few vendor stands. 
If you are familiar with Kokoto Village from Monster Hunter 1, you will probably see that Poke has almost an identical layout of NPCs and shops. Poke Village also has a training area and farm, but I will get to those in a bit. Poke is on a snowy sloping hill with notable landmarks such as the giant rock made of matchlight ore located behind the village elder, as well as a mysterious cave located at the farm. Across from the player's home is the blacksmith and general store. You may purchase weapons and armor from the feline at the blacksmith's counter, but only level 1 weapons, most of which you already possess. This feline also sells low-level armor that doesn't come cheap at this early state in the game. I do purchase the leather armor so I have a reliable gathering set, something all players should invest in. The smith next to the cat allows you to craft weapons and armor with the materials you acquire during quests, as well as from the farm. The smith does inform us that bows as well as melee weapons can be upgraded with materials, but bow guns can only be upgraded with money. Also mentioning decorations can be crafted when the time comes to add skill points to our armor sets. Finally, mentioning that if we get new materials, we know where to come. I remember the first thing I would do upon defeating a new monster was go to the smithy and stare at all the weapons and armor I will most likely never craft. I made a bad habit of this, clearing a quest, going to the farm, and then browsing the weapons and armor while my brother and his friend would be waiting for me in the guild hall. The next NPC down the line is the local merchant vendor. She carries everything you could possibly need, but ever since the last hunter has now retired, the supply routes have dried up, so not everything is available. Our success is tied to this village. This is evident because as we progress through the ranks, the more items the general store will carry as well as the equipment available at the blacksmith. Furthermore, we can upgrade our farm dictated by what level we have achieved. My personal favorite NPC is the Granny Peddler. She stocks up on, in her words, unwanted items, acquired for rye cheap. So she sells them for right cheap. I would argue that this is a bad business model, but who am I to judge? I'm just the highest producing power seed farmer on the market. Actually, I'm not a farmer yet. First we need to buy one power seed first. If Granny has one, buy it, then plant it at the farm. I can't mention Granny without bringing up downloadable content. There were several forms of DLC that I will get to later in the video, but one of the most useful things that you could download was simply named Peddling Granny Items. This DLC adds loads of useful items to her inventory not previously available. Raw meat as well as dragon toadstools are a few of the extremely useful DLC items you can buy from the granny. I also noticed I had downloaded the Poke Points DLC that gives you 3,000 Poke Points. Finally, we can talk to the Chief. The Village Elder endlessly rumbles as the player is engaged in dialogue. She hopes we can be convinced to settle down as the new village hunter, and the house we awoke in is now ours. God, I hope the mortgage is already paid off. I already have enough to pay for food and supplies, add on all the weapon upgrades, and I will have to resort to selling power seeds to the feline kitchen staff. She proceeds to say she wants to evaluate our strength by having us complete some easy quests. We need to rest up a bit before we can take on quests from other areas. This is followed by some comments on the guild hall, how we can hunt with other hunters there, a description of the local merchant, as well as mentioning the training school. At the end of the dialogue, the chief gives us 1500 zenny to fund our power seed operation. With the chief mentioning the local guild, I decide to take a peek inside. The guild outpost isn't anything to write home about just a medium-sized building with a handful of NPCs. The quests given within the guild hall are separate from the Elder Quest's progression. If you don't want to do any village quests, you can play through the game without even doing a single village quest. The guild quests will progress the farm same as if you progress through the village. This also applies to the kitchen staff. Five NPCs are important in this guild hall. The three individual guild quest ladies for each respective rank, pink for low, green for high, and yellow for G rank. 
Around the corner is the item merchant. They sell basically all the same items as the merchant outside in the village. The only exception is the power and armor charms that can only be bought from the merchant within the guild hall. The last notable person within the guild hall, besides the lady next to the quest counter, is the treasure hunter dude. He offers treasure quests with the objective being to gather as many points as possible. The items found can only be obtained through the treasure hunting quests. One quest for each of the locations you are able to embark on in low rank, excluding the fortress and other special locations. Each of these quests have a large monster that you can slay to carve special accounting items. I will say this now before I forget. I am playing Monster Hunter Freedom Unite on an emulator, and before you go to the comments saying I'm not representing the game to how it came out, Monster Hunter Freedom, Freedom 2, and Unite all released for the PSP. I'm sure many of you are aware that the PSP only has one analog stick for controlling the movement of the hunter. When Monster Hunter came to the Wii with Try, a must-have to make for a more enjoyable experience was the Classic Controller Pro. This had two analog sticks. Yes, I know the PS2 had two analog sticks, but instead of having them for movement and the camera, they were for movement and attacking. Not very ideal, I know. Capcom would actually regress in this aspect with the 3DS version of Monster Hunter, but at least they had the lock-on feature. One thing that was criticized by the IGN reviewer for Monster Hunter Freedom 2 as well as Unite. Funnily enough, a lock-on feature would be added to Unite, but only for the iOS release. Yes, at one point you could play Monster Hunter legit online with your iPhone, iPad, or iPod. Sadly, this game is no longer updated, meaning anyone who purchased this game for 15 plus dollars, myself included, can no longer play this game. Getting back on topic, I chose to emulate this game because A, yes, I do own a copy of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, B, I already played hundreds of hours on the PSP not using the claw technique, so I can still give my opinions on how it ran with the original system. C. Recording footage would have been a nightmare to figure out using the PSP. D. I can play with an Xbox controller allowing me to look around using the second analog stick, something I dreamed of years back. And finally, E. Hunsterverse. For you that don't know, Hunsterverse is a Discord community that allows you to play with other players online. That's right, my dreams of hunting with strangers in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite are now a reality. This makes the guild quests significantly easier versus trying to solo the entire game. I also think most people would agree Monster Hunter is at its best when hunting with a party. Also, Super Rad already soloed the game, and I wanted to do a different spin on Monster Hunter Freedom Unite for my video. One more thing, yes, I did use cheats in the making of this video. Nothing too overpowered like 4 times damage or already having paintballed monsters, making it like a Monster Hunter Rise experience. Just an HP cheat for research purposes only. If you're a new hunter to the game and choose this option at the beginning, you will need to visit and complete some training missions before doing any quests for the village. The training area is accessible from the beginning of the game. You will actually have to do the beginner training in order to do further quests if you chose the option I am a beginner upon character creation. To unlock monsters for the training area, the wiki states you simply need to encounter them, not defeat them. This is true, but it will not work for the Tigerex encountered on the key quest, a sinking feeling for the village elder. Let's first talk about the beginner training, as this was my first experience with Monster Hunter Freedom 2, because I chose the I am a beginner option. I will say this did come in handy, there are a number of different training missions having you gather various different items such as honey, raw meat, or a carnivore egg, with the last quest tasking you to hunt a Gaia drone. There is also weapon training that tasks you to hunt 5 Gaia Prey with the various 11 different weapon types. Another form of training is the solo training. 
There are three different types of solo training, the battle, special, and G training. But I will discuss these later in the video, for now let's focus on the beginner training. While the beginner training is very simple, I believe it is perfect for any new hunter to the game, showcasing the game's most basic features. The first quest we are tasked with is gathering two raw meat. This is the equivalent of the training quest in Monster Hunter Freedom, and I believe Tri carried on this tradition as well. You can only access Area 1 and 2, and the only monsters on this quest is the Popo, a docile creature that will flee if any in its herd are attacked. Our instructor will go over basic controls, as well as what buttons to press to interact with the item box, menu, etc. You will only receive 150 zinni upon completion, but this quest requires no contract fee, so there is no penalty for failure. You will be forced to use the sword and shield, however it has green sharpness and does decent damage, so it should only take a few swings to take down the popo. Our instructor will go over basics such as pointing out our health bar and how to use the map as well as deliver items to the red box. How our bed at the base camp can be used to rest up and gain any lost HP, pressing triangle to swing our sword and square to put it away, even going as far as telling us to maintain our sharpness level. As our weapon becomes dull, our weapon's power will decrease, and at low enough sharpness we will begin to bounce off the monster. The sharpness gauge is the blade located below the health and stamina bars. After completing the first mission, our next task is to deliver one well done steak. Our instructor says he will be strict and harsh from now on, and we must learn how to be self-sufficient. He points out how to navigate our menu to find the quest info tab, so we may confirm the details of our task. He also points out the timer by our health and stamina, running out of time being the only way to actually fail this training mission. On this quest, we are given a portable split used to cook raw meat. The instructor will go over our stamina bar and how we will need to maintain it during our hunts with items such as a well done steak. When cooking a steak, a song will play and when it's over, the meat will quickly go from rare to well done, then to burnt. For argument's sake, after we have returned to base camp, the instructor will explain the abandoned quest function. When you abandon a quest, you will completely return to your status before you begun the quest. Everything acquired during the quest will disappear, so if you need an item, it is better to fail the quest than abandon it. The next mission is to gather two honey. Oddly enough, we are given a pickaxe as well as a bug net, with our instructor even telling us to grab them. He says bugs are hidden in thickets and ore can be mined from the bedrock. We are granted access to area 3, 4, and 5 for this quest, but the honey can be located in area 4. This does not require us to have a pick or bug net, but I suppose the devs just wanted the hunter to be able to get these items from all the gathering points present. One nice thing about these training missions is that any account items you gather you will receive points for. When entering area 1, a short cutscene will show the hunter what a bug thicket looks like. The same can be said for the honey gathering point in area 4, as well as the mining point in area 3 if the hunter chooses to explore more of the snowy mountains. I'm glad the game developers did this because the mining points are obvious, but the bug thickets can be hard to see if you're not paying attention. Also, playing this on the PSP, you better have really good eyesight if you want to locate some of these gathering points. Same goes for the honey gathering point. Although it's not as hard to see as the bug gathering spot, it is tucked away at the end of a tunnel, somewhere I probably wouldn't be looking for honey if I didn't already know where it was in the first place. For our next task, we are to deliver one potion. This is a lesson in combining items, another topic I will explain in more detail later on. We must use our knowledge from the first tasks to gather items to craft a potion. The herbs can be gathered in area 1 to the left of the entrance to area 2. It is odd that a cutscene doesn't play showing the hunter this herb gathering point, as the same has been done for all the previous gathering points. That includes the cutscenes showing us the ore as well as the bugs that weren't even quest objectives. 
Even the mushrooms in area 3 are shown to the player upon entering this area. This is where you will find the blue mushrooms. While doing research for the training school, some people around 12 years ago were asking where to find the herbs. That's the only reason I bring this up. At the beginning of this quest, our instructor will explain how the combining mechanic works. We must navigate the menu and select the combine tab. This will bring us into our menu and all combinable items will be highlighted. Everything else will be grayed out. Selecting an item will gray out any items that are not combinable with the first item selected, leaving only combinations highlighted. We must select our herb and blue mushroom to combine into a potion. Upon delivering the potion, the instructor will further explain that combines have success rates. This is tied to what book of combos you have in your inventory, as well as the results section. Some items, when combined, can result in getting multiple of those items. The training missions don't get any easier after this. The next mission is the dreaded fishing tutorial. Outside a few quests and treasure quests, fishing is probably the most useless mechanic in the game. For starters, all the fish you would want for combining can be bought from the granny. All other fish, to my knowledge anyways, can be caught using the fishing net. The fishing net is a bit janky, and after hundreds of hours of gameplay, I still don't know the best spot to fire it at. With that being said, it is considerably more user friendly than the basic fishing mechanics. Out in the field, you must have bait in order to fish, similar to how you will need a pick to mine. In our instructor's infinite wisdom, he has placed a worm in the item box to use as bait. We are greeted with another cutscene upon entering area 1, showing us the fishing point. The instructor will explain that when we cast our bait, we will see our bob in the water. The fish will swim over to it and try and eat the bait. When the bob sinks below the surface of the water, that is our indicator to grab the fish. These fish can be tricky though. Sometimes they will only nibble at the bait, so we must wait until the moment is right. At least we only need to deliver one fish to complete this quest. Basic training number six has our hunter traveling back to the snowy mountains to transport a carnivore egg back to base camp. Entering area three, the cutscene will show us the bone pile where the carnivore eggs are located. The instructor explains we will receive poke points for delivering items such as eggs, but for this quest, it is our target to deliver the egg so we won't receive any. But if we did deliver more than one, we would. Once we have gathered an egg, we are told by the instructor that eggs are very fragile and can break. If we run out of stamina while running, we will become tired and drop what we are transporting. Also, any damage taken will also cause us to drop the egg, so we must avoid any monsters when heading back to base. For the last training mission, we must slay the pack leader, Gaia Drone. Our instructor has a plethora of advice to give us in the advice tab within our menu. The advice covers almost all the items we are given for this quest. This is also our first introduction to a hunting quest. There are two ways to complete these quests, killing the monster or capturing it when it becomes weak enough to do so. We are provided with a shock trap as well as trank bombs, which we will need in order to capture the monster if that's what we choose to do. Along with a trap, we are provided flash bombs, a great way to stun the monster and prevent it from escaping. This makes it an easy target to deal some damage. We are provided with hunter armor for this quest instead of the beginning Mufu armor that provides cold resistance. This is our introduction to using hot drinks so we can maintain our stamina gauge. We are free to explore the entirety of the snowy mountains on this quest because the Gyodrome patrols the frosty peaks of the mountains. This is a fairly easy quest, granted all the items we are provided with. I used a single flash bomb and within 30 seconds I had slain the beast. Aside from the basic training, we can take on the weapon usage section of the training. I'm going to skip this because I plan to go into more detail on the weapons later in this video. The weapon usage is 11 identical quests where the hunter is tasked with hunting 5 Gaiaprey. I remember it like it was yesterday. I chose the longsword for this training mission and fell in love with the weapon, especially the Velociprey design on the sheath. 
With the training missions complete, any beginner hunters should be ready to go out on quests for the village elder and even take on the guild hall. Before we get into the quests, I would first like to talk about Poke Farm. Poke Farm is adjacent to a river, making the lands extremely fertile. Another positive to being on the river is the abundant species of fish. When we first begin the game, Poke Farm only has a few things to offer, but as we rank up, more upgrades will become available to purchase. To buy or upgrade each independent gathering point, you will need to acquire Poke Points. There are several ways to obtain these points, with the easiest and quickest way in my opinion being the training school, which I will discuss later in the video. Basically, after each training quest, you will receive points based on multiple different factors. Each weapon has a multiplier assigned to it based on how easy each weapon will be. Of course, how easy each weapon will be is up to the individual hunter's skill. I believe this multiplier is a combination of how much damage each weapon does combined with the armor skills available on each set. Other factors include how quickly the quest was completed, the total value of all the items within your inventory, as well as what monster has been slain. As I said before, I will cover this in more detail when I talk about the training school quests. These quests can be repeated to farm poke points. Another way to get poke points is to do treasure quests, another subject I will come back to. A little edit, after grinding some treasure quests for the special items that can be gathered to complete your guild card, I will say that you can rack up points fairly quickly, but I still prefer the training quests over the treasure quests for grinding points. The last and most practical way to gain points is to gather account items while out on any quest for the Elder, Nekot, or the Guild. These items will be converted into points and zinni, either when they are delivered to the red box or after completing the quest. Gathering these items early in the game isn't as rewarding as it is within the higher ranks where more valuable items will become available. Once the player has unlocked the volcano, you can mine coal coming in at 150 points each. Sometimes monsters will leave behind drops, I will refer to these as shinies that will often be Wavering Tears that come in at 500 points, or in the higher ranks can be Wavering Sobs, these being more valuable at 2,500 points. Account items can be a good source of points on the go. I still stand by the training schools as being the superior way to gain points though. Once you have obtained points, you may spend them on numerous different things. First and foremost, you are able to purchase upgrades for your farm with your hard earned poke points. But before I dive into the farm, I almost forgot what else you can spend your points on. From the same fella standing by the entrance to the farm, you can also buy armor spheres, jewels used to craft decorations, as well as a few miscellaneous items. I forgot about this because, first off, everything is overpriced, and secondly, almost all of these items can be gathered in abundance, and you will rarely need extras unless you have a ton of armor sets that need to be upgraded. Now for the farm. At the beginning of the game, you will have access to one field row as well as the level 1 mining, fishing, and bug thicket. The field row 2 and 3 are available to purchase as well as the next fishing pier right off the bat. The mushroom tree is also available to be bought at the beginning of the game, and I would recommend anyone starting the game to buy all field rows as these can be utilized to farm various different seeds, herbs, and berries. Now the most valuable item you can farm is power seeds. These can be sold for 140 zenny each. You can fertilize crops with worms, dung, and wavering droppings. You can tell if a field row is fertilized by the number next to it in the menu while speaking to the cat that maintains the farm. A number 1 will indicate the row is not fertilized, while a 2 will mean you will receive up to 3 more items, and a 3 means that you can receive up to 9 items. Fertilizing with worms will bring up the level by 1, while using 5 worms each time, meaning to increase to level 3 in one field row will use 10 worms. To get all three rows would require 30 worms. 
Dung and Wavering Droppings are more efficient with one dung, bringing the fertilized level to three, meaning three dung will increase all rows to max, and one Wavering Dropping will fertilize all rows to max. Meaning, Wavering Droppings are the most valuable resource for fertilizing your farm, but is also the most rare. Dung, on the other hand, is more common, and both Wyvern Droppings and Dung can be found in Dung Piles. Funnily enough, if you gather by the Popo at the farm, you have a chance to gather a single Dung. If you do buy these field rows, it is going to cost you. The second row costs 1000 points, and the third row costs 1500 points. This will bring in the hunter about 3000 extra zinni after every quest by farming power seeds with fertilizer. If the player only did key quests through the village, but maintained the farm, they would have over 70,000 extra zinni. This is why it is crucial to farm power seeds, especially if you plan on upgrading armor and weapons, let alone purchasing them. Also, it is much more beneficial to farm and sell power seeds using the zinni to buy crops from granny than it is to farm any other crop. Instead of farming sleep herbs, I can buy over a hundred of them just by selling all the power seeds I grew after a quest. This would only cost me 2,475 zenny, and I would still have 500 to play with. That is, with her discounted prices, it would almost be 5,000 full price, but this is still better than farming a bunch of sleep herb. And with the DLC installed, we can get our hands on almost anything we could want that's not a full-on monster part. Items such as flash bugs and dragon toadstools, just to name a few. Later on, the player has the ability to purchase a mushroom tree that can be upgraded as well. As useful as this is, it is overshadowed by Granny Peddler's inventory once again. This is only true though if the player has the DLC installed, if not, it is much more valuable. This will be a nice steady stream of mushrooms the hunter can use to craft various different items such as coatings or consumables. Especially the blue mushrooms early on can be used in combination with herbs to make potions. This pairs nicely with the beehive to craft mega potions that is available after defeating the low rank Blinganga for the elder or the Shingarin for the guild. As the player progresses through the village and guild quests, you will be able to upgrade your mining and bug thickets with higher level materials being available as you enter high MG rank. The farm becomes increasingly beneficial for the player to visit as you progress through the game, but the time spent at the farm will also increase. This usually leads me to only gather from a few certain points, rather than collect everything at the farm. Oh boy, I almost forgot about the fishing points. This is probably because it is far easier to once again buy from the granny than try to farm or gather fish. Fishing is probably the least interesting thing in all of Monster Hunter. I get it, it's a hunter-gatherer game at its roots, but out of all the things Capcom got rid of from Monster Hunter, we still have fishing in 2022. And I would be surprised if they got rid of it by Monster Hunter 6. Happy, but surprised. Why have we lost environmental effects like a freezing snowy mountaintop or a blistering hot volcano? The ability to actually hunt the monster, but we still have requests to go fishing for something. I know it's already integrated into the crafting system, but they have already changed the crafting formula for several items. That was a little off topic, but you can eventually upgrade the pier as well as get a fishing net that is not more enjoyable to use, but I still want to live after using the fishing net versus the fishing nodes that lead to chronic depression, especially when you lose your bait to a fish that you didn't even want. The mining and bug thicket have a final form, so to say. Bomb mining will have you sacrifice a feline that has surprisingly high blast resistance giving him a bomb of our choice to use to mine. Using a large barrel bomb plus gives the greatest rewards. This is another farm that can benefit from the granny peddler as you can buy all the resources needed to craft large barrel bomb plus to use in the mines. Lastly is the bug tree. The cat next to the tree will give you three hammers to choose from. A white, 
black or gold hammer with each having different rewards. The bug tree is very useful in G rank when you need to obtain phantom butterflies for almost everything. I will say the new farms are more streamlined, being quicker and easier to use, but I have such an attachment to poke village farm versus the farm palamute training area thing in Rise I only visited when a speech bubble would appear, reminding me that it even existed in the first place. I will talk about the cave when the time comes, but after that, Trenya is the last part of the farm. This is another Monster Hunter Freedom Unite addition to the base game of Monster Hunter Freedom 2. You can download a DLC to have the opportunity to purchase Trenya from the beginning of the game, Otherwise, you will have to slay Kezu for the Elder's urgent request. Trenya is a very valuable resource. As you progress through the game, more areas will become available for Trenya to travel to. You can send Trenya out, sponsoring him with poke points, and in return, he will bring back items from that location. And sometimes, these items can be very useful. You can send Trenya out to all the main maps, but not the old map locations. At the beginning of the game, you can only send him out for 200 points. Defeating Kezu will allow you to send him out for 300. Clearing the Elder's request for the troublesome pair or defeating the 5-star Shangaren through the guild will allow you to send him out for 500 points. To send him out for 1000 points in the mountains, jungle, desert, and swamp, you will have to reach high rank. 1000 points becomes available for the forest and hills as well as the volcano once the hunter has reached HR5 or unlocked Nakote's 8 star quests. The 1000 point option rewards may include high rank materials. Finally, the 1500 point category or G rank, the snowy mountains, jungle, desert, and Swamp will become available once you have reached HR7. Reaching HR8 will unlock the forest and hills as well as the volcano for 1500 points. Now, I'm not sure where the Great Forest comes into play as the wiki doesn't have much information in regards to what and when it will be available. But if I had to guess, you first need to hunt in this location, so higher G rank, then I'm guessing it follows along with the forests and hills slash volcano tiers of unlocks. In order to craft the death stench armor I use in high rank, you need 10 sinister cloth. One way of obtaining this item is to send Trini out to various locations to have a chance to retrieve this item. I probably spent tens of thousands of poke points just to complete this armor set, but it was well worth it. Other rare items such as Waverian Stones can be obtained by sending Trenya to the Forest and Hills for 1000 points, even large Waverian Stones for 1500 points. Each area and point level has a table split into 7 categories, General, Mineral, meaning ores, and whatnot, Fish, Insect, Unique, Monster, and finally, Jewel. If you want to see the full item list, go check out the wiki page. With the farm out of the way, let's now focus on different types of quests you can encounter throughout your hunting journey. Now that we have looked at the farm, it is time to discuss the various quest types your hunter can embark on. Some of these quests have already been glossed over in the training section of the video, such as gathering quests. Gathering quests consist of the hunter being tasked with retrieving a certain amount of items and delivering them back to base camp. For instance, in the first level of the Elder's Quest, we are tasked with gathering 5 mountain herbs. These are account items, but if you only gather 5, you will not receive any poke points upon completing the quest. Gathering quests are usually fairly easy unless it involves carving monsters for random items with low spawn rates. Gathering quests may also ask you to gather items such as eggs that require the hunter to traverse the map while holding an item that if dropped will break, meaning you'll have to start the process all over again. While on these egg quests, some maps may also inhibit your progress with boulders and annoying monsters spawning after you've picked up an egg slash ore. I wonder if the game developers took inspiration from some MMO quests and recreated them for Monster Hunter. The easiest and most useful type of gathering quest in my opinion is the Paw Pass quests. 
You are sent to a location with the only items provided to you being a map and a paw pass. Once the paw pass is delivered, the quest will be completed. That means you have 50 minutes to hunt and gather whatever items you would like. So let's say you need two light crystal to craft a weapon. Go out on a swamp paw pass quest and mine in the caves. Need dung to fertilize your farm? Send it to the jungle, desert, or forest and hills and gather from the dung piles. On my samurai profile, if I was ever bored, I'd go out on pop pass quests, collecting dung until I had a healthy amount. I did this so often, when I'd go back to hunting quests, I wouldn't have to worry about running out of dung for my farm. This meant I would have extra zinni on hand from selling all my power seeds. Another example is, let's say you just made it to G-Rank and want to explore the old maps. Grab the map from the box and familiarize yourself with the local flora and fauna. Pop pass quests are basically like expeditions in the new games, but you can fail these quests if you die three times. The next quest type we will look at is slaying quests. These quests mainly consist of hunting a certain number of small monsters to be completed. Although some difficult quests fall under the slaying quest category, such as the elder dragon quests. We already encountered the most basic of these quests in the training, Slay 5 Gaia Prey. Once 5 Gaia Prey have been slain, the quest will be completed. The Elder Dragon quests are completed once the hunter has done enough damage and a certain amount of time has passed, or once the monster has been slain. Elder Dragons cannot be captured, so killing them is the only option for maximum rewards. Also, if the Elder Dragon is repelled but it was close to death, it will always return to a certain amount of HP. For example, let's say I'm fighting a Teostra and I bring its health all the way down to 100. The next time I fought this monster, its HP would be all the way up to 4000. This will repeat indefinitely until you actually kill the monster. Meaning, you could theoretically fight the same Elder Dragon forever without killing it if you cannot do enough damage. And now that I think of it, this is almost like a DPS check similar to what we have in Monster Hunter World with the Alatrion. I actually discovered this testing out different weapons on Elder Dragons and I was confused when the monster I was fighting had around 1000 HP or so, but then the next quest it was all the way up to 4000 HP. Another note is, if you repel the Elder Dragon, but it hasn't dropped below the 4000 HP mark or whatever it may be, it will stay at the same amount of health. Hunting quests, however, are pretty straightforward. You either kill or capture the monster, or live long enough for the timer to run out. I guess I should mention that you can faint on a quest two times, after that the next death will result in a quest fail. Fainting on a quest will also decrease your reward until hitting zero on the third death, with each faint subtracting one third of your reward money. Yeah, I don't know if it goes off the number of arrows that hit him, or if it goes off like damage done. Oh, oh my god. god. You can get the poison darts now. Victory. This means if four hunters embark on a quest, three of them dying will result in a quest fail. Also, you could be the guy who triple carts on the same quest, failing the mission for everyone. I will say from personal experience, this is probably one of the worst feelings, knowing that if you just stayed at base camp, maybe the quest could have been completed. Of course, you must learn from your mistakes, so I don't recommend that you let other hunters carry you through the game. Getting carried will only harm yourself because you will progress to harder quests without actually getting any better in skill. This is probably my main gripe with the Defender weapons and armor because it almost as if you're getting carried through the game by another hunter and then when the real game hits aka Master or G rank you won't have any skills to defend yourself. Hunting quests can have up to two monsters on them, and if this is the case, each monster will have decreased HP. But don't let the decreased HP fool you, the monsters will hit just as hard as they do on solo quests. Some quests will have you fight multiple of the same monster, but the monsters will keep spawning for the entire quest, meaning you can hunt as many as possible before time runs out. These quests are perfect for anyone farming those particular monster parts. 
After at least two monsters have been killed or captured, supplies will be delivered to the box, including a Paw Pass ticket. A new addition to Monster Hunter with the release of Freedom Unite was the Epic Hunting Quests. This is a quest where the hunter or hunters are tasked with hunting two or more monsters one at a time. But when you carve from the monsters, you will only receive Mega Potions. I can't tell you how many times I would do one of these quests with 10 Mega Potions in my inventory, not to use any of them because I'm usually a gunner, then realize I won't be able to carve anything because my inventory already has the max amount of Mega Potions. Of course, if you think you will need the extra potions, bring them just in case, but if you ever wanted to farm Mega Potions for some reason, Epic Hunting Quests would be the way to do it. Or you could just farm them like a regular person by going to the farm. If I did know it was an epic hunting quest, I would only bring three to four mega potions just in case and maybe a few potions if I wanted to be on the safe side. That way, by the end of the quest, I could have up to 10 mega potions. I'm not exactly sure why Capcom decided to hand out mega potions, but my guess would be if your hunter already had two full rows of items, they aren't going to have enough room for the possibility of carving up to nine or ten different items from the large monsters on the quest. The two remaining quest types I will cover in more detail in their individual sections of this video, but for now I will give a brief overview. Treasure Hunter quests can be done in the guild through Treshi. Treshi is the small dwarf miner looking dude. These treasure quests are not your typical type of quest. Rather, they are focused on obtaining as many points as possible while hunting and gathering out in the field. There are also five rare items in each location you must gather in order to fill out your guild card. The last quest type are the special quests. These quests are not obtained through normal leveling. Instead, each quest will be unlocked when its conditions are satisfied. Of course, there are also training quests, but I'm not going to count those on this list, and I will also cover those in their own section. With all the quest types out of the way, let's dive into the locations you can hunt, gather, and explore within Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. While Monster Hunter Freedom Unite only introduced us to one new location, this being the Great Forest, originally from Frontier, it did bring back four of the main map locations from the first games in the series. There are a total of 23 different locations to hunt at, with 11 of these being normal maps, 8 special locations, and 3 arena maps. Each main map is broken up into different areas, each serving as its own little arena for the hunter to hunt and gather within. Some areas are only accessible by the hunter and other small monsters, such as the feline den in the forest and hills. Unlike the newer games or even the iOS port for Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, gathering points will not have an icon indicating what as well as when you can gather. This means you must look for plants, mushrooms, bug thickets, and cracks in the wall that look out of place enough to be gathering points. Some gathering points will be more obvious than others. For example, the dung piles are pretty obvious that they are a gathering point. Same with a lot of the mushroom or honey gathering spots. Now take a look at this gathering point in area one of the jungle. Can you spot it? I didn't know about this gathering spot until I was making this video doing treasure quests because a guide said you had to gather bug nets from the spot and it took me 5-10 to 10 minutes of walking around the area spamming circle only for me to give up. I started heading towards area 9 and noticed this little bush pile on the ledge. For some reason I thought the crack was the area barrier so I never tried to walk over there, let alone gather this spot. If any new fans to the Monster Hunter series do try out this game, I recommend you pull up a resource map of the locations you are hunting in to familiarize yourself with all the gathering points, especially for the old map locations as those gathering spots are less obvious than the normal maps in this game. 
While you are provided some information within the game itself about these maps, it's mainly just flavor text describing each area through the eyes of a mine guard geographer exploring each area with a few bits of useful information here and there. That is for the Monster Hunter Freedom 2 maps, the old maps added in Freedom Unite are the research notes written for their instructor tasked with finding more information on these old map locations. Each map will also have small monsters. There are a total of 23 different types of small monsters in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Some are map specific such as the Belango or Popo which only appear in the snowy mountains, or the Cephalos that are only found in the desert locations. Other monsters such as the Vespoid and Maelinx can be found in just about all the main map locations. Both of these small monsters are extremely annoying and you will find yourself slaying these small monsters in an area before worrying about anything else. Let us not forget about the Blafango as well. Vespoid are flying insects that have the ability to paralyze your hunter. Not super ideal when you're trying to survive attacks from a large monster in the same area. Maelinx are a black species of Linian related to the felines. They may appear cute, but this is just a ruse. Sporting a bandana that covers their face and a cat's paw shaped weapon, they will attempt to attack your hunter once they have caught sight of you. If they are successful in hitting you, an item will be taken from your inventory. Slaying them before they run away will put the item back in your inventory. However, if the Maelinx is successful at fleeing you, they will dig underground and disappear. If you wish to recover your stolen item, you will have to seek out the Maelinx den on the maps that have them. Once the den is located, you can gather from the pile of rubbish to recover your item. Unfortunately, the volcano maps do not have Maelinx dens, so you will be unable to recover your items if they are stolen. One final annoying small monster is the Shakalakas. They will often hide near gathering points under fake items. These masked creatures are extremely dangerous and will inflict serious damage in spite of their small size. They can also poison you as well as use bombs and even know how to drop fake shiny objects that will explode. The first map most players will encounter in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is the Snowy Mountains. This map is introduced in Monster Hunter Dose. Although newer fans of the game will know this area as the Arctic Ridge added back into Monster Hunter for Monster Hunter Generations. The Snowy Mountains has 8 different areas excluding the base camp as each base camp is never given a numerical value to its area. And it is broken into 3 different regions. The temperate lowlands make up area 1 and 2. Base camp is settled in the woods overlooking a river that spills out from this freshwater lake located at the base of the mountains. With the snowy mountains being a cold location, you are advised to bring hot drinks with you to fend off the cold. If you venture into the caves or mountaintops without consuming a hot drink or having the cold resistant armor skill, your maximum stamina will decrease much faster over time than it normally would. With that being said, if you ever run out of hot drinks and your weapon requires stamina consumption, you are better off abandoning the quest or checking the box for extra hot drinks. Most monsters will roam areas 6, 7, and 8, but on occasion monsters may venture down to area 1 for a drink from the freshwater lake. Also, monsters retreating to lick their wounds will sleep within the mountain in area 3. At the peak of one of the snowy mountains in area 8 is a shed Deora skin. We can actually unlock the Deora ecology video of this molting process. If you bring a pickaxe to the snowy mountains, you can mine from the shed skin and receive various different ore as well as kezu whelps and decayed dragon scales. With the snowy mountains being one of the starting areas, don't expect to find too many rare items until you reach high or G rank. Next is the Jungle, a map introduced in Monster Hunter 2. The jungle is located near Jumbo Village, the main setting of Monster Hunter Dose. This is a tropical location that receives heavy rainfall and is surrounded by bright blue waters. During the day, the map will have bright blue sunny skies, but at night will experience rainstorms that cause the land bridge formed between areas 3 and 10 to flood over, making area 10 inaccessible. Also, the rain will prevent any bombs from being placed outside. Players from Monster Hunter Rise may recognize this map because it received a facelift with the release of Sunbreak. 
But let's not forget that this map was also brought back for Monster Hunter Double Cross. With thick vegetation, it can sometimes be hard to spot monsters through the leaves and vines. Similar to the Snowy Mountains, this map has three different regions. Thick jungle, beachfront, and the caverns. Within the caves, monsters will come to rest with Area 7 housing a wyvern nest while also having a large crystal structure. Notable features in and around the jungle are the presence of long abandoned structures that closely resemble ancient Mesoamerica civilization buildings. One of these pyramids is located in Area 10, and I love that they added the interior of this pyramid in Sunbreak. These pyramids are evidence of a long lost civilization within the world of Monster Hunter. Evidence of this ancient civilization can also be found in the old jungle, as well as the megalithic structure that is the tower. One location you must always come prepared for is the desert. Once again, this location was added in Monster Hunter Dose, and one new mechanic of this game being a day and night cycle. This feature is a game changer in the desert because during the day, the sun roasts the sandy plains, making it extremely hot so hunters must bring a cool drink to combat the heat, while during the night, the temperature drops to freezing. So at night, you must bring hot drinks, but no matter what the time of day is, Area 6 being a cave filled with water, it is always required that you use a hot drink. Also, during the night, the water levels in Area 6 will rise, cutting off the access between Area 4 and 6. Areas 2 and 5 are very large desert areas with cephalos commonly found swimming through the sand. If I haven't mentioned ledge cheesing yet, the desert is definitely the place to do it. Areas 3 as well as 9 contain ledges the hunters may climb onto while large monsters are stuck down below. Both the snowy mountains and the jungle contain similar ledges, but not as big as the ones found in the desert. I do believe these cheesy ledges were intentional because it makes sense for online play, mainly for the gunners of course, because they'll have a spot to shoot the monsters. Most attacks from monsters such as the Diablos will not be able to hit the hunters on this ledge, of course if they are far enough from the ledge's edge. Now imagine you're hunting online. A gunner could climb atop the ledge and get a few shots off while the monster is distracted. If this monster is a Monoblos or Diablos, if they charged at the gunner, their horns would get stuck in the wall, assuming you haven't broken them already, leaving the monster open for attacks from both the melee users as well as the gunner. Definitely not the most legit way to clear quests, but it is a great resource for gunners to use, especially if they're hunting solo. Another location that changes depending on the time of day is the swamp. Also being introduced in Monster Hunter Dose, I'm starting to see a trend with the day and night cycle this game had. While Monster Hunter Freedom Unite does not have a day and night cycle, rather having each quest assigned a time of day, you will still experience how the time of day would affect your hunt. Now all we need is the seasons to return come Monster Hunter 6. During the day it rains in the swamp, but at night toxic gases rise up through the ground creating pools of poison. These poison pools are more annoying than anything because they are easy to avoid and will only poison the player, not the monsters. It would have been a cool idea to have the monsters get poisoned if they were in the pools long enough, similar to the environmental traps we have in World and Rise. This is one map all hammer users should visit as soon as possible when starting the game because in areas 3 and 9 both have large crystal formations that can be mined from to obtain light crystal. Light crystal is a rare ore used to craft armor and weapons. Specifically, the crystal hammer requires two light crystal, making it a great low rank hammer to use. Also, don't forget your hot drinks if you want to venture into these caves as they are very cold and will sap your stamina. Taking a look at an original map from Monster Hunter 1, the forest and hills doesn't feel as terrible as the other old maps. The forest and hills is the starting area for the first game and the rest of the maps in this game are now deemed the old jungle, desert, swamp, etc. 
Now the thing is with these Monster Hunter 1 maps is I really detest all of them, except for the forests and hills. It may have something to do with me being more familiar with the forests and hills because the other older maps only become available once you reach high rank offline and G rank online. I really wish instead of the jungle revamp for Rise, they would have remade this map in Sunbreak. Climbing up to the Rathian Den would have been a breeze compared to Monster Hunter Freedom Unite with the use of the Wirebug. I will say though, one of the biggest downsides is the size of Area 9, probably being one of the worst areas to fight a monster in the game. It is a long, narrow area with no real large openings in it, and if you do get caught in the narrow section, you're better off running for your life than making a stand. Making things even worse, in the first gen games your camera was closer than normal, making it almost impossible to see what you were doing. Another notable area is Area 12, being the feline village the player can gather rare materials from in the higher ranks. Also something I saw in a speedrun is that in Area 11, it's not just a short hallway, but you can actually climb up the waterfall and mine from an ore outcrop. Me just learning this probably 10 years after I bought Monster Hunter Freedom 2 is mind boggling that I never knew that you could climb this ledge myself. It is the little things that make this research for Monster Hunter Freedom Unite even more enjoyable than it already is to learn about one of my favorite games of all time. Another odd thing about this map is in Area 3, Rathalos is notorious for doing his flyby attack and flying off the map to land in the background of the hills. Continuing the trend of day and night changing the map, we now look at the volcano, not to be confused with the volcano in the third gen games. Yet another map added in Monster Hunter Dose, the volcano as you would expect is extremely hot requiring a cool drink for most of the areas. During the day, this map is easy enough to traverse, but at night, volcanic activity will create lava flows that change the layout of some areas. Also, during the night, Area 8 will be cut off, so no extra mining points for you. On the topic of the volcano, it is home to many rare ores, making it one of the best spots to mine if you are in need of rare materials. This is the only map that changed between Monster Hunter Freedom 2 and Unite with the additions of Area 9 and 10. These areas were added because this is where the Lava Sleoth can be found in addition from the Frontier series. Lava Sleoth is also the only large monster that will be able to go to these two areas. There are a few arena areas and special maps only used for special monsters and quests. The Tower is one of those maps used mainly for Elder Dragon or Rare Species fights. Now, the tower itself has three or four different versions. I say this because the same map is used, but with some areas being completely left out in some quests. The tower is actually located in the jungle zone, a quote from the notes being an enormous building found within the vast expanse of the jungle, a relic of a different age that pierces the sky. Who, when, why? All of these questions remain unanswered. Further in the notes, it suggests that research is still ongoing and could take months or years to uncover all the tower's mysteries. This statement isn't far off with Sunbreak once again revisiting the tower, or as it is known in Rise as the Forlorn Arena. Swinging back to Unite, the main tower map is made up of 10 areas with the base camp at the bottom and all areas except 10 being the climb to the apex. Now that was Tower 1. Tower 2 is used for the Yama Tetsukami fight. While this is the same structure, the interior areas have been shortened and the top has been modified. Tower 3 is what we know today as the Forlorn Arena, used to battle the silver and gold Lopes. In this area, you can find decayed dragon scales in the ruins, leaving many to believe that the tower itself was crafted from elder dragon materials. Another odd map is the town introduced in Monster Hunter Dose. This area is located around Dunmadorma being part of the Shrade region located east of Mineguard Town. Mineguard is actually the original Monster Hunter's online town similar to Lock Lock from Monster Hunter Tri. Dunmadorma is home to the Elder Dragon Observation Center 
a several hundred year old corporation that locates and researches elder dragons. The head of this corporation being his immenseness, a giant wyvarian. This is a leader of Dondorma as well as the EDOT. A wyvarian, not to be confused with a wyvern, is a human-like race that is actually a distant relative to the dragon-like wyvern. Wyvarians have pointed ears, four-fingered hands, and extremely long lifespans, with many of them living for hundreds of years. You may not know, but many of the NPCs discussed so far are part of the wyvarian race. The Poke Chief, Blacksmith, Treshy, and Granny Peddler, to name a few. Sorry to info dump, but it seemed like the best place to mention this human-like race. The town is also used for Elder Dragons as well as facing off against the Shin Georin, being fitted with powerful weapons such as Cannonballs, Ballista, as well as the Dragonator. Moving on to a similar map, let's now discuss the fortress used exclusively to face off against Elder Dragons such as Lao Shan Lung and the Shin Georin. Well, I guess technically Shen Gaoran is a crab, but whatever. This map was first introduced in Monster Hunter 1, sticking around until Unite and brought back to life in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. This is a linear map with the monster walking down a narrow canyon while the hunters slow its approach. Once the monster has reached the final area, the hunters may use the cannons, ballista, and dragonator in hopes of repelling or defeating the approaching threat. Now let me be honest with you when I say this is the worst siege map ever. At least the worst I have experienced excluding any of the 4th gen maps. The amount of time I have spent on this map simply waiting for the monster to come into range so I can attack it has to be in the days. There are four areas where the hunter can deal damage, each being connected to the base camp where the hunter can rest and gather supplies. Both Lao and Shen move extremely slow and you cannot kill either monster until they have reached the final area. Whoa! <laughs> Kirk's trying to lose us. He's trying to throw the match. <laughs> Kirk, what do you think you're doing? We only have 10 minutes to get 1,000 health down. I wonder how much health G rank Rathalos has. Like 50. Yeah, probably. Maybe 75. Maybe. Zana, what are you doing under there? Yeah, I love how we're just dinking around most of this quest and we still managed to get them down. I have all of my normal twos. I got a ton of my normal threes, all of my flaming. I have, oh, yeah, I have flame oh, combines. He Utilizing the HP cheat, I can see that if the monster gets down to 1000 HP, it will not decrease any further until they have entered area 5. This means no matter how much damage you and your squad does, you are simply wasting time if they have reached this 1000 HP threshold. It kind of makes sense with monsters being notorious for dying out of the area. I'm sure the developers took this into account, but the solution isn't the best. It would have made more sense if the monster could have been carved from in areas 2, 3, or 4 should it have died, only becoming unkillable once it had started crossing into the next area, or before entering into an area. They already have instances like this where if a monster is digging it will not die if it is underground, only becoming killable once it has resurfaced. On top of this being an infuriating area, Lao and Shangren are uninteresting, slow fights where the monster barely even notices you as they crawl through the map, making the fight very tedious and it consists of hit and reposition tactics. Now I may have rose tinted glasses on when talking about the maps present in Monster Hunter Freedom 2 because these were the maps I learned how to play Monster Hunter on, but my mindset towards the first gen maps excluding the forests and hills is completely different. I'll be honest, I really do not like the old maps. Starting with the old jungle, it has a similar Mesoamerican structures dotting the land. Another hint at an ancient civilization that once inhabited this area. I believe all these maps created in Monster Hunter Dose tried to mimic their counterparts while still adding some new features. 
This is obvious when you compare the types of areas in each map. The old and new jungle both have thick vegetation in some areas, a few caves, and a water spot for Plesioth to swim in. The deserts have two large areas, both needing cool drinks, a few shaded area with no need for cool drinks, and a cold cave area where you need to fight Plesioth in. Comparing the old and new swamp, they both have swampy looking areas, some cave areas that require hot drinks that have rare ores inside of them, and a large grassy plains area. Lastly, the volcanoes both feature a couple areas at the base of the volcano not requiring cool drinks and some hot areas leading into the volcano. Lastly, a summit area with mining points, home to some of the rarest ores in the game. It is safe to say that the developers simply copy and pasted the old maps, slapped some new paint, and called it a day. This is me just being lazy, not to go into more detail, but honestly, if you want to have a look at these maps side by side, they're almost identical. Last on our list is the Great Forest, a new map added for Unite, but was actually first introduced in Season 1 of Monster Hunter Frontier. I believe this map was inspiration for being Monster Hunter World's ancient forest map, with the main characteristic being a large tree in the center of the map. Large roots can be seen throughout the map, with Area 8 actually being a cave created by the surrounding roots, making it a nesting spot for wyverns. This map is also home to a feline village that the King Shalakaka can appear at from time to time. This is also where the Narkuga primarily hunts at, with another frontier monster crossover being the bird-like wyvern Hypnocatrice. With most of the playable areas being discussed, let's now take a look at armor and skills you must equip yourself with if you wish to be successful in the vast world of Monster Hunter. Armor is an essential part of a hunter's arsenal. Armor provides protection as well as armor skills that can be offensive or defensive. Along with skills, armor can also provide elemental protections. Armor can be upgraded to increase its defensive value with armor spheres, and decorations can be added to your armor to increase the armor skill points. When I first started playing Monster Hunter, the only thing I paid attention to was the defensive value of the armor. Therefore, I would buy and upgrade whatever armor I was able to craft that had the highest defense. Little did I know I was missing out on useful skills such as attack up or psychic vision. One thing newer fans might notice when crafting armor in the older games is you can actually have negative skills along with the positive ones. This means you have to plan out armor sets to make sure you gem out any negative skills or suffer the consequences. Most skills have a negative counterpart. This means for a skill such as health, as a positive will add HP and take away HP as the negative side. Some skills will completely change how you use some weapons. For example, one of the best gunner skills in my opinion is the auto reload skill. With this skill activated, once you load an ammo type, you can fire it without reloading until you switch ammo or run out. This makes slow reloading heavy bowguns become a powerhouse, with the DPS increasing significantly because you cut out all the reloading time. Another example would be the sword draw skill. When this skill is activated, you have a 100% chance of getting a critical hit when performing an unsheathing attack. This skill paired with a greatsword level 3 charge attack will do insane damage. I remember watching low quality Monster Hunter Freedom Me Night videos with epic music in the background of greatsword users flinching Tigerex every unsheathed hit with a level 3 charge attack as the monster was charging towards them. Each armor piece comes with armor skill values attached to it. For most skills to activate you need at least 10 points in that skill for it to be active. Skills such as attack can further be increased at 15 and 20 points. This goes the same for the negative skills, obviously with negative points. So to activate attack up large, you will need 20 points in the attack skill. Most full armor sets have a few skills activated with usually one negative skill or an incomplete skill. This makes mix sets a little more complex than mix sets we can create in World Slash Rise. 
Programs such as Athena's armor set search are almost essential for making functional mix sets. With Monster Hunter becoming more and more streamlined, it is sad to see negative skills get the axe. It was more risk versus reward when crafting armor sets, knowing while you're getting useful skills, you also had to worry about balancing out the negative skills. Nowadays, the gameplay is more focused on doing as much damage as possible, or at least completing the quest as quickly as possible. I'll be honest, it is nice not to worry about some of these more tedious parts of hunting, but I do miss the methodical approach to it. Armor, weapons, and items all have a rarity value assigned to them. For armor, rarity 1 through 5 are low rank, 6 through 8 is high rank, and 9 and 10 is G rank. Low rank armor is basic, but once you get into the higher ranks, you will see that armor is split between the S series and the U series, with the U series being the subspecies form, even if the monster doesn't have a subspecies, like the Vespoid U series. Once you enter G rank, two more series will be unlocked, with the X and Z series being similar to the S and U, with X being the base monster and Z being the subspecies. Unlike the newer games, each armor set is split between Blade Master and Gunner armors. The only piece of armor that can be worn by both Blade Master and Gunners is the helmet. All other armor pieces must match the weapon type you are using. This makes it so that the Blade Master armor will have its skills that usually benefit the Blade Master weapons, and Gunners will also have the Gunner skills. I do and don't like this system. On one hand, it's nice knowing that you would be benefiting from the skills for your specific weapon type, but you would need to craft a whole new armor set in order to use a gun or sword. On the other hand, in Monster Hunter Rise specifically, it almost feels like some armor sets are just designed for one weapon type in mind, having useful skills for only one class. So if you really like an armor set, but it only benefits sword users, and you use a gun or bow, you're better off crafting a different armor set entirely. In addition to having different Blade Master and Gunner skills, the Blade Master armor will have significantly more defense than the Gunner armor. For example, high rank Silverathalos helmet has 64 base defense, while the Gunner armor comes in at half with only having 32 base defense. It makes sense that the Blade Master armor would have more defense because they are more likely to be hit by the monster versus the gunner who would remain farther away from the monster and it is less likely to be hit. But if the gunner does get hit, they will take a lot more damage. Since the armors are different and cannot be equipped if using the wrong weapon, all armor will be removed if you change from gunner to Blade Master or vice versa. This can be annoying when purchasing armor or weapons. Especially if you want to see the skills of a Blade Master armor while using a gun, it will not display the skills until you have switched the weapon to the appropriate type. Although the Gunner armor has less base defense, it does come with higher elemental defense. There are five elements in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, being Fire, Water, Thunder, Ice, and Dragon. Dragon is one of the more rare elements to acquire for a weapon. Bow guns can only shoot a limited amount of dragon, but bows are more viable as a gunner option. For Blade Master, most of the dragon elemental weapons can be obtained later in low rank and high rank. Dragon is extremely useful when fighting most wyverns and elder dragons. You will actually need dragon element to break the horns of some elder dragons such as Lunestra and Teostra. This would, however, be changed in later games, probably due to confusion. I did think this mechanic was pretty interesting, and it would be cool if they implemented something like this in the newer games. Because in this game, you actually had to plan out what weapon you were going to use for these Elder Dragon fights, or miss out on breaking the horns. This would be a cool concept for fighting an ice monster and having to use a fire weapon. Maybe a Vel'Kana variant can only have its ice broken by fire or dragon element, or the only way to break a fire wavering scales is to use an ice weapon. That way, hunters would need to plan out the hunt before embarking on it. If you only played Monster Hunter World, you might be surprised to hear that you can only craft decorations in this game. 
Grinding for decorations is definitely more of an in-game grind because most low rank armors don't have a lot of decoration slots. But come high in G rank armor, you will have more deco slots for customizing your builds. Trying to plan out mixed sets is a headache if you don't use Athena's armor set search, so definitely look into that program if you want a set with very specific skills. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite also doesn't have any charms, these were added in Try, becoming a staple in the series from then on. But even without charms, you can still cram in 3, 4, even 5 skills onto sets with the right decorations. With better and better decorations unlocked as you progress through the game, the more expensive they will become. Don't be surprised when a deco you want requires a lot of rare materials. Like I said, this is more of an in-game grind. Also, if you need a few more deco slots, don't forget that your weapon can come equipped with a few open decoration slots. As we discussed in the armor section, there are two different weapon classes, that being the Blade Master and the Gunner. With 11 total weapons in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, only three fall into the Gunner category. Light bow guns, heavy bow guns, and bows. The remaining eight weapons fall into the Blade Master category. These weapons include Greatsword, Longsword, Sword and Shield, Dual Blades, Hammer, Hunting Horn, Lance, and Gun Lance. Now, if you have played Monster Hunter Rise, Monster Hunter Generations, or Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, you know that all the weapons in these games have their raw damage shown instead of the bloated values that can be found in the other Monster Hunter titles. I prefer the raw values because it is much easier to compare, let's say, a sword and shield damage to a hammer, versus in games like World and Freedom Unite, at a glance, sword and shield looks like it does significantly less damage than a hammer, but these are the bloated damage values. This means you would need to do the math and find what weapon has a higher raw attack value. I wonder if this is one of the reasons these bigger weapons are more popular because the damage values shown are bigger than the faster hitting weapons. The faster hitting weapons will have less attack than the slower weapons. Greatsword, Hammer, Heavy Bow Gun, Hunting Horn have very high attack values while Sword and Shield, Dual Blades, Lance, Gun Lance, Light Bow Gun, and Bow all have lower attack values. Now, Long Sword is in a bit of a limbo state. Its attack is less than a Great Sword, but it doesn't attack super quickly, but at the same time it attacks quicker than the slower weapons such as the Great Sword. With the right skills equipped, you can make an extremely powerful longsword build. I believe Super Rad used this set giving you Reckless Abandon 3, adding an additional 30% affinity to your weapon. Sharpness plus 1, bringing the Seaplane Gunga Destructor from white to purple sharpness, and the Sharp Sword skill. This skill decreases your sharpness loss by half. One thing I didn't know that I learned researching on the wiki is that the dual blades just come equipped with this skill. I bet without it, you would be sharpening your weapon every 30 seconds with how fast the dual blades can attack. This set and skills paired with the longsword can outdamage many of the great swords in the game, while being a faster weapon allowing the hunter to still roll out of the way of many incoming attacks. Now I won't go into all the math behind how the damage formulas calculate your attack, mainly because I don't know the formulas and I won't steal all the info from the game FAQ on melee damage, but basically your raw damage is calculated by 8 different variables while your elemental damage is calculated by 5 different variables. For weapons that have elemental damage, you simply add the sum of each to get your total damage output. If you wish to learn more on this, I will leave a link to the game FAQ in the description below. With the release of Monster Hunter World, I hope all future games have the damage numbers displayed because this makes it extremely user friendly on seeing how much damage you are putting out. 
Also, the new training areas with the dummy monsters pair nicely with the damage numbers and even show you your total damage output. Going back to the longsword build, one of the factors in the damage formula is your sharpness level. For reference, if you had red sharpness, you would have a 0.5 damage multiplier, meaning you would be doing half as much damage as you would if you had yellow sharpness that has a 1.0 multiplier. Each sharpness level will have a greater multiplier than the last, meaning the damage of your weapon will increase with a new sharpness level being added to it. The C Blangonga Destructor comes with white sharpness, giving you a 1.3 multiplier. With the added sharpness level bringing our weapon to purple sharpness, we will now have a 1.5 damage multiplier. Purple sharpness is a G rank exclusive, and I would say it's almost mandatory for the dense in game monsters that have extremely high health pools. Now with purple sharpness and a skill that decreases the rate at which our weapon will dull, Reckless Abandon 2, that cancels out the negative 20% affinity, this has to be one of the best raw longsword sets in the game. Now to discuss the affinity attribute on your weapon. The percent on the weapon is how often you will get a positive or negative affinity hit. If you have 50% affinity, then you will land a critical 50% of the time. Let's say you're using the Copper Blingonger Destructor without any skills, you would have a minus 20% affinity, meaning 20% of the time you would be landing negative critical hits. When landing a critical hit, you will be doing 25% more damage. On the other hand, if you land a negative critical, you will only be doing 75% of the damage you normally would. More variables for melee damage include class, as well as what type of attack or combo you are using. The weapon classes are the same as when you are talking to the blacksmith, with the pairs being hammer slash hunting horn, lance slash gun lance, sword and shield slash dual blades, and lastly, great sword and long sword, with each class having its own class multiplier. For the combos, each attack has its own multiplier that will factor into the equation for your overall damage. Again, if you want more information on this subject, please visit the game FAQ page. Now, I am no expert with any of these weapons, but I would like to give a brief overview of each individual weapon type. Starting with the greatsword, this is a slow heavy hitting weapon where you must have good positioning to use effectively. The greatsword only has a few moves, but if used properly, can do a boatload of damage. First is the forward slice when you press triangle. Pressing circle will perform a horizontal slash. Combining these two attacks in turn is an infinite combo, triangle, circle, triangle, etc. Good for slaying little monsters, as well as a quick combo when fighting larger opponents. You can also press both triangle and circle together to do an upward swinging attack. This is best used on your fellow hunters after the hunt is completed to send them flying. Last is the charge attack performed by holding triangle. The charge has three levels with one being a little stronger than a regular forward slice and the third doing more than double the damage of a forward slice. A level 3 charge can be a bit tricky to land, but if you get lucky or have the monster in a trap, it'll deal a huge chunk of damage. Great swords can really benefit from the skills such as the sword draw skill that gives you a 100% chance of getting a critical hit on an unsheathing attack. Artisan is another good skill, but that can be said with all blade master weapons. With most weapons, Artisan or Sharpness plus one will add another level of sharpness, bringing a green sharpness weapon to blue or blue to white, etc, etc. Another good skill to have would be high grade earplugs, so when the monster is roaring, you could set up a level three charge attack. Focus is another great skill. This will decrease the time it takes to charge the weapon. Great swords are also one of the best weapons to use when sleeping a monster. The first damage a monster takes while sleeping is multiplied by two, meaning if you did a level three charge attack, it would do twice as much damage as it normally would. One last thing is you can hold R to block incoming attacks, but this will dull your blade, so use it wisely. Next is the long sword, more of a beginner weapon compared to the greatsword, but does also take some skill to get the most use out of it. Longsword is quicker to attack, as well as more nimble compared to the greatsword. This was the very first weapon I fell in love with when I first played Monster Hunter Freedom 2. 
Longsword has a few more moves than the Greatsword, but nothing too complicated like the versions we have in World Slash Rise. Triangle is a forward slash attack that can be used twice in a row. You can follow this up with a stab by pressing circle. If you follow circle up with triangle, you will do an upward slash. A good infinite combo is triangle, circle, triangle, and then repeat. This is a good way to build up your spirit gauge. Pressing triangle plus circle, your hunter will do a horizontal slash and you will move backward. Lastly is the spirit attack. You will get a small multiplier to your attacks once your spirit gauge has been completely filled. This gauge will be used up when pressing the R bumper to perform the spirit attack. Pressing R three times in a row will complete the full combo, but you can also throw in a few triangle or circle attacks in between the spirit attacks for some extra damage. Longsword is a good all-around weapon for element, status, and raw attack, making it very versatile. Not as flashy as it is in the newer games, but it still gets the job done. Just don't overextend while doing the spirit combo, or you could end up riding a cart back to base. Moving on to the sword and shield, this is probably one of the most beginner friendly weapons in the game. Having the ability to get off quick slash attacks, while also being able to block incoming attacks. Its most basic combo being its triple triangle attack, that will land 4 hits. Pressing circle will do a slicing attack, triangle and circle together does a forward jumping attack, good for closing the distance between you and a monster. Holding R will allow you to block, while you can also attack while guarding by pressing triangle or circle. Being such a fast hitting weapon, the sword and shield does amazing damage when it comes to elemental and status attacks. If you ever find yourself in a pickle, your shield could possibly save your life. Just be sure to bring a lot of whetstones, as this weapon hits more often than most, causing the blade to dull quickly. If you guys have any tips slash tricks, or cool armor sets slash skills to use for any of these weapons, please feel free to share these in the comment section below the video. I say this because I only know the very basics for most of these weapons, so it'd be good to hear from someone who mains these weapons that I'm unfamiliar with. One thing that I forgot to mention that is probably the most interesting thing about the sword and shield is you can use items while the weapon is drawn. Simply hold R and then press square on the item you wish to use. If one blade isn't enough, then dual blades are probably your weapon of choice. First, starting with the normal mode, you can do a triple triangle attack. This is your basic combo that can also be followed up by pressing circle. This will make you do a spin move. Pressing triangle and circle together, you will lunge forward to attack. You can also roll and then press triangle to do an attack. Now, dual blades have a demon mode you can activate or deactivate by pressing R. While in demon mode, your stamina will continuously drain until you run out of stamina or deactivate demon mode. This makes skills that affect stamina like runner very useful or you can also drink a mega dash juice so your stamina never depletes for a few minutes. When in demon mode, your combos will do a lot more damage and by pressing triangle and circle together, you will do a demon dance. This is the most powerful attack and can be used at the end of a combo. Dual blades are the embodiment of death by a thousand cuts. Another great fast weapon, perfect for causing elemental damage or inflicting status on the monster. Hammer is an impact weapon, so if you're looking for hit zone information, refer to the impact section, not the cutting. Hammers can cause a KO on monsters if you bonk them in the head enough times. Once KO'd, they will fall over stunned for a decent amount of time, leaving them open for attacks from the rest of your hunting party. The basic combo is the triple pound that does a ton of damage if you get all three hits off. This is done with triangle. Pressing circle, you will do a kidney shot. If you hold R, you will charge your weapon, allowing you to do the remaining few attacks. Note that charging your weapon will drain your stamina. If you're running and let go of the charge, you will do a spin attack. The level 1 charge will hit once, doing less damage than a single triangle attack. The level 2 charge will hit twice. This will do slightly more damage than two triangle attacks. Finally is the super pound or level 3 charge attack. This hits twice and does as much damage as the last hit of a triple combo. 
If you're going for the most damage possible, the triple pound is your best bet, but you will be locked in place while performing it. This makes the super pound more viable for faster moving monsters. Runner and Focus are two good skills to use with the hammer. Runner will decrease stamina consumption, while Focus will shorten your charge times. Hunters who main this next weapon are always tooting their own horns. This is because the hunting horn can play music to buff the user as well as any nearby hunters. It may seem basic at a glance, but the hunting horn is one of the most complex weapons in the game. It also has two modes, but we will focus on its regular attacks first. The triangle attack is a basic swing that can be performed infinitely. Next is the circle attack. This does a poke that can be done three times in a row. Pressing triangle and circle together will cause your hunter to do an over the head slam attack that can hit twice and is the most powerful move. Pressing R is an attack almost as powerful as the triangle swing, and this will make you enter recital mode. In this mode, your hunting horn will play notes based on what attack you do in recital mode. The notes can be found in your weapon's description, and each hunting horn has different notes. The first note is played by pressing square or circle, the second is with triangle, while also doing a decent bit of damage. The third note is played by pressing triangle and circle together, also doing somewhat good damage. Although these attacks do cause damage, unless the monster is paralyzed, stunned, etc., your hunter will be moving extremely slowly and it will take a few seconds for the notes to play. I won't go over every song slash buff these horns can do, but I will mention some of the useful and interesting ones. First of all is the buffs you can do on yourself. I believe all hunting horns can do a double note that is usually the first note twice that will give your hunter a movement speed buff for 3 minutes. This same song played a second time will give your hunter an ESP like effect for 3 minutes meaning your attacks won't bounce off any monsters. These two songs should be mandatory before fighting any monster. A few cool tunes are songs that give you buffs such as Attack Up Large, When Pressure Large, Heal 60 Points, Divine Protection, and Infinite Stamina, just to name a few. This makes Hunting Horn probably the best support weapon in the game right above the Light Bow Gun. Note that most of these effects only last between 1 and 3 minutes, but can be easily reapplied with a quick jam session. Having the ability to essentially give other players skills they wouldn't normally have is insane. Also, as I mentioned, some horns can actually heal other players. So if you have 3 hunters with high attack weapons and one hunting horn user that knows what they're doing, you're almost unstoppable. Just looking through these buffs makes me want to try my hand at making an epic support set with the hunting horn. If that wasn't cool enough, you can get the horn skill that will add 1 minute to all of the song effects. The lance is the ultimate defense weapon while still being quite powerful attack wise. This is because you come equipped with a spear in one hand and a shield in the other. The combos are super basic with this weapon, triangle does a forward stab while circle does an upward stab. You can use these interchangeably for a 3 hit combo, but the triple circle attack will do the most damage. Holding R will allow you to block, and you can also do an attack while guarding. Lastly, if you press circle and triangle together, you will do a charging attack causing you to rush forward at a fast pace. This will cause you to lose stamina, and if you run into a monster, it will do damage every second or so. By attacking while charging, you will do a stab attack and this will stop you. Also note that when you block an attack, this will also use stamina, same goes for all other weapons that can block. Awesome skills to pair with the lance are guard, guard up, and auto guard. Guard plus 2 will greatly reduce the stamina loss when blocking an attack. Auto guard will cause your hunter to automatically block attacks if possible. Lastly, guard up will allow you to guard against attacks that you could not previously block such as the Gravios Beam. With some of these skills, you will be a walking tank that can take on any beast. 
Now, the damage formulas for Lance are a bit strange, at least from what I've read on the game FAQ page. It says, refer to impact damage when more than the cut. I think that means Lance can use either the impact or cut hit zones, depending on if impact or cut is higher. If you are confused, welcome to the club. My name is Samurai. After Lance is its more explosive cousin, the Gun Lance. Gun Lance is exactly what it sounds like. A gun and a lance had a baby, creating the Gun Lance. Its combos are similar to the lance, with it having the same triple forward stab attack by pressing triangle. Walking forward and pressing triangle, you will do a rush stab attack. Circle and triangle pressed together will cause you to do an upward swing that can be followed up with a triangle for an upward stab combo. Just like Lance, you can block attacks with your shield. Each gun lance has a shelling level in type. The different types are normal, long, and spread. Pressing circle will cause you to fire one of your shots. You can fire a shot on its own or after any of the previously mentioned attacks. To reload, hold R then press circle, but you won't be able to block while performing this action, so be mindful of when using it. Last but not least is the Wyvern fire attack. To perform this, you need to hold R, triangle, and circle all at the same time. Your gun lance will charge up its wyvern fire attack, and when it's done, a massive explosion will follow. Note that you will be stuck in place while doing this attack. If all that info wasn't complicated enough, the bow and bow guns both have separate damage formulas from the melee weapons. For bows, there are a few more variables to think about when attacking a monster, or choosing the right bow. For starters, bows are a ranged weapon and depending on how close to the monster you are will affect how much damage your arrows will do. To add to the confusion, bows have a charge level and each bow's charge level is tied to an arrow type that also has a level. Let's look at the Dragon Chaos bow for example. This bow comes with a charge level 1 of pierce level 2, a charge 2 of pierce level 3, charge 3 has scatter level 5, but I'm not done yet because with the barrage piercing equipped we have the skill load up. This skill adds an extra charge level to bows, meaning I now have a charge 4 with rapid level 4. This is one of the best bows in the game and is excellent for fighting Elder Dragons because it also has Dragon Element. If you're not bewildered yet, bows also have coatings that are tied to each bow. These coatings include Power, Poison, Paint, Close Range, Paralysis, and lastly, Sleep. The Dragon Bow Chaos can actually use all of the coatings, but each bow is different. Power and close range coatings will add a damage multiplier, while the others will add status effects to the shots and paint is self-explanatory. Having the ability to use status and elemental damage makes Bow a great option for a support role. Being able to poison a monster, then put it to sleep, and having power close range coatings to deal heavy damage, the Bow is definitely a great option for someone who doesn't want to worry about bringing a bunch of ammo, but still wants to try out a ranged weapon. But ranged damage isn't the only thing the Bow can do. You can also do melee attacks, but the damage isn't crazy like the Monster Hunter World demo. You are better off sticking to ranged attacks. Each arrow type works differently, but it's nothing too convoluted. Rapid or normal arrows shoot in a vertical line. The higher the level, the more arrows that will fire. This is the same for the scatter, but instead of the arrows shooting vertical, they will shoot in a horizontal line. Pierce works a little differently. All the levels only shoot one arrow, but that arrow will travel through the monster dealing damage on each hit as it travels through the monster's hitboxes. Pierce works best on large monsters such as the Gravios or Plesioth. Now let's look at the complexity of the bow guns. Bow guns have gone through a lot of changes over the years, but one thing has stayed the same, ammo types. In the days of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, there are five different basic ammos. These include the normal, pierce, pellet, crag, and cluster shots, and all of these ammos have three different levels to them. Next are the five elemental shots, fire, water, thunder, freeze, and dragon. Next we have the status shots, poison, stun, sleep, and recovery shots, all with two levels. 
Lastly, we have the support slash miscellaneous ammo types, these being paint, trank, demon, and armor shots. That means there are 18 different types of ammo, not including the levels. With the levels as a variable, you can have 32 types of ammo in your box, all with different combinations to craft them. With all that in mind, gunners will mainly only use a few types of ammo on each given quest. For example, if you hunt a Silver Rathalos and Gold Rathian on the same quest, you should only need normal level 2, thunder, and water ammo to complete this quest solo, while also bringing combines to craft more of each ammo type. Gunning takes away the luxury of bringing a bunch of items on a quest other than the very basics because after you have all your support items, book of combos, power and armor charms slash talons, ammo and combines to craft more ammunition, you are usually left with only a few open slots in your inventory. If you are not capturing the monster, you will need these open slots for monster carves. There are two types of bowguns, light and heavy. Unlike the rest of the weapons, once you craft a bowgun, it cannot be upgraded into another bowgun because there are no branching paths. Instead, bowguns are upgraded with zinni, usually gaining a few hundred more power once fully upgraded. Bowguns can also have attachments equipped. Power barrels will increase the power, both light and heavy may use the power barrel. An exclusive to the heavy bowgun is the shield, giving it the ability to block incoming attacks, while the light bowgun can be equipped with a silencer that reduces recoil of the weapon. These attachments also cause Zinni to equip. You can also buy a zoom scope, but I never do because the normal zoom sight is more than enough considering if you are too far from the monster, your ammo will start doing less and less damage. So it's better to be up close and personal, at least with normal ammo. For pierce ammo, you're best doing damage at least three to four rolls away. Light bow guns also have the ability to rapid fire shots if the gun is equipped with it. Rapid fire shots will do more damage if all the shots are hitting the monster. One shot will be used up, but the gun will fire up to five shots depending on the weapon. Most rapid fire weapons only shoot two to three shots though. The auto reload skill, however, will not work with any rapid fire ammo. A shame really, this would have probably out DPS'd the heavy bowgun if that was the case. Other than the shield, heavy bowgun doesn't have any exclusive special shots, but they do pump out more damage than their smaller counterparts. Light bowgun is fast and nimble with the ability to jog with the weapon in hand. Light bowgun can also sheath and unsheath very quickly while the opposite can be said for the heavy bowgun. Heavy bowgun also does not have the ability to jog with the weapon in hand, rather when the weapon is drawn you will be at a slow walking pace. Although the heavy bowgun is slow and clunky at times, it will deal out more damage than the light bowgun in almost every aspect. If you want to give bowguns a try, I recommend starting with the light bowgun either online or in low rank. You must learn good positioning as well as the monster's weak points so you can aim for them to deal optimal damage. Once you learn the basics, I would give Heavy Bowgun a try, especially if you're hunting solo, as you will complete the quest much quicker. Both Light and Heavy Bowgun can serve as a great support role with the ability to inflict status, do elemental damage, as well as both the other hunters. While in one hand you have gunning, in the other you have item combinations. So let's now take a look at some of the items that you can combine. Items are an essential part of Monster Hunter. Items are everything from the potions that you drink to heal during a quest, to the Rathalos mantle you grind for during the end game. You can actually craft many of the items you will use on a quest, such as max potions or demon drugs. Each combination has a success rate tied to it, and you can increase your chances with the Book of Combinations. The Book of Combos can be bought from the item shop and will provide you with better chances to craft items. There are five levels to the Book of Combos, and each one will increase your success rate. Looking at the percentage chance for each Book of Combos, one will give a plus 5%, Book 2 will give a plus 10%, Book 3 will give a plus 20%, Book 4 will give a plus 30%, and finally Book 5 will give you a plus 45%. 
This totals out to a 100% success rate with all five Book of Combos. If you're combining from the box, it doesn't matter whether the books are in your box or in your inventory, but if you are on a quest, the Book of Combos will need to be in your inventory to increase your success rate. You will also need to bring all of the Book of Combos to get the plus 45%. You can't just bring Book of Combos five or four, let's say. I typically hold on to the one, two, and three book of combos within my inventory for a plus 35 increase to my combination success rate while on a quest because most ammo types have a base 75 or 90% success rate to begin with. A few items you definitely want to get your gauntlets on is the power and armor charms. These items will boost your attack and defense and can also be combined with a Laoshan Lung Claw to become even more powerful. As a gunner, I will carry the three Book of Combos, the Power and Armor Charms slash Talons. That means before I even put Mega Potions in my inventory, I already have seven slots taken up. Adding to the clutter, I always carry 99 husk berries as well as 99 needle berries so I can combine more normal level two shots on the go. Healing items are a must have for all hunters. Hunters are given first aid meds in the item box on all low rank quests. These are the equivalent to potions. Potions can be crafted from blue mushrooms and herbs, common items that can be gathered on quests or at the farm. You can also buy potions from the merchant stands in and out of the guild hall. The next best healing item is mega potions crafted from combining a potion and honey together. I would recommend using the majority of your honey to make mega potions, but do save some for other combinations. Max potions and ancient potions use honey in their combinations as well. Once you really get into combining items, you will come to realize how useful the granny peddler can be, especially her DLC items. For instance, dragon toadstools typically can only be found out in the field or gathered at the farm, but with the DLC granny shop, you can buy them for 400 zinni. Dragon toadstools are used in a few different item combinations, most notably used to make max potions and immunizer. Max potions not only will fully restore your health, but will bring your total health to 150. Before eating a meal, your base health and stamina will be 100. A well done steak will increase your stamina by 50 points, so if you eat at 100, you'll increase to 150. Nutrients and mega nutrients will increase your total amount of health, but won't actually heal you. Max potions, however, will always bring your total health to 150, making them one of the best healing items in the game. You can also increase your total health with health armor skills, Rathian armor being a good example. Immunizer is an ingredient you can combine with a Kelby horn to craft an ancient potion. Ancient potions will not only increase your total health to max and fully heal you, while also bringing your stamina to max, making these the best healing item in the game. Note, you may only bring two max potions in your inventory and you can only carry one ancient potion at a time, so use these items wisely. I won't bore you with all the items and their combinations, but I do want to cover a few more basic combinations and items. For starters, bomb material and bombs can be extremely useful items if used properly. Bomb material can be crafted from combining sap plant and stone. From there, bomb material can be crafted into seven different items. Flash bombs are a combination of bomb material and flash bugs. When I write the questing portion of this video, I'm sure I'll bring up flash bombs regularly as they can be used to confuse a monster for a short period of time. Unlike the newer games, flash bombs will stun a monster for the same amount of time indefinitely. This was an expected nerf because you could lock a monster down with one simple item as many times as you wanted. I use the flash bomb method for monsters such as Rathalos and Tiger Rex as they won't move too much when confused. Both of these monsters like to move around a lot, so having them in one place to blast them with my elemental auto reload heavy bowgun is very convenient. With the right weapon, you can usually do enough damage to kill or capture a monster with five or so flash bombs. 
For multi-monster quests, you can bring along 10 bomb material and flash bugs for a total of 15 flash bombs per hunter. That means if all four hunters brought five flash bombs and 10 combines, you could have a total of 60 flash bombs in one quest. This is super unnecessary unless you really suck at flashing the monster. Speaking of multi-monster quests, dung bombs will cause a monster to flee the area. So if Rathalos and Rathian are in the same area, you can throw a dung bomb at one of them so you can focus on the other. One quick little edit, I found this out after recording all of this video, dung bombs do not work like they do in the newer games. So basically, if the monster hasn't spotted you and you throw a dung bomb and then leave the area, the monster will probably leave, but dung bombs also don't work on all monsters. So take that into consideration when I mention dung bombs later in the video. Dung bombs can be crafted by, you guessed it, dung and bomb material. Oddly enough, paintballs are crafted with a paintberry and sap plant, not a bomb material. Being one of the most useful items in the game, paintballs almost never leave my inventory, and I like to stay strapped with at least 10 or so at all times. Someone online said that they last up to 5 minutes, but that was an old form, so take that post with a grain of salt. Paintballs will mark a monster on your map for a short period of time, so you don't find yourself wandering around the map searching for the monster. If you do ever run out of paintballs, wave at the balloon in the sky to reveal the monster's location for a brief period of time. That is, of course, if the balloon is on your quest. Now to talk small and large barrel bombs. Bombs can be a great source of damage, especially if the monster is asleep. You see, monsters take two times damage upon their first hit when they are sleeping. Some weapons such as the Greatsword are better off doing a level 3 charge, but bombs are perfect for gunners who don't have a hard hitting attack. Many guns and bows have the ability to shoot a sleep shot or arrow. This will put the monster asleep after enough status has been applied, leaving the monster vulnerable to a coordinated attack. If you are hunting in a party, Tell everyone to bring two large barrel bomb plus and set it by the monster after it's been put to sleep. Now only one of the bombs will do double damage upon wake up, but with enough bombs you can deal a huge chunk of damage. Bombs are not cheap though, so use them strategically. Small barrel bombs will do a little bit of damage and a fuse is lit once they are placed. Large barrel bombs on the other hand will lie dormant until detonated, making large and small barrel bombs pair nicely. For some monsters, small barrel bombs will also have the same effect as a sonic bomb if placed close enough. There are also bounce bombs, but they kinda suck. They fly into the air and explode, good for a blade master fighting a flying monster, but with how little damage they do, you're better off waiting for the monster to land or just use a ranged weapon. Focusing on large barrel bombs as they are superior, you only need to worry about collecting a few items. Fire herb and nitro mushroom. These combine to make gunpowder. Next, you will need to buy large barrels and combine them with the gunpowder you crafted. Now you will have a large barrel bomb. From there, combining a large barrel bomb with a scatterfish this will create a large barrel bomb plus. Doing a decent bit of damage isn't the only useful thing this bomb can do. Unlocking the bomb mining in poke farm allows you to use bombs to receive ore. Large barrel bomb plus will yield the best items, so be sure to stock up on all the necessary items to craft them. Another useful tool is the trap tool. These can only be bought, but are used to craft pitfall traps and shock traps. Shock traps are created by combining trap tool and genprey fang. And for pitfall traps, you will need a net and the trap tool. Nets can be crafted by combining ivy with a spider net. A monster that is close to dying will flee to sleep and regain health. At this time, if you trap the monster and use trank bombs, shot, or knives, you can capture the monster. Combining parashroom with sleep herb will yield tranquilizer. This can then be combined with a bomb material, small bone husk, or throwing knife to craft the previously mentioned items. Successfully capturing a monster will not allow you to carve from it, but will reward you with more items after the quest. 
while also increasing your chances to receive rare items in the quest rewards. If you haven't noticed by now, many items require you to craft an item in order to craft another item. This is why I just always start combining random items in my box to reveal the recipes in my reference book. With the combination list totaling in at 172 total items, I will only bore you with a few more combinations. Pickaxes and bug nets will be your friend once it comes time to gather an ore slash bug to craft some equipment. I wouldn't bother with the old bug net slash pickaxe because they only last a few swings. Rather, you should purchase a bug net or iron pickaxe. You can also craft these, but early game, you will probably need these materials in order to make some weapons and armor, so you can craft them later on. Later in the game, you will be able to buy mega pickaxes and bug nets that will last longer than their previous variants. One last note for gunners, stock up on husk berries because they are used for all basic ammo combinations, with a total of 20 ammo types using husk berries. The rest will use small bone husk or large bone husk. Of course, at a high enough level, you can purchase almost all of these ammo types, but it's still a good idea to bring combines just in case you run out of a particular ammo type while on a quest. Another useful combination is the ability to use armor stones to craft armor spheres. I prefer to save my armor stones for the G rank armor spheres, and if I were you, I would do the same. Besides the alchemy and treasure quest combinations, the last combinations in your reference book are the expanded pickaxe combos. Expanded pickaxes can only be obtained through training missions and treasure quests, both requiring you to receive a lot of points for them to be in your quest rewards. When you combine an expanded pickaxe with a specific bug or mineral, you will receive multiple of these items that you have selected. A useful item for sure, but with the effort you must go through to obtain the pickaxes, you're better off just going out and gathering the item that you want. If I could change anything about the expanded pickaxes, I would have had them be an Elder Dragon quest reward. Yes, it would still be hard, but at least you could get a few useful items while you're grinding for your expanded pickaxes. There are a total of 24 expanded pickaxe combinations, for some people, doing treasure and training missions over and over may be fun, but for me, it was just tedious. For some reason, while doing research on alchemy and combinations, I thought you could get this super OP item that allowed you to combine with a 100% success rate and do alchemy with the alchemy guide. I also thought in order to unlock this item, you had to complete your entire combination list. Instead, the alchemy guide simply allows you to do alchemy combines without the skill, and that's it. Also, to unlock the alchemy guide, it is as simple as completing all the alchemy combinations, which is fairly easy only requiring you to bring a few random items to certain maps, while also having an armor set that has the alchemy skill activated. You do get an award for your guild card once all combinations have been completed, so I guess it wasn't a total waste of time, but let me tell you, grinding for expanded pickaxes was one of the most painful things I've done in Unite. I conclude that it is not worth the effort to complete your combo list. If anything, just do all the alchemy combos for the guide. Only complete the whole list if you really, really want that award for your guild card. The Veggie Elder is an interesting character within the Monster Hunter universe. A Wyvarian hermit who lives by himself, he can be found in seven different locations. The Veggie Elder will often gift the player items, and if the player has a specific item in their inventory, the Veggie Elder will attempt to trade with you. Many of these trades are not worth the effort. For example, if you trade him a Nova Crystal in the Snowy Mountains, you will have a 80% chance to receive an Ancient Potion and a 20% chance to receive a Life Powder. The Veggie Elder will appear in the Snowy Mountains at Area 4, Jungle at the Base Camp, at the Desert he will be in Area 8, Base Camp of the Swamp, 
Area 7 of the Great Forest. Within the Old Jungle, he will appear in Area 5, and at the Old Swamp, the Veggie Elder is in Area 1. Now, the Veggie Elder can trade more than just regular items. If you have given someone your guild card online and hunt with them, you will receive friendship points. After 10 friendship points with a single player, the guild lady will give you a Veggie Elder ticket. This can be traded with the Veggie Elder to receive different items based on the location it is traded at. Higher level Veggie Elder tickets will be obtained by further increasing your friendship with a single hunter. On top of that, the Bronze, Silver, Gold, and Sky Veggie Elder tickets require your guild card to be at or higher than the level of the ticket. With the Sky ticket only being available at 100 friendship points, as well as a Platinum guild card. Now, I'm not 100% sure on how you obtain friendship points the quickest, but I would assume it would be by completing quests with the hunter you have traded your guild card with. With little to no information online, I can only make assumptions and I may have to conduct my own research into this inquiry. As I said earlier, the Veggie Elder will often trade you items that in my opinion are worth less than the items that you give him. Another example of this would be trading a Lao Shan Lunghorn in the desert to only receive a Firestone or Matchlight Ore. Two items that can be obtained extremely easy with a quick mining trip to the volcano. The best items can only be obtained with the Veggie Elder ticket by trading gold or sky tickets, both of these items being extremely hard to obtain because you need 75 friendship points for gold with a gold guild card and 100 points for the sky ticket with a platinum guild card. In all my hours of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, most of it online playing with my brother, I have never gotten a Veggie Elder Ticket Sky. With the Sky Tickets, you can trade them to receive Heavenly Scales from different monsters based on where they are traded at. As for the Gold Ticket, it will often be a Ruby or some other high rank item in each different area. Now on paper, I'm sure this sounded like a cool feature to the developers, but in practice, this system is a total waste of time in my opinion. First of all, without the internet, players would certainly have no idea what items were tradable and certainly didn't know what items they would receive upon trading. To make things worse, you have a 2080 split in what items you will receive, with most trades making this system even more frustrating if you thought you knew what item you would receive from a previous trade. Adding to the frustration, the low-level Veggie Elder tickets will often give you such basic and cheap items, it's almost not even worth the effort to go trade them in the first place. Monster Hunter World would add the Elder Melder. This is a good replacement to the Veggie Elder system, allowing you to turn your items into different items almost as if it was a trade. This system is much better than the Veggie Elder trade system in my opinion. So for the spark notes, if you have a bunch of monster materials or arena coins you will never use, look up the trades online and see if it is worth to trade with the Veggie Elder. Otherwise, you're better off saving your materials and just craft armor and weapons. The feline kitchen is probably one of the most useful places to stop by before you go out on a hunt. The kitchen serves multiple purposes, but the best of them all is the ability to eat a meal to receive buffs or debuffs depending on what you eat before heading out on your next quest. As you progress through the game, you will unlock more felines to add to your kitchen staff with a total of 5 cats. As you add more cats to your staff, the ingredients will change depending on how many active chefs you have. These chefs will also have levels that will increase as you have them cook for you, as well as a singular chef you hire for the barbecue services. You can hire a chef to cook you up to 10 raw meat or fish in between each quest. This is the best and easiest way to obtain well done or gourmet steaks. Your cats can reach a max level of 9, and this will unlock all the ingredient slots available, with only leveling one cat to max. A higher level will also affect how often the whim skills will activate. Lastly, the level of your chef will affect how well they cook your meat slash fish. Each chef will have three whim skills randomly generated when you go to hire them from the cat lady. A few of these skills are not the most useful, such as feline blunt force, 
a skill that increases melee damage from bow guns, or feline dance that increases your attack power for 20 seconds after using the dance gesture. But most of these skills are definitely worth trying to activate, especially if you're prepared to make the most of them, like planning a hunt with feline heroics, a skill that increases attack by 1.35 and defense by 1.5 when health is below 10 HP. Another useful skill is Feline Mega Lucky Cat, a skill that will increase your potential chance for more normal rewards significantly. Or Feline Explorer, once activated will give you a 100% chance to spawn in the secret area at maps that have them. This skill will only work in high or G rank though. The list goes on and on, so I'd recommend finding a few skills that you find useful and hiring the cats that have them. One last thing to worry about when hiring your chefs is what they are proficient at cooking with. So if your cat has a 3 star in vegetables and you never eat your vegetables, you will never activate that chef's whim skill. On the other hand, if you ate a meal with vegetables, you would have a chance to activate that whim skill from the vegetable chef. Contributing to your overall chance to activate a whim skill is the level of your chef slash chefs, as well as how many stars they have for an ingredient, as well as what ingredient you order. If you're trying to find a specific cat with a skill, I recommend that you check the cat later after each quest. I did this in order to hire a feline heroics cat so I could try my hand at a heroics run. Now let's talk a little more about the ingredients. There are seven different types of ingredients to choose from. These ingredients include meat, bran, fish, fruit, veggies, milk, and drink. When you order a meal, you can choose between two different ingredients. The ingredient combination will give you different results based on how many active chefs you have in your kitchen. For example, I typically eat meat plus veggies, resulting in a health increase by 40 points and a large attack boost. This is what you will receive with 5 active feline chefs. The same meal with 2 chefs will result in a negative 25 points in stamina. At the kitchen board, you will have a few options to change your felines, such as the order they appear on the chart, or the ability to send one or more chefs on a break affecting the active chefs for meals. Meaning, even though you have five chefs hired, if one is on break, the meal outcome will be the equivalent of four feline chefs. This is also where you can hire the barbecue services. Also, you may change the outfits of your chefs between a chef's suit or cook's coat. Lastly, you can dismiss a chef in order to make room for a better candidate. I would recommend looking through all your chefs if you haven't done so already upon hiring and find the best chefs to fit your meal choice and playstyle. I mainly use guns, so feline aim is a good skill to have active, making normal shots do slightly more damage. Other than that, the kitchen has some banger songs to listen to while you're resting in between hunts. Also, don't forget the iconic music they play while preparing your hunter's feast. One last thing to note is I always go around and talk to all my chefs because they can give you random useful items, even Feline Paw Pass Regular or Feline Paw Pass Plus. These items are required to craft various feline weapons. Another new addition to Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is the Comrade Buddy system. I still remember before I had played Freedom Unite while playing Monster Hunter Freedom 2 if you released your chef slash dismissed him or her, you could find them in the wild or something and they would join you on your journey. In reality, you cannot get these comrades in Freedom 2 but only in Unite and other future titles. Now the comrades are definitely not for every hunter. I can't even count the amount of times my so-called comrades have gotten me killed, woken up a monster, or just plain useless on a quest. But they do have their perks. Or should I say skills? Comrades have the ability to learn up to three useful skills to aid you during a hunt. Some are fairly basic, like an attack or defense boost, adding an element slash status to their attacks, but others can complement your playstyle as well as their attack preference. You can have a comrade that uses a hammer being a strike or a sword being a slash comrade. They will also have a temperament that will affect how your comrade will act on the hunt as well as what weapon they will use and how quickly they will heal after fainting. 
For example, I have a cat named Shiva that aims large, will attack large monsters, and will use weapons more often. Strike meaning they will use a hammer that can potentially KO a monster, and an attack preference being mainly bombs. Yes, your cat can use bombs, and yes, they will most likely use them on you at some point. Getting back on subject, I can have Shiva learn a skill that will have a chance to turn their small bombs into large bombs. My go-to skills are Demon Flute, giving me and my comrade an attack buff, True Health Flute, being the equivalent of drinking a Mega Potion, and the last skill is dependent on the cat. For my active comrade, this last skill is Robin Blind, a skill better suited for a cat's attack preference as weapon only, so they won't be able to use bombs, and will mainly focus on melee attacks on the monster. The Robin Blind description states, Comrade will be able to steal from a monster when a successful strike is landed. While it's not as OP as it is in Monster Hunter World, this skill can still come in handy for a few extra materials. Other noteworthy skills include Shock Trap, giving your comrade the ability to place a Shock Trap. The Clairvoyance Comrade skill will sometimes allow your comrade to know where a large monster is located. And the Say No to Gathering skill will make your comrade focus on attacking the monsters. Yes, your comrade will gather during a hunt, and this isn't such a bad thing most of the time. Your comrade will act as a second target for the monsters to focus their attacks on. Now this can be a good or bad thing depending on your playstyle. If you're a ranged hunter like myself, sometimes your comrade will attract the monster out of position to your normal rhythm, causing you to get hit. But it can be nice, especially if you need to heal while the monster is distracted from you. Also, having a cat with true health flute is really nice to get a free heal once in a while. But if you ever plan on sleep bombing a monster, I recommend you leave your comrade back at Poke Village. A few more things to consider about your comrade is their fondness level. This will affect how often they listen to you, even though there is no actual way to command them around. In reality, a low fondness level for your comrade, they will spend most of their time just sitting around doing nothing, and a high fondness level, they will actively be gathering or attacking monsters, as well as using their abilities more often. Fondness will cap out at 5 hearts. Your comrades also have an attack and defense stat that can be raised through going on hunts and also through training. They can also level up with max level being 20. It also seems that they have a cap to their attack and defense as well. Some of my cats are maxed at 120 attack and 380 defense while others at 320 attack and 180 defense. This means your cats will max out at 500 between attack and defense. At the comrade board across the room from the feline chef board, you can choose an activity for them to do in between quests on the growth tab. The options being hand to hand, your comrade's level will increase little by little, dumbbells increase attack, sit ups is for defense, and forms will increase both attack and defense. Meditation will increase your comrade's skill points used to buy skills, and lastly, the rest option will increase the feline's fondness level. Feline skills will slowly be obtained as you quest with your cat. To unlock the more advanced skills, you will need to do a lot of quests with that comrade activated. Some abilities require you to take the comrade on specific monster quests, such as the Gindrome will unlock the status attack paralysis. Overall, the comrades are a cool addition to Monster Hunter, but with this being their first iteration, they are not the sharpest blades at the blacksmith shop, and can negatively affect a hunt on occasion. But once your cat is a high enough level, they will benefit you more and more, especially with a demon or health flute. One last note, you won't always be able to bring your comrade alongside you. They won't appear on quests such as Lao or Shen Georan. They will also not appear in multiplayer hunts. I know I could have started here or at least put this section farther up in the script, 
but I felt like it was necessary to cover all the basics before I actually started talking about the quests you will need to complete in order to advance in this game. Especially if you've never played Freedom Unite before, I want you to know the ins and outs of the game, as well as a basic understanding of its mechanics to better prepare you for the journey ahead. Low rank may seem like an easy task on the surface, but the village elder chief does have some challenging quests for your hunter, especially if you play through the village low rank without doing any guild quests beforehand. Low rank is made up of six different tiers of quests with each being represented by level and star. As you may have guessed already, you will be starting at level one star. To advance to the next level, you will need to complete all key quests to unlock an urgent quest usually requested by the Elder herself. Upon completing the urgent quest, you will then unlock the next star level and the process repeats. Now, level one is straightforward with only having five quests in total. It is easy enough to do these without knowing the key quest to advance to the next rank. Much like many of the older Monster Hunter titles, you cannot actually tell what quests are key quests, making it somewhat of a guessing game. Nowadays, you can look up all these key quests with the wiki, but back in the day, my brother, his friend, and I would start doing all the hunting quests, next moving on to the slaying quests. If the urgent hadn't been unlocked by then, we would grudgingly do some of the gathering quests until we unlocked our urgent. I honestly miss these days of not knowing the key quest because it was a good way to test our strength against all the monsters with the weapons and armor we had available to us at that level. In Monster Hunter World and Rise, it just flat out tells you what the key quests are, so you don't even have to bother looking up the key quests or doing random hunts until an urgent appears. Which is by no means a bad thing, it's just different from what it used to be. Level 1 only consists of three key quests, each feeling like its own training mission. All low rank quests will provide you with supply items at the start of the quest located in the blue box. All level 1 quests will take place in the snowy mountains. The optional quests Mountain Herb Picking and Anteka in the Snow are super basic gathering quests that can easily be completed without worrying about what weapon you're using. Hunt the Carnivore is the first key quest on the list, tasking us with hunting 5 Gaia Prey, same as the training missions for each weapon. Gaia Prey are not the fastest monsters in the game, but I do recommend using a faster weapon on this quest as they do jump around a lot. Or you could pick up a ranged weapon and slay them from a distance. Same goes for the Slay the Belangos quest, with having our hunter tasked with slaying 3 Belangos. They have slightly more health than the Gaia Prey, and are faster than most small monsters, but will fall easily enough. For these early quests, I recommend you gather as much as possible before completing the quest if you're not trying to speedrun the game. The Snowy Mountains has a few mining points that are a good starting point for your future stockpiles of ore. Many weapons will need matchlight ore, iron ore, and earth crystals to upgrade. So save yourself a mining trip later on and bring some pickaxes with you on these one-star quests. Other notable gathering points include the armor seeds that can be found in area 6 or the ice crystals that can be gathered in area 4. Also, if you need some bones to craft pickaxes, they can be found in area 3. If you're ever curious on where some gathering points are located, use a gathering guide that can be found online of all the different Monster Hunter Freedom Unite maps. The last key quest is the one to worry about. Sinking Feeling is a gathering quest where you must deliver three popo tongues carved off the local popo. You will notice the popo are not in their usual area one, but are located atop the mountain. Once our hunter reaches area 6, we will be introduced to our nemesis, Tiger Rex. Tiger Rex preys upon the popo and will immediately try to best our hunter once we are spotted. With being such a low level, you stand no chance but to turn and flee from this beast. Note that you cannot actually slay this Tiger Rex even if you have appropriate gear to do so. This trend of introducing the flagship monster early on became a common theme in the Monster Hunter games. In Try, our hunter will encounter Laggy on a very similar quest where we must gather three monster guts. After completing these three quests, you will unlock your urgent, the Carnivorous Leader, with being tasked to hunt the Gaidrome. Its in-game description reads, 
the alpha leader of a pack of Gaia Prey. The Gaia Drum sports a beautiful crest, larger than a Gaia Prey, any hunter silly enough to encroach on its turf will be frozen in a hail of ice. This is a direct request from the chief stating, It seems that I can trust you with a difficult job like this. I'd like you to hunt down the leader of a Gaia Prey pack, the Gaia Drum. I wish you a beautiful victory in our defense. Gaia Drum was added to the series in Monster Hunter Freedom 2, taking the Velocidrome's place as the first large monster hunt. The supply box will be stocked up with portable shock trap and some tranks if you want to capture the Gaia Drum. This is not necessary for the seasoned hunter, as this monster has very low HP, but if you want to capture the Gaia Drum, I was able to make it flee in 9 normal level 2 shots with a fully upgraded bone shooter. Then I placed the trap, threw a couple tranks, and the quest was over. Being an ice monster, it isn't hard to believe that the Gaia Drum is weakest to fire element, which also makes the bone shooter one of the most effective weapons to fight this foe with. Gaia Drum is also weak to all other elements, but if this is your first monster you've slayed, you probably don't have any other elemental weapons besides the bowguns, so you don't need to worry about that unless you wanted to farm Gaia Drum later on or encounter it in high slash G rank. Upon returning to the village, we were thanked by the Elder, saying, We took care of that Gaia Drum without any problems. We are now granted access to the jungle and desert locations. As I said before, the desert is not an area to hunt in without preparation. The heat of the day will drain our health, and the frigid nights will sap our stamina. Luckily, low rank quests will provide your hunter with the proper drinks to fight the cold or cool us from the heat. While the jungle doesn't require cool or hot drinks, it can be a bit confusing your first few hunts around. Also, the thick vegetation can make it hard to see in certain areas. The chief tells us more information can be found on the bookshelf at our house. Now, level 2 star is where the game starts to get interesting. First off, you can now embark on Paw Pass quests in the three available areas to gather materials in order to craft weapons and armor. You can also hunt seven large monsters on this level, three of them being key quests not including the Gaia Drome. This opens up the variety of armor and weapons you can craft significantly. Elemental weapons will be very useful, especially for the faster hitting weapons such as dual blades or sword and shield. The next key quest for level 2 you are most likely to embark on is the Reckless Bouldrum Hunter. The reference book has this to say, The powerful leader of the wild boars, known for its enormous tusks. More aggressive than the Blafango, it is known to rush into a fight and is extremely proficient at locating a foe and locate you it will. This oversized moss wine will charge at you like it has nothing to lose. Being a low leveled monster, the Bulldrome has slightly more HP than the Gyadrome, but can pack a punch if you have little to no defense using the starter armor. This won't be the last time you see this tusked boar as it will appear as a secondary monster on many quests. Once the Bulldrome has spotted you, it will stop at nothing. Unless its health is low enough, then it will attempt to flee the area to recover a few hundred HP similarly to the other bird wyvern drones. Slow moving weapons can get the job done if you time your attacks correctly, but I do recommend using a faster or ranged weapon to slay this beast. Another quest where the heavy bowgun Bone Shooter really shines if you use the fire ammo. Fire is a good choice, but the bulldrum is weakest to thunder damage but it is also weak to all other elements, with the least being dragon. Again, if this is your first bulldrum, you probably only have access to fire with the heavy bowgun, but later on, a thunder weapon would be the most effective. The next key quest on the list is Jungle Menace, tasking us with hunting a Yin Kutku. This is our first look at the jungle location that was brought back in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. I still remember the good old days where I thought hunting the Gyadrome and Bulldrome were great accomplishments. Probably because, for the life of me, I could not beat the Yankutku. Its in-game description reads, A bird-like wyvern with a huge beak and large ears that splay open when it's angered. With its sensitive hearing, it dislikes loud noises. It is smaller, but faster than other wyverns. Kutku can use powerful fireballs, tail spins, as well as a charge attack at your hunter. Once angered, it will move much faster than normal. 
When I first played Freedom 2, I was a longsword user and would overcommit to combos that would end up costing me lives. Monster Hunter is a game all about risk versus reward, and I would risk it all to slay this foe. If I was more patient, I would have learned to take the hunt a little more slowly, learn the monster's attacks before going gung-ho. Playing through all these years later with the heavy bowgun, the cut coup was actually a fairly easy fight. By keeping my distance and not overcommitting to attacks, it is easy enough to roll out of the way of an oncoming charge attack or fireball. A little hint in the description stated that the cut coup is susceptible to loud noises, so you can use a sonic bomb to daze the creature for a few moments, but it will send it into a rage state once it recovers. The cut coup is our first introduction to monster hit zones. Both Gyadrome and Bulldrum only have one hit zone, so no matter where on the body you hit it, it will do the same amount of damage. With the Cut Coup, the case is different, and you will have seven separate hit zones to worry about. The head, neck, back, stomach, tail, wing, and finally, the foot. Most wyverns have the same hit zones, and I will refer to them throughout the rest of the video. Each hit zone also takes different damage values depending on if you're using a gun, impact, or cutting weapon. For gunners as well as impact users, you'll want to focus your damage on the head, stomach, or wings in that order, as those hit zones will take the most damage. For cutting weapons, focus on the stomach, then the wings and head if you have to. For elemental weaknesses, Cut Coup is most susceptible to water and ice weapons. Thunder is also a good choice though. Monster Hunter World and Rise players should already be familiar with hit zones, you just can't see the damage numbers in this game. Once Cut Coup is weak, its ears will fold down, indicating the monster can be captured, and it will most likely limp away to flee and recover some health once it falls asleep. Cut Coup is a great monster to farm early on, as its armor provides an attack up stat, as well as having high fire resistance. Attack up small will come with the full set, but if you add a few attack jewels, you can get it to attack up medium. The set also comes with the health skill that will add 20 points to your base health. If upgraded, you could even make it to high rank with this set alone, due to its decent defense and the attack skill. Personally, as a gunner, it is cheaper to use the battle set, but it does have slightly less defense compared to the cut goose set. On the subject of attack, you will need cut goose scales to craft these decorations. One of the best ways to farm these scales without farming the cut coup itself is to simply gather them. At the base camp in the jungle, if you climb the vines, there is a honey gathering point that is a beehive. Besides honey, you can also obtain cutku scales on occasion from this gathering point. The jungle also has a wide variety of mushrooms, bugs, ore, and plants that can be gathered. Another good place to gather matchlight ore for those ore weapon upgrades. Special mushrooms can also be found here, and these can come in handy for some extra poke points to use for your farm upgrades. Let us not forget one of the most useful items, dung. Dung and wyvern droppings can be found in area 8. Moving on to the final large monster key quest in level 2, we are faced with hunting the Kangalala for the rarest of the rare beasts quest. This quest is worth reading the description for. Village Grocer do you know the pink, fanged beast that roams the jungle? That beast dirtied my shop beyond hope. It's impossible to clean up. Get rid of it before I'm soiled again. If you have fought the Kangalala before, you know it has some interesting attacks involving throwing gigantic balls of dung at the player. Meaning, this Kangalala literally on this dude and now he has hired you to kill it. This pink beast's description reads, a large Pelagius sporting pink fur often spotted in the jungle and swamp zones. Fond of mushrooms, its diet affects its breath, which may be poisonous or flaming. One can predict these traits via the food in its local habitat. This monster is the only one in the game that can eat an item that will allow it to gain an elemental attack, Fire Breath. It reminds me of how Bishatin can use different berry things to hurl at the hunter to cause different status effects, or even more similar, the Fire Bishatin, whatever its name is. 
Kangalala is a hefty boy and has the HP to back it with having the most HP out of all the level 2 large monsters. In fact, Kangalala has more than double the HP of the Yankutku that is in the same level, making him a fight you definitely want to come prepared for. For any guild hunters, I recommend mining in the guild swamp for the crystal hammer, as this will be the highest damage weapon available to you for quite some time. Also, you will want to focus on the head for every single weapon type. I did use the crystal hammer on this quest that I crafted from gathering in the low rank guild swamp quests. Again, this is a very powerful hammer that I would recommend any hammer users craft as soon as possible because it does a ton of damage compared to the other low rank hammers available. That is the extent of all the hunting quests for level 2, which leads us to the final and most challenging key quest, Liver of Legend. This is a gathering quest where you are tasked with delivering three Poseidon livers that can be carved off the Cephalos at the desert location. Similar to the Popotun quest except the Cephalos are the equivalent to sand sharks having a decent amount of HP and will actively try to murder your hunter. Quick little note, these Cephalos have half the amount of HP that the Gaidrome had, so they're pretty beefy, especially if you still have the first beginner weapons. RNG has a big role to play in how quickly you can complete this quest. Cephalos swim just beneath the sand with their dorsal fins protruding out to the sky. In order to effectively slay these monsters, it is recommended that you use a sonic bomb to bring them to the surface. You can get a few swings or shots off on their fins if they swim close enough to you though. Best case scenario, you only need to slay three of these derpy sandfish in area 2, but more can be found in area 5 I believe. Or you can just exit the area, come back, and a few more should spawn in. Some useful items that can be gathered in the desert include power seeds that can be found in areas 1, 2, 3, and 6. There are also dung gathering points in area 4 as well as 10. Match light can also be found in a few areas, but not from all mining points. Before I talk about the urgent quest, there are a few more large monsters available to hunt if you choose to do so. For starters, there is the Velocidrome, the original first large monster fight from Monster Hunter 1. Although it isn't as intimidating as it was from Monster Hunter 1 because he doesn't have the gang of Velociprey to back him up. Next is the Gendrome, leader of the Genprey found in the desert. As you may know already, the Gendrome can inflict paralysis. Genprey fangs being one of the ingredients to craft shock traps, it makes sense. Lastly is the Cephadrome, leader of the Cephalos. He is basically just a bigger sand shark with more HP and darker scale coloration. Note that you will need to fight Cephadrome to unlock him in the arena. Other than that, the rest of the optional quests are slaying and gathering quests you can easily complete now or later if you choose to do so. After all the key quests have been completed, you will unlock a brick wall for many unseasoned hunters like myself when I first played Monster Hunter Freedom 2, the Kezu. Shadow in the Snow is another request directly from the Poke Village Chief. If it's not one thing, it's another, right? Near the village, a strange flying wyvern called the Kezu has been spotted. It is strong, but I believe you can handle this. Do your best. For the life of me, I could not defeat this monster on my first playthrough all those years ago. Kezu's description states, Loathsome wyverns that live inside caves. Near blind, they detect their prey by smell. They are capable of generating electric shocks, which they use to paralyze their prey. Not only can it use electrical attacks, but it can also paralyze your hunter with its ranged attacks. Let us not forget that the Kezu has no eyes, therefore it cannot see your hunter. Battle theme music will play once a monster has spotted your hunter. When the monster has spotted your hunter, you can run faster when fleeing the monster's position, as well as invincible dive. Because the Kezu cannot see you, no music plays, making for a very eerie fight, and you have no ability to perform the invincible dive. As annoying as this mechanic is, I was sad to see it not return in Monster and Arise. For me, Kezu was a brick wall I could not defeat, so I went back to fighting easier monsters such as the Bulldrum to gain more experience in Zenny. 
My brother's friend was the first to slay Kezu on his own and I thought this man was godlike for doing so. Looking back, I realized I definitely wasn't using any armor skills or my weapon the longsword effectively for this particular monster. Every monster has its own rhythm and I had not listened carefully enough to Kezu's. All the monsters before this are very fast paced, meaning you had to be ready to roll or dodge at any moment. Kezu on the other hand is more slow and methodical in its movements. You would think this would make it easier, but it lured me into a false sense of confidence. I would overcommit on my longsword combos to then be one or two shotted by its attacks. If you have played Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, you know what I'm talking about. You can take one hit that knocks you down or makes you flinch, and then the monster will target you again and finish you off with its second attack. Especially if the first attack is one of those evil paralyzing electric balls. Playing through more recently, I used the Bone Shooter, yes, what a surprise, because the Kezu is weakest to fire damage. You should not have any troubles using this weapon, granted you bring enough healing items, and be sure to bring at least 60 fire ammo and some normal level 2 shots. Focusing on the head is the best option for gunners as well as impact users, while cutting weapons should also aim for the head, the neck, back, and stomach. By this point, more weapon types should have fire element options with the cut coup. The only thing is, most of the low rank cut coup weapons are not the best in terms of sharpness. When using a melee weapon, as long as you can telegraph his moves, you should be in good shape, just stay out of the range of its tail swing and body shock moves. As for gunners, keep your distance and aim for the head when Kezu uses its range attacks, and hope it doesn't spam roars. Ah yes, monster roars. If a monster roars a loud roar, it will cause your hunter to flinch and cover their ears. You can obtain a skill that will prevent this called earplugs later in the game, but you won't have access to it early on. One last thing on Kezu, it has a very grippy tail and feet, giving it the ability to crawl on the ceiling of some areas in the swamp. Once you have defeated Kezu, you should be able to craft your first thunder weapons, great for hunting monsters such as the Capricorns and many other wyverns like Rathalos and Tiger Rex. One such weapon can be upgraded from the Iron Katana that will eventually upgrade to the Eager Cleaver. This longsword and its future upgrades can pretty much get you through the rest of the game because the vast majority of the monsters in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite have some level of thunder weakness. Only monsters such as Kezu, Kirin, Gypsaros, and Rajang have no weakness to thunder at all, but the raw damage on this longsword path is so good you shouldn't need a different weapon to defeat them. I still remember grinding for G rank Kezu parts with high rank versions of this weapon because it was the highest raw longsword I had available to me. Yes, I could have crafted the Silver Rathalos longsword, but then I would have needed to obtain a Rathalos ruby in order to craft it. With my luck not being the best, I opted to keep grinding it with the true Devil Slicer. After clearing Shadow in the Snow, you will unlock 3 star village quests. Level 3 introduces two more new areas for you to hunt and explore. First is the Swamp Zone, an area that has lots of toxic pools at night and a few caves with valuable crystals. We can also now hunt in the Forest and Hills, the OG starting area for Monster Hunter and Monster Hunter Freedom fans. If you haven't already, I recommend you go mine in the swamp for light crystals within the caves. You may need this material to craft or upgrade weapons such as the Crystal Hammer. Also, special mushrooms can be found in both these areas for extra poke points. As for the forests and hills, this is another great area to gather fertilizer, as in area 1 and 5 both have dung piles. The key quests are straightforward in this level, with only two of the four being hunting quests. Going down the list, the first key quest is a slaying quest, Blango Slaying Tactics with our hunter being tasked to slay 10 of these snow monkeys. While on this quest in the snowy mountains, you may also encounter a Gyadrome roaming the snowy peaks. Should be a walk in the park to get rid of this annoyance, if you've been upgrading your gear of course. The Blangos shouldn't be too much of an issue, just be sure to check areas 2 and 3 if you're having trouble locating the last few monsters. 
The next key quest is against the Daimyo Hermitar for the Lurking Desert Giant. Daimyo Hermitar is basically a giant crab. Its description states, A large Capricorn with a giant monster skull on its back. Fond of the sand, it is mainly seen in the desert or jungle zones. Living underground, it surfaces when hungering for a snack. This oversized hermit crab is extremely weak to thunder and fire. Ice is a good third option, and it takes a little water damage, but no dragon. As for the weak points, the Capricorn have pincers, as well as a shell that covers the thorax. For gunners, aim for the head if possible. If not, the thorax and legs slash arms take decent damage. Both cutting and impact weapons should focus the head and body. Impact does good all over the body, and cutting should avoid hitting the shell. Hermitar's shell is a skull of a monoblos, a monster we will face in the next level. This shell can be broken for a chance to receive a monoblos horn. One move it can do can actually block attacks with its massive claws. In this state, you will do little damage, so it's best to wait for it to let its guard down. Unless you have broken its claws, then you will be able to inflict some damage, even when it's in its guard state. Daimyo Hermitar can also dig underground and travel to a hunter's location, then pop out with its shell for a very powerful attack. It can also jump very high, then come crashing down on your hunter. Being a crab, it will walk sideways and use its pincers to swipe away at any hunters that try to face this foe. One last interesting attack is the use of its bubbly foam spray it can shoot out from its mouth at great speeds. This means Daimyo Hermitar was the original bubble monster, sorry Mitsusune. With its great weakness to fire, I would once again recommend the bone shooter or any other fire slash thunder weapons you have available. If the crab stumbles into area 9 or 3, and you're using a ranged weapon, you can perform the ledge cheese tactics. This is where a hunter fires at a monster from a ledge, while being in little to no danger, because the monster in question has no way of hitting the hunter. This is a great opportunity to unload as much ammo as possible before the monster leaves the area. Daimyo Hermitar will give the player the ability to craft a few water weapons as well as some pretty protective armor. The next key quest is Gypsaros, Venomous Terror, with our target being the Gypsaros, located in the swamp area. Yet another bird wyvern, its description reads, a wyvern that can generate disorienting flashes of light when its prominent head crest is struck. Its rubbery hide resists damage and can ward off shock traps, while its spit carries deadly venom. However, they are quite timid. From that description, you can tell Gypsaros has a few interesting characteristics. First off, it can resist shock traps and is immune to thunder damage, possibly an adaptation to survive Kezu attacks. Next is the head crest that will F your day up. If it flashes, then targets you before you can spam the ever-living dung out of your controller in an effort to unconfuse yourself. Your hunter can become confused when they take a few consecutive hits in a row or from a Gypsaros flash. You can become unconfused faster by spamming buttons on the controller. To this day, I'm not sure exactly what buttons to press, so I always end up spamming all of them while rotating the analog sticks. Lastly, Gypsaros is the first poison monster we encounter through the village. Be sure to bring extra antidotes because you are more than likely going to be poisoned several times, if not by the Gypsaros, by the toxic pools that can be found scattered throughout the swamp. Gypsaros is weakest to fire, but water and ice are a good second choice. Dragon is a last ditch effort, and avoid using thunder weapons. As for the weak points, aim for the head with all the weapons just to destroy the crest, but once the crest is broken, gunners can aim for the tail. Impact can also still focus the head, and cutting weapons should also target the tail, stomach, or back. By this point, you already know I'm recommending the Bone Shooter Heavy Bow Gun, just a no-brainer at this point with it having fire ammo. As for other weapon types, the Crystal Hammer is a good option, and any fire weapon you have crafted. Beware also the stretchy tail when the monster uses its spin move. Also, when Gypsaros is close to death, it may fake faint to lure hunters in only to unleash a flailing attack. 
On to the last key quest of level 3, a gathering quest involving delivering 10 special mushrooms from the forest and hills. A killing from mushrooms has you on your hands and knees looking for mushrooms while avoiding the local cut coup that may or may not try to end your life. A simple enough quest that gives you the opportunity to explore the forests and hills if you haven't done so already. One thing I recommend all players do is craft a gathering set to make better use of picks and bug nets with the whim skill. Also skills such as gathering and speed gathering will come in handy too, especially once you get in the high rank. Now before I get into the urgent quest, I would like to briefly cover the remaining large monsters that can be hunted in level 3. For starters, level 3 has the special hip checking fish named Plesioth. This Poseidon wyvern lives in the water and will sometimes hunt for food along the shoreline. It is one of the largest wyverns in the game and can use water beam attacks as well as its most well known, the dreaded hip check move. Next is the Iodrome, another pack leader for the less fierce Iaprey. It commands powerful poison attacks and is very fast so beware if you're using a slow weapon. Other than those two monsters, you can hunt the Yanketku as well as the Kangalala in level 3. We are also introduced to three subspecies monsters that will be unlocked after facing their normal counterparts. These monsters being Green Plesioth, Purple Gypsaros, and finally Blue Yanketku. Unlike the newer games, these subspecies are basically just retextures with a bit more HP than the originals, although some subspecies have different elemental weaknesses. I will say I did grind away at the blue Kutku to craft its gunner armor that comes with attack up small, reckless abandoned plus one, which is just a small affinity boost, and seven points into elemental attack. Now I won't be able to make this ten points until I fight Kirin, but I was planning ahead to get this skill in particular to use with my heavy and light bow guns. I also crafted the crab buster heavy bow gun that does decent attack and can shoot water shot. Before we can advance to level 4, we must face the Blanganga for the urgent quest, the Ruler of the Snow. This is another request from the Poke Village Chief herself. My next request requires a true master. Care to test yourself? I'd like you to hunt down the Chief of the Snowy Mountains. Remember, on this quest, negligence is unforgivable. This is one quest above all others we have completed so far that we must prepare for, whether that be upgrading our gear or bringing some extra items or traps to aid our hunt. Blanganga is a monster that you don't want to face with incompetence. Blanganga's reference notes state, Leader of the Blango Pack. It is twice as large and recognized by its giant fangs, whiskers, and head crown. It sends its pack to attack any trespassers. Its jumping power allows it great mobility in its home range of the snowy mountains. Blanganga is extremely fast and will try to flank you or even jump out of the snow from underneath your hunter. Blanganga can use its massive arms to hurl chunks of ice at any hunter unfortunate enough to face this beast. Blanganga has an icy breath attack that will leave you frozen solid. Being a local to the Snowy Mountains, it is no surprise Blanganga has a big weakness to fire. Blanganga also has a slight weakness to thunder, and for our last resort, you can use a water weapon. Ice and Dragon are not good elements to use, however. For impact and cutting weapons, you should focus your attacks on the head. A second option for cutting weapons being the tail, as for impact, you can also aim for the body. Gunners should also focus the head, then body for the highest DPS. Positioning is everything when fighting this monster. With Blanganga being super fast, a light slash faster weapon will be your best option. Although if you know Blanganga's movements, you should do just fine with a slower weapon. I personally would use a light or heavy bow gun. Just take into consideration your reload speed and positioning relative to the monster's location. Unlike Daimyo Hermitar, Ledge Cheese won't really work on Blanganga as he has many ranged attacks to deal with opponents from a distance. Blanganga will limp and flee to Area 3 once you've done enough damage, giving you the option to Sleep Bomb, Capture, Kill the Monster. 
Blanganga was the next wall I faced back on my PSP. No matter how many potions or traps I used, I always ended the quest with a fail. Using the longsword was probably my first mistake, although it probably had more to do with the fact that I couldn't avoid being hit by the Blanganga. As a monster moves or turns, and your hunter is too close to it, you will take a little bit of damage. I will refer to this as chip damage, and oh boy, Blanganga will do a ton of chip damage if you stand too close to him. After clearing Blanganga, you should have access to a few more ice weapons that will come in handy in the following ranks. Beginning in 4 star quests, we now have access to all the main low rank locations, with the final one being the volcano. Besides all the lava and fire, the volcano is a pretty cool place to visit. It is home to various different ores and crystals, making it one of the best places to go mining. Along with mining comes the added benefit of finding coal, an account item that will bring you in some extra poke points. The volcano is also home to many strange monsters that have adapted to live in these harsh conditions. Level 4 has another short list of key quests to complete in order to unlock the next urgent quest. Starting things off strong, we have the Battle of the Belos, a quest requested from none other than the Kokoto Village Chief. This is a request for the Virtuous Hunters of Poke. A Monoblos is tearing through the desert near my village of Kokoto. Please hunt it down for us. Monoblos is one of the final monsters you will face in the first Monster Hunter. That takes place in Kokoto Village, so it is fitting that the Chief of Kokoto is requesting this mission. I guess the Kokoto Hunter must have retired, or maybe has never returned from his last hunt. Nonetheless, we are now tasked with slaying this Unihorn Beast. Mono is a prefix meaning one, and D means two. Monoblos has one horn, and Diablos has two horns. Monoblos is also only available to hunt on solo quests, although it would have been cool to hunt Monoblos online on an event quest or something. Just saying. Remember Daimyo Hermitar? Yeah, this is the owner of the skull, but it's much smaller than the shell, leading me to believe that Monoblos get much bigger with age. This is its description, a large horned wyvern found in desert zones. Their giant horn make their attacks very dangerous. While they have no breath attack, their ear-splitting roar is the bane of hunters. Much like Kezu, Monoblos has an ear-shattering roar that will leave hunters vulnerable for a short period of time after the fact, leaving them open for an assault from this sandy wyvern. Luckily, Monoblos' horn being one of its greatest strengths, is also one of its greatest weaknesses. If a Monoblos charges directly into a large rock or wall, it will be stuck as it tries to wiggle itself loose. During this time, it's open for attacks, but beware of a counterattack when the monster breaks loose. The large rock in the center of Area 7 is a good spot to test this out as a melee user. For gunners, climb onto ledge in Area 3 or 9 to perform the ledge cheese strategy. Use as many advantages as you can, because Monoblos has the most HP out of any of the monsters you have faced thus far. Monoblos is weakest to ice weapons, but thunder is also a viable element. Fire is a third option, but water and dragon weapons should be avoided. Gunners, oddly enough, should aim for the tail, then the neck, and lastly the foot, wings, or stomach. Melee cutting weapons should also go for the tail, then the wing, stomach, or neck. Lastly, the impact users should go for the neck, and of all the places, then the tail, wing, foot, or stomach. Obviously, you can go for the head to try and break the horn as a melee user, but the head is weaker to shot damage above everything. Monoblos have very sensitive ears because if they dig underground, you can use a sonic bomb to make them emerge, leaving them in a pitfall-like state for a short period of time. Also, once Monoblos is enraged and the blood starts to swell to its head, sonic bombs will no longer work. Monoblos isn't that bad in smaller areas, but fighting him in area 2 or 5 is more running back and forth than actually fighting the monster. Also, beware of setting traps. If Monoblos sticks underneath one, it will be destroyed. Once you have completed this quest, the white Monoblos will be unlocked. Much like many of the subspecies, 
It is just a more powerful monoblos that prefers to stay underground most of the time when traveling in between areas, making it a bit harder to track. Up next is our first key quest in the volcano location, with our next quest being Basarios Unseen Peril. Now Basarios is an interesting wyvern, and the reference book has this to say about it. A large wyvern found in volcanic zones, they are the juvenile form of Gravios. They have a steel-like carpace that requires powerful items to crack, emits poison gas. In all my years of playing Monster Hunter, I must have never read the Basarios description because I did not know that it was just a baby Gravios. Although it does make some sense, the skulls of both monsters are drastically different from one another, so I never made the connection. Basarios shell is extremely hard, meaning most weapons will simply bounce off the monster. Having a skill such as ESP later in the game will help greatly when fighting this monster. Basarios will often be found submerged in the rocky ground, with only its back boulders poking out. The rocks on its shell resemble boulder formations that can be found littered about the volcano, but the shell is a slightly lighter shade, making the Basarios stick out like a sore thumb in most areas. Oddly enough, every element is good against the Basarios, but Dragon is the most effective. Water, being a more common and accessible element, is a good second choice. As for the weak points, or should I say weak point, all weapons should focus on the abdomen. Once the abdomen is broken, it will take a lot more damage than before. Also, one fun fact about the Basarios, it has the smallest tail cut in the game, and when I say small, I mean smaller than your comrade. Basarios is a slow lumbering beast that will often use charge attacks or shoot massive fireballs when it feels threatened. Basarios can also shoot a powerful fire beam as well as sleep and poison gas. Not from its mouth though, from its tummy. Any water weapon would be a good choice against Basarios, but a ranged weapon would be my go-to option. Melee users will have a harder time, <laughs> get it, because it's hard, because the stomach is usually the only place that you won't bounce off of without a higher level of sharpness. If you're using a hunting horn though, it will be easier because of the song that gives you the ESP-like effect. One way anyone with or without skills with a gun could use a light bow gun that shoots sleep ammo. Bring combines for more sleep ammo, a couple large barrel bomb plus and combines for more of those as well, and a shock trap with a few trank bombs. This is actually a speedrunning strategy, so you know it's a fast and efficient way to hunt. Once you find Basterios, you can bomb him when he's in the ground, but I put him to sleep right away. Just two large barrel bomb plus exploding while it's sleeping will bring Basterios down to half HP. I was just watching my footage back when I used this strat on Monoblos as well, and I had to retry this method two times to finally get a somewhat decent run on my third time, but it was nowhere close to a speed run record. Once Basarios has been put to rest, we can move on to the next key quest, Commander in the Flames, another quest on the volcano where we must face the sharp clawed crab, Shogun Cianitar. Much like the Daimyo Hermitar, Shogun Cianitar is an enormous crab compared to its smaller relative, the Cianitar, that can be found in the volcanic region. Shogun's description states, a large Capricorn with a giant monstrous skull on its back. Its long, sharp pincers allow it to pierce volcanic bedrock and travel along ceilings. Sometimes a precious and valuable pearl can be found inside its shell. Unlike the Daimyo Hermitar, the Shogun possesses several different shells and will even find a new one if its shell is ever broken. One of these shells being the most iconic is the Gravio Skull. One ability you may see a Shogun possessing a Gravio Skull shell do is shoot a powerful water beam out of the skull's mouth. Apparently this isn't water but its own urine as the wiki states. So Kangalala will shit on you and Shogun will piss on you. Cool. Another difference to its sandy cousin is the Shogun has razor sharp claws built for offense rather than defense and is much more aggressive. At first, Shogun may not seem very intimidating, but once enraged, folding claws will extend making them twice the length as before. This makes it extremely hard to dodge because it has a very long reach with its swiping claw attacks. 
One more feature I should mention is that if Shogun's claws are broken, he will permanently be in rage mode until the quest is over. Shogun will give you some decent Blade Master armor as it has the skills Sharp Sword and Sharpening Skill Increase. Sharp Sword will decrease sharpness loss, while the Sharpening Skill speeds up the sharpening process when using a whetstone. It also has 5 points into the Artisan skill, and once activated, your weapon will gain a whole new level of sharpness. Shogun is very weak to thunder damage, but ice comes in close for second place. Fire and water will also have some effect, but dragon is useless against this crab. Impact weapons will be the most effective to use, and you should aim for the head if possible, or resort to bonking the body or shell. Cutting weapons should also go for the head, then body. Lastly, gunners should once again focus on the head and secondly aim for the legs. Oddly enough, the game FAQ page has another chart for if the shell is broken, and these weak points will take even more damage for the short period of time that Shogun is naked. The fourth and final key quest of level 4 is yet another quest in the volcano by the name of More Coal Please. On this quest, we are tasked with delivering 15 pieces of coal. This is our first mining mission, and it is a great opportunity to gather rare ores such as Dragonite or Firestone. The gathering guide has areas 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9 having coal, but if you need ore, just mine as much as possible in all the areas with mining nodes. Also note that areas 6 and 8 will require the heat cancel high skill to negate heat exhaustion and cool drinks will not last as long in these areas. A Shogun Cianitar is also present on this quest, so watch your 6 when mining in areas that it can travel to. Once again, before we move on to the urgent quest, I would like to highlight some of the optional quests in level 4. The Red Kezu is one of these interesting quests, and this subspecies actually has different elemental weaknesses being weak to water instead of fire. One quest you must slay 10 Yen Kaku before it is available is the Yen Garuga. This is a new addition to the game that was not in Freedom 2. Garuga is one of the most aggressive monsters in the game and has the ability to shoot fireballs as well as poison you with its spiky tail. If you're looking for some decent weapons to carry you into high rank, I would recommend farming this mean purple chicken. I farmed Gruga for a bit so I could craft his heavy bowgun as it does a ton of damage and has a 6 shot clip for fire ammo, which will come in handy come Shin Gaoran. I already mentioned the white monoblos, but he is also here in case you forgot. Last of the normal hunting quests is the Iodrome, a bird-like wyvern with poison attacks and the leader of the Ioprey. There are a few more hunting quests as well as slaying quests, but this last monster is our first look at an Elder Dragon. Kushala Deora is a metallic Elder Dragon with the power to command the winds around it. Defeating this Elder Dragon with the gear you have available to you is truly a great accomplishment. The guild states that Elder Dragons are much more rare than the Wyvern species, so the Elder Dragon quests won't always be available. This just means you will have to be actively checking for these quests to show up, as they won't always appear on the quest book. I will cover Elder Dragons in more detail after the offline high rank section of this video. After all the quests we have cleared thus far, we must face the monster that bested us in the beginning of the game, Tiger Rex. The quest is named Absolute Power, and the Tiger Rex possesses it. This quest comes directly from the village chief, stating the Tiger Rex, said to be an ancestor of today's wyverns, has finally made an appearance. With such a powerful beast on the loose, the village is not safe. Hunt it down at once. Oak Village needs our aid once again, facing none other than the flagship monster for Monster Hunter Freedom 2. Now, when I talk about monsters being walls, none compare to the power of the Tiger Rex. Its reference notes read, A flying wyvern that maintains its primitive origins. Prone to violence, it possesses incredible ferocity thanks to its forelimbs, claws, and jaw inhabits a wide area, it has even been spotted hunting Popo in the mountains. 
Now the Poke Elder mentioned it's an ancestor to the wyverns we face today, so I wonder if it's more closely related to the Elder Dragons based on how powerful this monster is. Tigerex will stop at nothing once it has spotted its prey, so beware when engaging this monster. When Tigerex is enraged, it will let out a roar more powerful than any monster you have faced so far. Its roar will even damage you if you are close enough to the monster, so be careful when using a melee weapon. Also, its veins will begin to glow red as blood courses through its face and forelimbs while angry. Much like the Monoblos, Tigerex can become stuck in a wall with its massive jaws while charging, so use the walls to your advantage. Don't overextend yourself though, because Tigerex will only be stuck for a few moments and will retaliate once free. When charging, Tigerex will lead with his left forelimb, so try to avoid that side of its body and roll to its right side, your left, if facing the monster. Ledge Cheese won't work on Tigerex either, as it can send massive chunks of the terrain flying in multiple directions to defeat foes from a distance. Be sure to bring extra mega potions and hot drinks because this quest does take place in the snowy mountains. Thunder is the most effective element to use, followed closely by Dragon, although as I have said many times, if you are playing through the village for the first time, you probably don't have any Dragon weapons yet. Water is a good third option, followed by Ice. Now, Fire is zero across the board except for the monster's back, but if you're using a melee weapon, forget about trying to hit the back, this ain't no Monster Hunter Rise or Double Cross. The head should be the focus of all weapons, but because Tigerex mainly attacks with its mouth or front arms, the back legs are a good second choice. Now, I personally cannot recommend anything other than a light bow gun or bow, just because I have become very rusty with melee weapons, but melee is definitely still viable. The light bow gun sleep bomb strategy will work, but you will need some extra bombs and shock traps as well as more sleep ammo combines because Tiger X has a massive amount of HP. I wouldn't use a heavy bow gun unless you are very comfortable with the weapon because heavy bow gun is slow and Tiger X is fast. Now if you're not going to sleep bomb and just going for a normal run as a gunner, bring 5 flash bombs and combines for 10 more. Tigerex will stay confused by the flash bomb for a decent bit of time, stay in front of him aiming for the head, but beware of his projectile attack. You will want to stand a bit off to the right or left of the monster and just unload as much ammo as possible, aiming for the head or back legs. Before the first flash bomb wears off if you're doing enough damage, it will probably go into rage mode and lunge backwards. This is when you will need to be ready to throw another flash bomb once the first one has worn off. Rinse and repeat this process until it either dies or limps away. Tiger X has some pretty decent low rank weapons that come with a lot of raw attack but have poor affinity with most of them having minus 25 to 30 percent affinity. This can be offset with with the expert skill however. Also the blade master weapons come with a bit of blue sharpness but unless you have the sharpness skill it won't last long especially on the faster hitting weapons. As for its low rank armor it's a bit of a letdown. Being the flagship for Monster Hunter Freedom 2 you think its armor would have some decent skills. With Tigerex being an aggressive monster I would have expected some offensive skills to complement its weapons. But no, we get speed eating and 9 points into hearing, so the earplug skill won't even be active until we buy and set a decoration. Now we have entered the big leagues where we shall face the 5 star monsters. Long gone are the days of going on easy missions. Level 5 will prepare you for what is to come in 6 star quests, then high rank, so grab your mega potions and get ready to cart. Although, our first key quest isn't too bad unless you're allergic to Gypsaros. Or should I say Gypsarosses? As we are tasked with hunting a Gypsaros and Purple Gypsaros for the Poison Saga. 
All because some princess doesn't want the jungle flowers to die. I believe this is our first key quest where we are tasked with hunting two monsters on the same quest. That isn't a slaying quest, of course. Both monsters will have a little bit less HP than they would on their individual quests, so as long as you have a decent fire weapon, this quest will be a walk through the jungle. Purple Gypsaros is basically the same as the normal Gypsaros, with the same weaknesses and hit zones, but it is known to use the flashing attack more often. Fire is your best bet for elemental attack, then ice or water, and of course aim for the head. This takes place in the jungle at night, so you won't be able to sleep bomb them outside because of the rain. I would bring Psycho Serum just in case you have a hard time locating one of these poison chickens. The next key quest takes place in the desert where we are faced with defeating the Diablos. The quest is called the Runaway Diablos and the monster's description states, Two horned wyverns found in desert zones. They are capable of burrowing into sand to attack prey from below. Incredibly violent and proud, they are known to unleash terrible wrath when accosted. Now, Diablos is almost identical to Monoblos. The key differences between them is Diablos has two horns rather than one, and its tail is a different shape. Diablos is also weakest to ice, but not fire. Thunder and dragon are a good second choice and water isn't a bad option either. Gunners will want to focus on the tail, then wings or stomach. Cutting weapons should also go for the tail, as well as resorting hitting the neck, stomach, or wings if the tail is out of reach. Lastly, bonker users can aim for the neck, then tail, wing, or stomach. Just like Monoblos, the Diablos can get its horns stuck in the rocks or walls of area 3, 7, and 9. So be sure to take advantage of the ledge cheese when using a ranged weapon to make for a quicker and easier fight. The sleep bomb strat could work as well, but be sure to bring a few extra combines because Diablos has a decent bit of HP. When fighting Diablos in the open desert, utilize Sonic and Flash Bombs, as well as Shock or Pitfall traps to aid in his defeat. Just remember, if Diablos digs under a place trap, it will be destroyed. One thing I have found odd is you can carve from the Monoblos four times, but you can only carve three times from Diablos, even though they are practically the same monster and size. You can also carve from the Monoblos tail twice, meaning you can get a total of six carves with a tail cut on Monoblos versus Diablos having a total of four carves. While Diablos and some other low rank monsters have decent armor, I wouldn't recommend grinding for any armor, because it will quickly become obsolete come high rank. Only grind for higher level low rank armor if you're taking the game slow and not rushing to get into high rank. That being said, Diablos armor comes with Reckless Abandon plus 2, which will give your weapons plus 20% affinity. This armor pairs nicely with the Diablos weapons, as they have a little negative affinity that will be cancelled out by the expert skill, and also have very high raw attack. After Diablos, we must face not one, but two Diama Hermitar, also in the desert, but at night, so remember those hot drinks if you're worried about running out of the ones given in the supply box. Ultimate Crab Dinner is the name of the quest, because a gourmet thinks that one crab isn't enough. I don't know about you, but I would be hard pressed to finish all the meat off of one Hermitar, let alone a single Diamo Hermitar. Maybe they're a huge wyvern person or something. Just like the Gypsaros quest earlier in this level, the Hermitars will have slightly less HP than the one we fought in level 3. As long as both the monsters are not in the same area as you, you shouldn't have any trouble finishing this quest, considering you have the appropriate gear. Also, a note for gunners, you can ledge cheese in areas 3 as well as 9, so take full advantage of that. Also, any thunder weapons should be able to cook these crabs with ease. The final key quest on the list is Terror of the Gravios. As I stated earlier, Gravios is simply an older and thicker Bassarios that has reached adulthood. With his chonkiness comes added HP and attack. Of course, Gravios lives in the volcano, which is where this quest takes place, but can also be found in the swamp regions. 
Due to Gravios's Molten Rock Diet, it can perform a powerful Fire Beam attack. While it has lost its poison gas from its adolescence, it can still produce a sleep gas and has also gained the ability to release a fiery gas as a byproduct of its laser beam. Its tail has grown significantly and will club anything that gets too close to its backside. Gravios is one of the largest known wyverians and due to its size it has limited flight ability and will walk where it needs to go. It can also move surprisingly fast for being such a huge beast and will often charge at opponents head on. Unlike the Basarios, Gravios is not weak to every element, but is still weakest to Dragon. Water is a great second choice, and Ice will work in a pinch. Also, Gravios is only weak to fire on its stomach once it has been broken. Speaking of its belly, aim for it with whatever weapon you are using, as it is the weakest point, and it will also take a lot more damage once it has been cracked open. Sleep bombing will be a good strategy to use, but I believe there are also explosive boulders littered throughout the volcano. Have Gravios detonate these with his charging attack for some extra damage. Also, for gunners, pierce ammo and elemental ammos that act like a pierce bullet such as water are extremely effective against Gravios due to its sheer size and girthiness. Pierce bows will also do a ton of damage. Again, before I discuss the urgent quest, I would like to gloss over some of the optional quests. For starters, after defeating Diablos, a Black Diablos will be unlocked. Black Diablos is said to be a female Diablos in heat, so she has a bit of a temper. Gravios also has a black version simply named Black Gravios. Although it is categorized as a subspecies, it is just a normal Gravios whose shell has changed color due to a chemical change caused by a high body temperature. Much like the Black Diablos, Black Gravios is more aggressive than its gray counterpart. There are a few slaying quests for small monsters, as well as one of them being the Shalakakas, who Tri and three ultimate fans will recognize as the same species as Chacha and Kayamba, although they are not as friendly looking as their third gen cousins. Also, I almost failed to mention that you can visit the tower location on a Slay 10 Ramabra quest. This quest is also great for farming materials from not only Ramabra, but Great Thunderbugs as well. One final mission before I talk briefly on one of the more impressive monsters is a quest called Small Shadow Over the Swamp. In this quest, we will encounter a Kezu that is a gold miniature crown. This Kezu is a bit faster than its older brothers and sisters, making it hard to hit. Also, its roar is shorter, but you will be stunned for the same period of time, leaving you more vulnerable after the fact. Now for the harder optional quests, these all being Elder Dragons. First, we have our first look at the Phantom Beast Kirin. Unlike most Elder Dragons, Kirin does not resemble a dragon, or even a wyvern for that matter. Kirin is a small and agile unicorn that can summon lightning at will, commonly found in the snowy mountain regions. Its movements are similar to a Kelby or Anteka. Also, you will need to slay Kirin in order to get elemental attack up decorations, which I needed to do in order to activate elemental attack up on my blue Kutku gunner set. Next is the Empress of Flame, Lunastra. This Elder Dragon is very aggressive and can even control flames with the power of its horns. Lunastra primarily inhabits the volcanic belt, but has been spotted at the tower on a rare occasion. Lastly is the Mist Dragon, Camellios. With eyes similar to a chameleon, Camellios can move its eyes individually of one another. It also possesses a long sticky tongue it can use to steal items off of unsuspecting hunters, and also has a poison fog it will use if threats get too close to it. Camellios can be found in the forests and hills as well as the swamp locations. Now we have yet another request from the Poke Village Chief, where we are faced with a troublesome pair. Our goal is to hunt a Rathalos and Rathian. A pair of wyverns have taken up residence in the hillside. If you are able to hunt them by yourself, you are truly a top class hunter. Care to try your luck? 
This is one of the last urgents we will face on low rank for the village. Rathalos' description states, Male wyvern that keeps a nest and patrols its patch of territory from the air in search of prey. Its claws are filled with poison that weakens its quarry. Rathians reads, Female version of Rathlos Wyvern, unlike its male counterpart, it usually patrols its territory from the ground. Its tail spikes are filled with poison. While Rathlos may seem like the stronger opponent, Rathian actually has more HP. Rathlos will spend much of the time flying around, attacking its prey or any hunter from above. Rathian does the opposite and will only be seen flying when traveling to another location and will focus on ground-based assaults. Each wyvern alone is a formidable opponent, but if you wind up in the same area with these two, you better run or have some dung bombs handy. But one of the greatest weaknesses of both wyverns is also their greatest strength. Both monsters have extremely good eyesight and this can be exploited with the use of flash bombs. I would recommend that you bring as many flash bombs as you can on this quest, especially if you are a ranged user, as you can just sit back and blast the monster. Melee users, on the other hand, will have a harder time when they are confused because they tend to use the spin move a lot. I personally went for the sleep bombing strategy, but I did utilize flash bombs to get my sleep shots off. If you're going for more conventional tactics, aim for the head on both wyverns for all weapon types. The neck and foot are also good weak points for all weapons. As for elemental weaknesses, Rathalos is weakest to ice, then dragon and water are tied for second. While thunder can be a last resort, but is still a decent option to have. Rathian on the other hand is weakest to dragon, second is thunder or ice, then lastly is water element, this will also do a bit of damage. Hammer is always a good option against the Rass, as they are weakest on the head and are easy to concuss. I would also recommend avoiding area 9 as it is a very narrow area and you can easily get trapped against the wall with nowhere to go, leading to a cart. Also, both Rathian and Rathalos have the ability to poison, so be sure to bring a few antidotes or herbal medicine to cure the affliction. If Rathalos flies into the air to shoot fireballs or use its poison claw attack, simply roll or run directly under its shadow and it will not be able to hit you. Rathalos has another aerial attack I like to call Around the World, where it flies for a solid 20 to 30 seconds around the area, then dive bombs a hunter, then usually flies out of the map and has to fly back into zone, wasting a bunch of time. This attack usually misses due to collisions with other objects, but be aware when Rathalos does use this move just in case. Rathian, on the other hand, enjoys a bunch of cardio and shooting fireballs, so stay cautious even if you are far away from the monster. Rathian will also do backflips in hopes of clubbing you with her spiky poisonous tail. If you're looking for some decent poison weapons, Rathian definitely has you covered, and on the other hand, if you want a really good fire weapon option, Rathalos is definitely the monster you want to farm. We have now reached the final level of the low rank village quests. These are obviously some of the hardest quests you can embark on for the village elder. Five of the 12 quests being dual monster quests, two are elder dragon quests, and there are two siege missions. Although they are tough quests, at least it's a colorful lineup. The first key quest on the books is Pink Dance in the Jungle. Our target on this mission is none other than the Pink Rathian, a subspecies of Rathian, as you might have guessed. While the subspecies don't have their own description in the second generation, this pink wonder is slightly different than our green counterpart. Pink Rathian has thicker scales and plates, making more common weapons bounce off on impact. She is also quicker as well as stronger with her attacks. Remember that backflip move I mentioned not too long ago? Pink Rathian loves this move and will use it much more often than the regular Rathian. The wiki states that this coloration difference is due to a genetic mutation. I would like to assume that due to her more eye-catching color versus the camouflage of the normal green Rathian, Pink Rathian had to adapt to survive from other apex predators. 
The pink Rathian has almost identical weaknesses and weak points to the normal Rathian, with the only caveat being a more defensive wing, tail, and stomach. She also takes slightly less ice damage on the head and neck. Other than that, Dragon Then Thunder and Water are all good options to use. Just like the normal Rathian, Flash Bombs are very effective at confusing the monster. This quest does take place in the jungle at night, so don't think about using normal bombs outside in the rain. There is a small ledge gunners can utilize in Area 3 for ledge cheese, but beware of Rathian's fireballs and tail moves. Luckily, this ledge is a gateway to another area, so you can area hop if you find yourself in a pickle. Next key quest on the list is Four Horns, facing the Diablos and Black Diablos. As I stated previously, the Black Diablos is just a female version of the Diablos in Heat. Black Diablos also shares the same weaknesses and weak points as the regular Diablos. Therefore, you should aim for the tail, stomach, or wings of these wyverns. This quest does take place at night, so remember your hot drinks for the frigid desert air. Also, remember lots of Sonic, Flash, and Dung Bombs to aid you on your quest of glory. Also, let us not forget our gunner strategies of sleep bombing or ledge cheesing these horned beasts. Like other multi-monster quests, each Diablos will have slightly less HP than their individual hunts. With 6 star only having 3 key quests, this next one is our final task before we unlock one of the urgent quests. Attack of the Rathalos will have your hunter tracking down an Azur Rathalos that is a subspecies monster. Much like the Pink Rathian, the Azur Rathalos is more aggressive as well as a stronger opponent. Basically, more HP, more attack. While the normal Rathalos favors aerial combat, the Azur Rathalos will fly even more than its red cousin. This quest does take place at the Forest and Hills. Azur Rathalos has very similar weaknesses to normal Rathalos, but is weaker to Dragon than Ice. Ice is still a good second option, while Water and Thunder are good third options, but Azur is not as weak to Water as the normal Rathalos. Just like the normal Los, Flash Bombs will come in handy for both Gunners and Blade Masters. Sleep Bombing will work on this quest as well, and it's never a bad idea to bring a few traps. After you've completed all three key quests, an urgent quest should be available. The remaining optional quests are some of the hardest offline, and I will briefly discuss them. First up, we have a dual Plesioth quest in the jungle. If you don't like fighting Plesioth, I don't recommend you do this quest, as it has double the hip checks. Next is Teostra, the Emperor of Flame. Teostra is an Elder Dragon, male counterpart to Lunastra, that can normally be found in the volcano, but is sometimes spotted in the desert. Next up is a quest in the volcano up against two Shogun Cianatar. There are a couple more quests you can unlock in this level, but first I will go over this urgent quest. Surprisingly, this urgent quest is not coming from our village chief. This quest is called A State of Crisis, and our goal is to defend the town from the Shen Georan. Shen's definition reads, A giant carapacion with an equally giant monster's skull on its back. Prone to roaming and fiercely territorial, any intruders will be met with opposition. So, nearby forts or towns must be warned of its presence. This giant was first introduced in Monster Hunter 2, and it has the skull shell of a Lao Shan Lung. This skull is much larger than the Lao we fight in game, suggesting that the Lao we fight is only an adolescent, with them growing much larger in size with age. This is our first quest at the town, as well as our first siege mission. Unlike Kulv Taroth from Monster Hunter World, the siege missions in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite are very slow and boring in my opinion, with the main goal being to defend the fortress or town by repelling or slaying the beast. Shin Georan will occasionally try to attack the hunter directly, but will mainly focus on damaging the fortress structure. There are a few siege weapons you can try to use such as cannons, ballista, and the dragonator, although you will need to either gather cannonballs or ballista in order to use those siege weapons. The dragonator is also located at the top of the fort, so you will need to climb up three sets of ladders to get to it. With this being a solo quest, that means you have to take time from dealing damage to the monster in order to do these tasks. 
the Dragonator is worth it as it does a decent chunk of HP and you do get a few ballista shots in the supply box so you can try and use these to break its massive shell. The best time to use the Dragonator is when Shin stands up tall to do an attack on the wall. Run over and climb the ladder before it does a powerful attack to give you more time to defeat the foe. But I wouldn't waste your time gathering any cannonballs. It isn't hard to fail this quest, especially if you're not doing enough damage. Because Shin will walk up to the wall every few minutes to do an attack, and if you fail to cause a flinch, it will successfully hit the wall, causing the overall integrity to drop. If the integrity percentage reaches zero, you will fail the quest. Now that I think about this, it's kind of like a DPS check for you to get into high rank. This is an interesting fight because you will mainly be hitting one of its four legs, but as the monster walks, it may step on you or cause a small quake, making your hunter lose balance for a second or so, so you are constantly repositioning throughout the fight, trying not to get squashed. Shin has an interesting weak point being inside of its shell for all weapons. How on earth you're supposed to hit inside the shell with a melee weapon is beyond me. As for gunners, I would bring lots of pier shots and combines for more. Shin is weakest to dragon, and the ammo does act like a pier shot. Same with thunder, that is a good third option, but Shin is also slightly weak to water and ice. Fire is the second weakest element, but the ammo doesn't act like a pier shot, so I would aim for its head, as it's the second weakest point on the crab. The shell does have two breaks, so be mindful of that if you're trying to go for extra rewards. Each foot has two breaks, but these breaks can also be repeated. The first break will turn the foot a dull red, the next break it will become a bright red, and then the next break the foot will repeat the cycle. For some extra damage you can bring bombs to set off after Shin has done an attack. Set them directly below the monster's body, and explode them once it has squatted all the way down. As for gunners, you can shoot the foot, but if you're using pierce-like ammo, I would aim it directly through the body or shell at its inner weak point on the abdomen. For other ammo types that act like normal ammo, aim for the head to deal the most damage. If you do attack while in front of the monster, beware of its massive claws, as it will use them to attack the hunter from time to time. If you do slay the beast, be sure to carve as many times as you can, with this monster having a total of 9 carves. After clearing the quest, two more quests will appear, one being the urgent to get into high rank, and the other being the Laoshan Lung, another siege quest that takes place at the fortress. I will say this and I may repeat myself, but you will need Laoshan Lung Claws to combine with your power slash armor charms. These items can be purchased from the item counter in the guild hall. They are expensive, but if you have been keeping up on your power seed farming, you should have enough to buy at least one of them, if not both. Once you have combined both these items, you can then buy another power and armor charm to keep in your inventory. By keeping all of these items in your inventory, you will get a decent buff to your attack and defense. This bonus attack and defense will be a great help for getting into high rank and G rank. One quest I haven't mentioned yet, because in order for it to appear, you must clear all low rank village quests. This quest is called the Final Invitation, where you must hunt two Rajang in the Great Arena. If you choose to clear this quest with low rank gear, I wish you luck, as the Rajang is no easy beast to slay. Finally, our last urgent quest of low rank is Secret Request Hypnocatrice, where we must fight the Hypno in the Great Forest. Hypno's description states, A rust-colored bird wyvern with beautiful tail feathers found mainly in forests. A highly pacifistic wyvern by nature, it breathes sleeping gas on its enemies and prey alike. Its strong, developed legs pack a serious punch, so be careful. This will be our first quest in the Great Forest if you haven't played through the guild quests. The Great Forest is just one of those areas I never quite learned the layout of because it's a high slash G rank exclusive where you don't get a map until the supplies are delivered or you do a paw pass quest. As the quest name implies, this is a secret mission. 
The quest giver is a selfish mantled girl and it states, I told my mother I wanted a hat adorned with a hypnocotrisis tail feather, but she got mad and said I was being selfish. Therefore, this is a secret request. You must tell no one, okay? I love reading these quest descriptions for a little backstory for the quests. While it is usually save our village or stop our livestock from being eaten, this quest is simply a spoiled girl that wants a cute hat accessory, so we have to go slay a whole ass monster for it. Hypnocatrice is a monster first added in Frontier, but Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is its first and only mainline appearance. Hypno also has more unique attacks than other bird wyverns in Freedom Unite. It can shoot massive balls of sleep juices that splash in large areas once reaching the ground. Hypno can also use its sleep sack to create a cloudy mist of sleep gas to attack any predators or hunters. Instead of a traditional charge attack, Hypno will hop forward, turn, then hop again, allowing it to reposition on the move. Hypno will retreat to area 7 once its HP is low enough, and this will be indicated when its back feathers are flat on its back. Hypno is weakest on the head for all weapons, but the stomach is a good second choice for melee users. Cutting weapons can also aim for the foot if the head isn't available. For gunners, if you're not shooting the head, try and aim for the neck or back. As for elemental weaknesses, fire is the best to use, followed closely by ice. Next is thunder, primarily on the wings, and last is water. Dragon is a last ditch effort, but it is still slightly weak to it. Once this urgent has been completed, you will have access to 7 star quests given by Nakot, the feline next to the Elder Chief. Nakot's quests are very difficult, so prepare yourself to bring all your own items, and you should begin to familiarize yourself with the old map locations, as there will be no maps for you to reference in-game, unless the supplies are delivered. Also, forget about gathering during a pop house quest, as there are none offline. How I approach high rank is I usually clear the low rank village, then the low rank guild quests. I do this so once I reach high rank for the village and the guild, I have access to the high rank paw pass quest provided by the guildie. Now that we have reached high rank, the items we can gather and carve will sometimes be of higher quality. We will now be able to mine more rare ores such as carbolite ore. Also, more rare insects will appear like the king scarab. Nakote will provide the high rank quest for solo offline play, and his first rank is 7 star quests. There are no paw pass quests offline, so if you wish to gather more easily in high rank, I suggest you play through the guild quest until you reach HR4. Or you could save some room in your item bag and bring bug nets slash pickaxes to gather items while out on the hunt. Now that you have reached high rank, you will have a small chance to spawn in the secret area of some maps. Also, the kitchen skill Feline Explorer will guarantee you spawn in the secret area 100% of the time. Don't expect to go on any easy quests, as most of these quests will probably take you more than 10 minutes if you still have low rank gear. Now, onto the four key quests in level 7. One quick note, these sections may be a little shorter depending on if I've already covered the monster in question during the low rank village section of the video. Starting off, we have a slaying quest, Blafangos in the Night, where we must slay 20 Blafangos in the Swamp. This isn't a stroll of the Swamp, because there is a Bulldrum present as well. To make things easier on myself, I usually end up killing the Bulldrum, so I'm not looking over my shoulder every 5 seconds to see if I'm about to get a tusk up the waste slot. Take advantage of this quest by mining for rare ores only found in the higher ranks, such as Nova Crystal and Carbolite Ore. You can also gather select mushrooms now because they're only found in the higher ranks, and each mushroom will yield 500 zenny as well as 500 poke points. Next up is the quest Target Bassarios, where we must hunt a Bassarios in the Old Swamp. Now, the old swamp is trash in my opinion, just because I'm unfamiliar with this area layout and I always somehow seem to get lost. Besides that, it is pretty similar to the normal swamp. And oddly enough, Bassarios can typically be found in areas 7 or 11. These cave areas are cold and are also a great place to mine for those rare ores. As we covered Bassarios already, I don't have too much to say other than aim for the stomach and use a water weapon. 
I think Passerios gets a few more moves in high rank, but I am unsure. Moving along, we face the hairless beast named Kezu once again. Old Jungle Lightning is the name of the quest, and as the name suggests, we are hunting in the old jungle. Much like the old swamp, the old jungle is very confusing to me and I really should spend more time learning this area. Kezu can be found in the cave systems most often, but I don't know exactly what areas. 4, 5, 9, and 10 are all cave areas, but Kezu can also fly to area 8. Kezu can sometimes use an even more powerful ranged attack that shoots out in a wider cone being the high rank version of the monster. Be sure to bring a fire weapon, and a few extra traps never hurt anybody. You will also need some hot drinks as the caves are very cold and will drain your stamina. Well, I lied when I said there are no pop pass quests in offline high rank. The next key quest before we unlock our urgent is Kangalala's Assault, where we must hunt a minimum of two Kangalalas before the time limit expires. Once two monsters have been slain, items will be delivered to the box. To finish the quest, we can either deliver the pop ass tickets provided once we slay two monsters, or keep hunting more monkeys until we achieve enlightenment. This quest does take place in the swamp, so it is another good opportunity to mine if you bring along some pickaxes. By now you should have a decent fire or ice weapon to slay these pink beasts. Both monsters will spawn in area 8, and they will go to area 7 to sleep once they are weak enough. Now here are a few optional hunting quests in level 7. You can fight the Cephedrome in the old desert. If you're a gunner, I highly recommend you clear this quest to unlock the Sandfall Plus Light Bow Gun because it shoots 4 fire, water, and thunder shots. On top of that, it also rapid fires normal level 2 shots. If you want to do some sleep bombing or any other status shots, it also shoots all of those, even the level 2 variants. All around, it's a decent high rank light bow gun that should be able to clear most of the quests to come. Both Gypsaros and Purple Gypsaros have separate hunting quests. You can also hunt a red Kezu located in the snowy mountains. There is a quest similar to the Kangalalas where you must hunt Diama Hermitars instead. Also, we get our first look at an epic hunting quest in the jungle where we must hunt a Yang Kutku and Daimyo Hermitar. On the epic hunting quest, when you carve, you will receive Mega Potions, not Monster Materials. The last large monster quest is the Queen Vespoid, a new addition to Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. On this quest, before the Queen will appear, you must first slay 25 Vespoid. After that, the Queen Vespoid will spawn in Area 6. This quest also takes place at the jungle location. This is the first large insect monster, at least in the mainline games. There was a Vespoid Queen in Monster Hunter Freedom 2, but it was a DLC quest where an enlarged Vespoid would appear that would simply just do more damage. I am glad they took this concept and made an actual quest out of it, even though I despise the very existence of this pesky fly. If you wish to take on this menace, bring a fire weapon, but water and ice will be good as well. Also note that on most of these optional quests, there is usually another monster present, so watch your six. Now onto the urgent quest, secret request to Monoblos, where we must hunt a Monoblos and white Monoblos. The secret request comes from a pretty mantled lady saying, an ancient wall painting our country was researching was destroyed by a Monoblos, and as an art lover, I won't stand for it. My father can't spare any soldiers, so you're my only hope. This quest takes place in the old desert, and much like the other old maps, it's almost identical to the desert we have already visited. Two large open sandy areas that require cool drinks, some shaded areas monsters will travel to time to time, an underground cave that is cold where you can face Plesioff, and finally a few areas to gather. Gunners will be happy to hear that in area 10 there is a ledge perfect for cheesing the monoblos. Also, blade masters can use this ledge to get the monoblos' horn stuck for some free damage. Don't forget to gather dung in areas 8 and 9, and keep your power seed empire afloat. As I mentioned earlier in the video, white and normal monoblos are weakest to ice, but thunder is also a good option. Fire is a last resort, but will still be slightly effective. 
Beware of fighting these wyverns in large open areas, as their charge attacks are very powerful. Also, don't forget to utilize sonic bombs when they dig underground, except for when they're in rage mode. Dung bombs will also come in handy if both monsters end up in the same area. As this is a two monster quest, both monsters will have slightly reduced HP. I haven't really mentioned this yet, but I would bring a few max potions just in case the unfortunate event of a cart does occur. Better safe than sorry, because with only 100 HP, you will most likely be a one shot if your defense isn't high enough. Now onto the 8 star quests, and oh boy does it have some hard ones, but most of them are optional thankfully. Our first key quest will help you sleep at night, named the Sleepy Great Forest. On this quest, we are tasked with hunting not one, but two Hypnocatrice. Now if you slayed the single one to get into level 7, this quest will only be a little harder because both monsters will have reduced HP. Hopefully by this point you have made a basic high rank weapon which should help out a lot, especially if it has fire element. If not a fire weapon, ice will do just fine. Sadly, unlike Monster Hunter World, you cannot use an energy drink to wake you up, so do your best to avoid being put to sleep. One of the birds should spawn in area 4, but beware the second one will fly here in a matter of minutes. Bring dung bombs if you don't want to face both of these sleep inducing wyverns at the same time. Also, flash bombs will help stun the monsters to leave them open for attacks. This is another quest I would bring a lot of healing items as well as a couple max potions just to be on the safe side. If you thought you were done fighting bird wyverns in this rank, you were gravely mistaken. The next key quest is Elegy for a Lone Wolf, where we shall hunt none other than the Yangaruga. I spoke briefly of this beast earlier, but now there is no going around this quest if we wish to unlock our next urgent. Garuga's description states, A breed of Yankutku with a hard black shell and long mane. Known for its trap avoiding slyness and poison loaded tail, it is a practically evil wyvern, so beware. Wow, I am surprised to find out that this is actually a breed of Kutku. I guess it makes sense with the Yan prefix, but I thought it was more like a very distant relative. In layman's terms, Yangaruga is the Gigachad of bird wyverns. With a much harder shell than Yan Kutku, you better have your sharpest weapon to face this foe. Garuga also has a powerful howl it will use very often to stun its prey or any unfortunate hunters that wish to slay this beast. Forget using pitfall traps on this monster because Garuga is a lot more cunning than it may look. Sonic bombs are also useless against it unlike its close relative. Similar to the Rathian, Garuga is equipped with a poisonous spiked tail that even the slightest brush will leave you afflicted. Yangaruga can shoot fireballs as you might expect, but it will also try to crush anything with its razor sharp beak that gets too close to it. Garuga is also one of the most aggressive monsters in the game, so come prepared with a lot of healing, antidotes, and prayers when facing this evil chicken. This is also a one-eared Garuga that is basically a variant of the normal Garuga before variants were a thing. This means it has a ton of HP and will do massive amounts of damage, so upgrade your armor and weapons before embarking on this quest. All weapons should be aiming for the head to deal the most damage. Gunners can also aim for the stomach as it is just as weak as the head and the neck is a good third option. All melee users can go for the neck and cutting weapons can resort to hitting the tail if possible. Impact users should resort to the wings if the head or neck isn't an option. For elemental weaknesses, you should bring your best water weapon, but ice is also a good fit for this quest. Oddly enough, dragon isn't terrible, but both thunder and fire are only good if you're hitting the stomach. Be careful not to overcommit when attacking the Garuga because it has a more random attack pattern than most other monsters. I would suggest whittling the beast down slowly rather than going gung-ho on it. Moving along, we have a couple more multi-monster key quests. First up is A Shogun Tastes Like, where we must hunt a minimum of two Shogun Cianitars before the time limit expires. This quest takes place at the volcano during the daytime. Just like the level 7 quests, supply items and pop pass tickets will be delivered after two monsters have been killed or captured. A really good quest to farm shogun parts to make a killer blademaster set or a good pierce bow slash bowgun set. 
Don't forget to bring your best thunder or ice weapon on this quest for maximum damage. The second multi-monster quest we must face is two Blengangas on the key quest Bl Bl Blengangas. This quest takes place at the snowy mountains during the night time. For both these quests, the monsters will have a little bit less HP than they would normally, though there are no single monster quests of these monsters, so do your best to defeat the pairs. Also remember Blengangas weakest to fire damage. With quite a long list of optional quests in level 8, I will only brush on a few that I find interesting. For starters, there is a 2 green Plesioth quest in the old jungle. This is probably the worst quest ever created in my opinion. There are also 5 other quests that require you to hunt 2 monsters, 4 of them having different monsters, and the other one being a multi Basarios quest. Once you have completed all the key quests, your urgent will appear being Secret Request Nargakuga, where we travel back to the Great Forest in order to hunt our first Nargakuga. Nargakuga is the flagship monster for Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, meaning it is not to be taken lightly. Its description reads, A uniquely evolved wyvern that calls the forest its home. It hides itself in the shadows and slyly stalks its prey with terrifying speed and tenacity. Its unique tail can take down a medium-sized monster in a single swish. Being a mainly nocturnal predator, it primarily hunts at night, but it can be seen in the day as well. While having a similar body structure to the Tiger X, Nargakuga is even faster than its snowy mountain dwelling cousin. This final secret request comes from a brave mantled youth saying, I couldn't sit by while the Nargakuga hurt our people, so I snuck out to slay it and failed. I can't face my father like this, so please defeat it for me in secret. Nargakuga has black scales and fur, and its eyes will begin to glow red when it becomes enraged. It also has razor sharp wing blades that will slice you open at the slightest touch. Nargakuga's tail vertebrae are also super flexible and strong, allowing it to unleash devastating tail attacks. On top of that, its tail also possesses large spikes that can protrude from its tail while also being detachable to hurl at its enemies. The stamina of this monster is unrivaled and it will use this to its advantage by being able to flank its prey from any direction. Nargakuga does have a few weaknesses however, mainly being its acute sense of hearing that can be disrupted with a sonic slash barrel bomb. Flash bombs can also be used to blind the beast for a short period period of time. Nargakuga is a cautious monster, but it can blind itself while in rage mode, focusing more on defeating its foes than its surroundings. While not in rage mode, Nargakuga will see any pitfall traps and will jump out of them before it is ensnared, but will not be able to escape if it falls in the trap while in rage mode. Shock traps, however, will work regardless of its rage state. Nargakuga's weakest point is its head for all weapon types and will take even more damage once the Nargakuga is in rage mode. The neck and tail also take somewhat decent damage from all weapons. Gunners can also aim for the legs and stomach. For elemental weaknesses, fire is the best, thunder is the second, followed by dragon damage. Dragon does more than ice damage as well, but water should only be used on the head, neck, and back. So as long as you focus on hitting the head, this quest should not be super difficult, although I still would bring a lot of healing items and a few max potions. Also, if you haven't crafted your power and armor talons by now, what are you doing with your life? Once you have cleared this quest, you will be able to do 9 star quests, and a few level 8 star quests will be unlocked in the guild for Nargakuga. This is the only way to hunt Nargakuga through the guild in high rank. Also, Nargakuga's weapons have some of the highest sharpness at this level and a decent bit of affinity to them. Now we have reached the last level of the village quests, 9 star, where we can face some of the toughest monsters and quests the offline village can provide. That being said, only 6 out of the 24 quests are considered keys. The only caveat being 3 of the key quests must be unlocked before you can embark on them. Both 8 and 9 star have lock quests, but I will have a separate section dedicated to those quests after the high rank section. The first key quest on the list is Land of Tremors, no small task of facing off against 2 Tiger X in the snowy mountains. 
This is one quest where you really don't want to forget your flash and dung bombs. With the right equipment, it'll still be a difficult task, but not impossible. Sleep bombing or flash bombs are usually the routes I'd take when facing these beasts. Focus on hitting the head, and bring a decent thunder or dragon weapon if you have one. Other than that, use the terrain to your advantage to get Tiger X jaws stuck in the walls for some extra damage, and try not to get double tapped. Also, max potions are basically mandatory for this quest, so come prepared or suffer the consequences. Also, don't try to rush this quest and take it as slow as you need because you do have 50 minutes to complete it. Roll left if facing the monster to best avoid its charging attacks and stand back if Tigrex is about to roar. I believe one monster will eventually head to area 1 and the other may be in area 8, but don't quote me on that. Now forget about the Tiger X armor and its skills, they are trash compared to the gunner set I'm about to talk about. I only bring this up now because you will need high rank Tiger X parts in order to craft the Death Stench set. You will also need a decent amount of stripe skin found from the Ramabra, as well as some Sinister Cloth. To obtain Sinister Cloth, you will need to send Trinia out to the desert, swamp, forest and hills, volcano or great forest. Sinister Cloth can be obtained from these locations for sending Trini out between 3 and 1000 points. I seem to have the best luck at the desert for 500 points. However, you will also need a Master Skull that can be obtained with Trini as well by sending them out for 1000 points at the desert, forest and hills, or great forest. So you might as well kill two Kutkus with one stone and try those for 1000 points. Alternatively, the Master Skull can be gathered at the Forest and Hills in the high and G rank levels within areas 5 or 12. This Death Stench armor will also need high rank Blangonga materials and Elder Dragon Bones. The Blade Master set will get you the fencing skill, which is useful, but I'm highlighting this armor because of the gunner set that will give you the auto reload skill. Auto reload paired with the right heavy bow gun will make your DPS skyrocket, making this one of the best high rank gunner sets in the game, in my opinion. You will also have the special attack up skill, making it easier to poison, sleep, and paralyze monsters, but that won't really matter with the heavy bowgun that I'll be using. This armor set will help you finish high rank on as well as offline, and will also carry you through most of G rank. Our next two key quests have the same requirements to unlock them. I can only imagine those poor lost souls who didn't have access to the internet trying to unlock this next urgent, clearing all the optional quests only to be disappointed when the urgent never appeared, although they would be on the right track. You see, in order for the next two key quests to appear, you must slay a combined total of 100 bird, flying, or Poseidon wyverns. Excluding all small monsters, dromes, other than the cephedrome, to unlock them. Now if you didn't rush through the game like I usually do, you'd probably be pretty close to this goal. If not, the best way i found is to do training quests. Kutku and the Blue Kutku to be more precise. Blue Kutku is a group training mission, so it is great to do with your friends if they also need to unlock this quest. I probably hunted 30 or more Kutku to finally complete this goal. What are these quests you might wonder? Well, I'm glad you asked. They are the Silverathalos and Gold Rathian. You will also have to unlock these quests for the guild in high rank if you are wondering. Let's start with the Silverathalos as it is the first on the list for the quest Explore the Unexplored. Both of these quests will take place at the tower location. Silver Rathalos is considered a rare species of the Rathalos that features an almost luminescent silver carapace with black markings on its body and wings. When fighting Silver Rathalos, it is a rare sight to see its feet touch the ground, with it favoring aerial combat above all else. This is one monster above all others, you don't want to forget your flash bombs, as they will keep the monster stunned and most importantly on the ground. Just like any Rathalos, if it flies up high in the air, run underneath its shadow to avoid any fireballs or poisonous claw attacks. Silver Rathalos has much tougher scales than its blue and red counterparts, and this affects its hit zones as well. The weak points for melee users is oddly enough the wings. Impact users can still go for the head and also focus on the neck, stomach, and foot. 
cutting weapons should avoid hitting the head and instead aim for the neck, stomach, or foot if the wings are out of reach. Gunners on the other hand can aim for the foot first and foremost, then the tail or stomach for maximum damage. While the head doesn't take the best raw damage, it does have a great weakness to water and thunder element, with those elements having the same value so either is a good option. Another oddity is Silver Rathalos is not weak to dragon at all but is still slightly weak to ice. Also, fire element should be avoided when fighting this fire wyvern. Silver Rathalos has some decent armor and weapons if you choose to craft them. Just be ready to farm a lot of Rathalos as you need a ruby for each piece of armor. So unless you have insanely good luck, it may be a while until you complete that set. I also believe Silver Rathalos has the highest chance of dropping a Rathalos ruby, so keep that in mind if you want to farm for the gear. You can also increase your chances even further for the ruby if you capture this monster instead of killing it. Moving on to our next key quest, a single beam of moonlight, where we will face off against the gold Rathian. Another quest taking place at the tower location, or as Sunbreak fans know it as, the Forlorn Arena. Gold Rathian has an extremely hard shell, just like its silver mate, making this quest difficult for any blade masters. So be sure to come equipped with your sharpest weapon and bring it lots of whetstones. Gold Rathian is the most aggressive Rathian you will encounter in Monster during her freedom unite, and she isn't afraid to use her poisonous tail as much as possible. This makes antidotes or herbal medicine a must have for this quest. I also would bring a bunch of flash bombs to keep this queen confused. Also, a couple max potions couldn't hurt as well. Just like Silver Rathalos, the Gold Rathian has different weak points compared to its green and pink relatives. Impact users should primarily go for the wings or neck. Alternatively, they can focus on the stomach, head, and foot. Cutting weapons should mainly go for the wings, but the neck, stomach, and foot are also good options. Lastly, gunners should aim for the tail or foot, then the head. For elemental weaknesses, Gold Rathian also has no weakness to dragon. Thunder is the best element to use, with water being a second option. Ice will also be slightly effective, and fire is useless. Golden Rathian will have a bit more HP than the Silver Rathalos, but it'll probably take you less time to clear the quest with how often Rathalos likes to fly around and waste time. Just beware of the backflip move, and you should be in good shape. The next key quest will only be unlocked after you've cleared both the Silver Rathalos and Gold Rathian. This quest is called Firing Lunar Ring, where you must slay a Silver Rathalos and Gold Rathian located at the Old Swamp. With this quest having two monsters, each will have slightly less HP than their singular quests. As long as you don't forget to bring dung bombs, this quest isn't all that bad, even though it's at the old swamp. Bring a few Psycho Serum so you don't spend 10 minutes trying to locate the monsters, and definitely bring Max Potions and Herbal Medicines or Antidotes. If you want to farm for rubies, this is probably the best quest to do it offline. Also, I forgot to mention that the Gold Rathian Armor has the Luck Boost skill, so we'll have an even greater chance for increased rewards compared to the normal Good Luck skill. It is a bit ironic though that in order for you to craft this armor set with 15 plus fate, you will need a total of 5 Rathian rubies to craft it, so you will need good luck to make this luck set. You could also hire a few felines that have the mega lucky cat skill, eat the appropriate meal to activate this skill, but it will be random when the skill activates. The next quest down the line is Attack of the Rajang, where we must face, you guessed it, the Rajang. We will face this beast at night in the volcano location. Rajang's description reads, Ultra aggressive creature that is rarely sighted and seldom survived. Survivors report it exhibits a strange attack. The Rajang is said to be a loner, and this isolated life has made it difficult to pin down its territorial leanings. I would say Rajang is on par with Devil Joe from the newer games in terms of power, annoying moveset, as well as its aggressive temper. Rajang has a huge, powerful upper body, looking like it could easily bench press a Gravios. He will use his massive arms to slam them against the ground that will cause little earthquakes, making any hunter too close to lose their balance. 
Rajang can also shoot thunder beams as well as balls from its mouth. Most often though, Rajang will leap back and forth and attempts to flank its prey and deal a devastating blow. Don't be surprised when you get double tapped and cart from this massive beast. Rajang's huge horns protrude from its head, somewhat resembling that of a bull. These horns will take a long time to break, so if you don't mainly focus on hitting the head, you probably won't break both of them. This is also Rajang's weakest hit zone with all weapons, but that doesn't mean it'll be easy to hit the head. Its body will take decent damage for all weapon types, and cutting weapons can also go for the tail. Rajang has no real elemental weaknesses other than ice. If you are really desperate though, you can use water, but it won't be super effective. Rajang has a similar fight to Tiger Rex in the way that once it goes into rage mode, you can only get a hit or two off before you have to roll or reposition to dodge an incoming attack. This makes the fight go on for a lot longer than it should. Rajang can also jump out of a pitfall trap if it is not in rage mode, so wait until it is angry to place those. I feel like I'm beginning to repeat myself, but max potions are a good item to bring on this quest, especially if you don't have high rank gear, which you probably should by now. Last but not least, we come face to face with Shin Gaoran once again on the quest with the same name, the Approaching Gaoran. However, this time it is merely a key quest and not an urgent. Also, instead of fighting the crab at the town, this quest takes place at the fortress where we could face Lao Shen Lung in low rank to make our power slash armor talents. The biggest difference between this quest and the low rank Shingaran is you will be chasing the monster more often than you will actually be defending anything. Also, this one will have a lot more HP and attack power. Remember to bring your best dragon or fire weapon and try to slow it down as much as possible before it reaches the last area. You also don't have to kill the beast, only repel it in order to clear the quest, but do your best to slay it so you can get those juicy carves. When Shen crouches down in the three longer areas and the Lao's mouth opens, you can jump into the mouth to carve a few items from inside the Lao Shan's skull. You can also place the anti-dragon bombs in the mouth that were supplied in the item box. Although, you may die from the coming blast that emanates from inside the Lao's skull. Once you have cleared all the key quests, your final urgent will be unlocked. Once again, I will gloss over a few interesting quests besides the locked ones I will cover later in the video. First is a quest where you can face off against an Azur Rathalos and Pink Rathian. Next is a Diablos quest where you can fight the One Horned Diablos. Just like the One Ear Garuga, this Diablos is a Monster Hunter Freedom Unite exclusive and has a huge HP pool and more attack power. Other than that, there is just a few epic hunting quests as well as a Kirin quest. Finally, after all our spirit combos, cool drinks, and quest abandonments, we have finally reached the apex. We must rise to the summit and face our final challenge, Akantor. Not to be confused with Agnactor from Monster Hunter Tri. Honestly, the amount of times I switched these names, I felt like my grandma trying to remember what grandchild she was talking to. This final test of strength is requested from a popular mantled man saying, We finally have the mighty Akantor cornered in the volcano, but our forces are exhausted and there is mass confusion. Please, I humbly request that you slay the beast for us. A cantor's description states, A wyvern truly wrapped in mystery, known to some as the Black God and to others as the Tyrant of Fire. This large and brutal creature is known to the guild simply as a cantor. Even though it doesn't look the part, a cantor is technically classified as a flying wyvern. This quest takes place at the battleground, one location I never mentioned in the map section of this video. The battleground is technically just beyond the volcanic belt of the old volcano map. Only a handful of monsters are known to travel to this location, probably due to the fact that it is inhospitable to most species. Being so close to the volcanic eruptions, the battleground is always too hot for hunters, so don't forget your cool drinks or you will most likely have to abandon quest. 
You will also spawn in the same area as the monster, so the only way to go back to base camp is by carting or using a far caster. But there is no bed or base camp to speak of, so come prepared with all the items necessary to slay this beast. A cantor itself is a massive monster covered in blackish red spikes and very hard shells, also being equipped with massive claws on its arms as well as its tail. Two tusks protrude from its lower jaw that can cause deadly damage to any opponent that dares to cross the might of this tyrant. Along with its massive tusks, fluid inside its mouth causes any shell, scale, or armor plating to corrode with a single bite. With a cantor's massive size, strength, and surprising maneuverability, this monster usually has no competition for the spot of apex predator wherever it travels. A cantor's powerful lungs can produce an ear-shattering roar that will shake the earth, causing miniature eruptions of lava all around the beast. Not even distance can keep you safe from a cantor as it can create a sonic beam attack that is contaminated with dragon element that is even strong enough to bring down airships that wander too close to its dwelling. When a cantor enters rage mode, its body will turn red and its hit zones will change as well. Apparently, there is a glitch you can perform at the beginning of the fight where a cantor will knock you out of bounds, making it extremely easy for a gunner to clear this quest. I say apparently because I tried to recreate this glitch for myself for about 17 minutes and then I finally gave up. I guess if you are really desperate to clear this quest, this is one way to do it, but you will still need a decent gunner bow to clear the quest quickly. All weapons should go for the head, but impact weapons will be the most effective. Also, once in rage mode, the stomach will become a weak point for cutting weapons as well as gunners, while it is always a good spot for impact users to hit regardless of its rage state. Also in rage mode, the head will become stronger for gunners, so aim for the stomach when it turns orangish red. A Cantor has a decent health pool, one that even rivals the Elder Dragons, so prepare for a longer fight of attrition. Dragon Element is the most effective, with Thunder coming in second place. When in Rage Mode, water will come close to Thunder's effectiveness. A Cantor is only slightly weak to water not in Rage Mode, so save your water shots for when it is angry. Ice is useless, and it is only weak to fire on its stomach, so that element should also be avoided, or used as a worst case scenario. I find it is easiest to dodge its charging move when you are closer to the monster, so if you are far away, be sure to put away your weapon so you can perform the invincible dive. Once you have defeated a Cantor, you will receive the Blood Onyx Award on your guild card, and before returning to the village, the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite intro cutscene will play, followed by the credits of the game. This is where you can see all the amazing people that made this game possible. For some, this may be the end of their journey, saving Poke Village from countless threats and also protecting its neighboring regions far and wide. For others, this may just be another stepping stone to the true summit of what Monster Hunter Freedom Unite has to offer. This was the first time I played through the offline high rank without having G-rank gear, and it is definitely more rewarding to do so. Although I'm not ashamed of clearing these quests with G-rank gear on my samurai profile because they were still challenging, especially because I cleared all the quests, not just the keys. Nakot will congratulate us on our victory and reveals they have been on a secret mission themselves, a quest to identify some of the strongest hunters. Now that we have cleared our urgent, there is only a few more things we can do to challenge ourselves before I get into the guild section of this video. These challenges being the quests we can unlock in levels 8 and 9. Starting with the quests we can unlock in level 8, to unlock these quests we must first clear all single monster quests in level 7 and 8. That is 6 quests not including the key quests with a total of 9 quests you must clear. That is of course if the Vespoid Queen isn't considered a single monster quest, so let's just say 10 to be safe. 
Once all these quests have been cleared, you will unlock three more quests in level 8. The first quest is Attack of the Wind Dragon, where we must slay the rested Kushala Deora. The Kushala Deora goes through a molting process to shed its old skin. Rusted Kushala Deora is simply a variant that hasn't gone through this molting process yet, causing it to be more aggressive with more ground-based physical attacks rather than its wind attacks. This doesn't mean it won't fly around and still use its wind attacks though. Rusted Kushala was first introduced in Monster Hunter Dose, being the first variant monster to be from the same game where its normal version was first introduced. Both dragons share the same description, being a metal-plated dragon known as the Tempest of Wind. Eyewitnesses report violent storms alongside the dragon, and its wide range means towns may be attacked. Rusted Kush is weakest on the head for melee users and weakest on the tail for gunners. Blade Masters can also go for the tail or hind legs as an alternative option while gunners can aim for the head if needed. Kushala can create a powerful wind aura that will make any close by hunters lose their footing while also protecting it from some ranged attacks. This aura can be broken if the monster is inflicted with poison or if the horns are broken. Rusted Kush has a great weakness to water that is amplified when it is encased in its wind cocoon, second most being the dragon element with the same effect with its wind aura. The opposite can be said for its thunder weakness only being slightly weak to thunder when it does not have its wind aura. Being found in freezing climates, it is no wonder that it isn't affected by ice damage, but the rusted Kush is not weak to fire unlike its normal counterpart, with the only caveat being its head of course still taking a bit of fire damage, more so with its wind aura activated. This quest, however, is not in the snowy mountains, but the town, so you may use siege weapons to aid in your defense. Kush will often charge at hunters or use long-range wind blasts to harm any faraway attackers. If a hunter gets too close, Kush will swipe at it with its powerful claws. One thing to note is most Elder Dragons will fall over for a short period of time after enough damage has been dealt to the head. With this being a slaying quest, you're not required to kill the beast, so do your best and hopefully you will succeed. Otherwise, you can just repel and still clear the quest. The next two quests, Indigo Meteor and the Empress's Blazing Throne, are both for the Elder Dragon Lunastra. The former being at the desert at night, and the latter taking place at the volcano during the daytime. Another Elder Dragon first introduced in Monster Hunter Dose, and her description states, a brutal female elder dragon with breath of flame and expert control over fire. It is said that this control comes from the crown-like horns on its head, but this has not been confirmed. Lunastra is the female counterpart to Teostra, another flaming elder dragon we will cover in a moment. Lunastra has the physique of a lion adorned with a blue mane. Also having powerful wings and legs, Lunastra can easily advance towards its prey. Unlike most wyverns, the Lunastra uses its flame sack to produce a fiery breath rather than a ball or beam attack. Also having the ability to create an explosive powder it can spread around its body using its massive wings, then sparking the whole area up with a snap of her massive jaws, causing her surroundings to explode. Lunastra's fire breath attack will have a greatly extended range once she enters rage mode. Similar to Kushala's wind aura, Lunastra can produce a fire aura. Her fire aura will slowly drain your health bar, as if you were standing too close to the lava at the volcano. In order to get rid of the fire aura for good, you must break her crown slash horns. To break her horns, you will have to use a weapon with Dragon Element. I would have loved to see this concept in future Monster Hunter titles, but the best we got was Elder Seal and World. Luckily, Lunastra is weakest to Dragon Element, so if you want to do the most damage possible, you might as well use a Dragon Element weapon. More good news, at least for Blade Masters, is the head is her weakest point. The next best element is ice, followed closely by water. Lunastra is only slightly weak to thunder, so use this as a worst case scenario. Impact users can also aim for the stomach and hind legs, while cutting weapons can go for the stomach, tail, or forefoot if the head is out of reach. As for my gunner friends, your best spot to aim is the tail, 
but seeing how the tail is usually out of reach, the head is a good second option. Now to unlock the final quest in 8 star, you must clear all epic hunting quests in 7 and 8 star. After that, you will be faced with the quest Lao Shan Lung draws near. The Ash Lao Shan Lung can only be fought at the fortress. This is the same location we fought the high rank Shen Georin. Ash Lao is simply a normal Lao that has been exposed to years of volcanic dust and debris, resulting in its discolored shells. Lao's description reads, A giant dragon few have seen and lived to tell the tale. When on the rampage, it wreaks havoc on all in its path. The guild has built a fortress to repel the beast, but will it hold? This massive elder dragon can easily bring a kingdom to its knees if not stopped or repelled. One quick note, while I was doing research on this mountainous beast, the wiki has Zora Magdaros listed as a related monster. With both monsters being the size of mountains, it wouldn't be hard to believe that they are somehow related, and I find it interesting I haven't heard anyone mention this before. There is not much to be said about this quest because it plays out just as slowly as the Shengeoran quest, except Lao is obviously much longer in length. Lao also has a lot more breakable parts that will result in greater rewards when completing the quest. You can break Lao's head, back, and both shoulders. The head is easily broken by any weapon, but gunners will be best suited for breaking its back and shoulders because both are much too high for blade masters to hit. That is, unless they use the provided ballista and break them in the last area. For gunners, the soft spot is on its back. This is where you can climb atop the monster to carve and place the anti-dragon bombs. And this is also its weakest hit zone. Next is the stomach, then head, but try to focus all your shots on the back for maximum damage, unless you're trying to break the shoulders or the head. As for blade masters, the only good spot for you to hit is the stomach. Only go for the head to break its horn, then move on to its stomach. Lao Shen Lung is weakest to dragon element, especially on its back, but fire is a hot second pick. Thunder comes in third place, while Lao is weak to water and ice, it is better to have the previously mentioned elements for optimal damage. While fighting at the fortress, you may notice giant boulders falling from the sky. I would presume the fort guards would be dropping these boulders, but the better question is why am I the only one down on the ground fighting this beast when I don't even live at the fortress? These boulders do actually cause damage, but it's not a lot compared to Lao's massive health pool. Its health being the equivalent to fighting 55 low rank Gyadromes, about 28 low rank Kutku, 5.5 low rank Tigerex, or 3 Akantor. Lao also doesn't put up much of a fight, so you are most likely only going to take damage from it accidentally stepping on you as it lumbers towards the fortress wall, or getting smacked in the face by its massive tail. This quest can be completed by repelling Lao Shan Lung, but if you do manage to slay this goliath dragon, remember to carve a thrice from its stomach, chest, as well as its head that likes to disappear from certain camera angles. Also, try not to kill it too close to the wall or its head carves will be lost out of bounds. I will bring this up again, but the Emperor Lao Shan Cannon, a heavy bowgun that when fully upgraded will have 444 attack and plus 15 defense, is one of the best high rank guns you can craft. The real attraction is the elemental ammo, with it shooting fire, water, and thunder. Pair this gun with the Death Stench Gunner set, and you will almost be unstoppable. Now let's move on to the lock quests in 9 star. To unlock these four quests, you must clear all single monster quests in 7, 8, and 9 star. This won't be too hard if you have already unlocked the Elder Dragons in level 8. The first two quests being Evaporate into the Night and the Elder Dragon of Mist. The first being located at the jungle during the nighttime, and the second taking place at the forest and hills during the day. Each of these quests will have you looking for <clears throat> I mean, hunting down the Camellios, Phantom of the Deep. Its description states, Eyewitness sightings of this elder dragon are extremely rare due to its ability to literally vanish. However, details of this are unclear. It is thought that shocking it may make it reappear, but this is unproven. 
You see, Camellios has the ability to become invisible, making this monster very hard to track, even if you know where to look. This is definitely the coolest thing this monster can do. I remember I was hunting this purple elder dragon, having a good old time, doing a decent bit of damage. I had the HP cheat active, so I knew I was on track to kill the monster before the monster would be repelled. Then all of a sudden, poof, Camellios was gone, just like that. In my infinite wisdom, I somehow forgot to toss an old trusty paintball at the monster. No matter, I knew what areas it traveled to, and this was at the forest and hills for reference. So I set out to look for signs of the misty fool, although I was the fool. I searched far and wide without seeing a single trace of the beast. Then finally out of the corner of my eye a cloud of dust was kicked up. Only this was a cloud of dust being kicked up from the monster fleeing the very area I had just entered. I felt like I had searched for Camellios for hours, but in reality it was probably like 20 minutes. Now, I'm not trying to make you think that hunting down the monster is fun, or paintball should be brought back in Monster Hunter 6 because we can't even hunt for the monster anymore. No. This is about the fact that in Rise, we are literally shown where Camellios is located on the map totally disregarding that this monster is supposed to be mysterious and elusive. The only other thing Camellios has going for him is his long tongue that can steal items off your hunter's body. That's about it. Alright, I'm done ranting. Using currents of electricity that run through its hide, light is refracted in the mist making the monster invisible. You can eliminate this ability by simply breaking its horn, but this is easier said than done as Camellios is a proud monster keeping its chin up most of the time. You can also temporarily disable its invisibility if you throw a sonic bomb while the monster is performing an attack. One of these attacks being acid balls that can be spat out onto unsuspecting hunters, causing a defense down buff. This can be offset by eating an item that will increase your defense, such as an armor seed. You can also shoot acid spray that will give you the fatigue effect. You will be unable to eat stamina restoring items until the effect wears off. You can get rid of this effect by drinking energy drinks. Camellios can produce a poisonous fog that can be spread with its large wings as it jumps into the air. To disrupt any nearby attackers, Camellios has a massive leaf-shaped tail it will slam against the ground, causing wind pressure that will make anything too close fly away from it. One final note before we get into its weaknesses, Camellios will take slightly less damage in certain areas when invisible, so break its horn as quickly as possible for optimal damage. Also, all weapon types should mainly focus on its head because it is the weakest point anyways. Gunners can aim for the legs as well and blade masters can go for the chest if the head is out of reach. For elemental weaknesses, it's a toss up between fire and dragon, while thunder can also work but won't be as effective. Both water and ice elements should be avoided though. One more time for good measure, do not forget to paintball this sneaky dragon, or you may be wandering around for quite a while. The last two quests that can be unlocked are a midnight audience and fight for your life. Both these quests will have you slaying the Teostra the Emperor of Flame. This is the male counterpart to Lunastra. Its description states, a brutal male elder dragon with breath of flame and expert control over fire. Its vile temperament means anyone who approaches is subject to fire and brimstone. Known to attack towns, the guild keeps tabs on its movements. Teostra is almost identical to Lunastra in every way except for its red mane and scales compared to Lunastra's blue. Teostra also has two large horns instead of a crown atop its head. Typically found in the volcano, although some sightings report Teostra in the desert, swamp, and even at the town. The swamp and town are where these two quests take place. Teostra also has similar if not the same abilities as Lunastra. That includes the fire breath, explosive powder, fire aura, and its charging attack. Just like Lunastra, you will need to break the horns with Dragon Element to disable the Fire Aura ability. Teostra also has the same hit zones as his female friend, with Blade Masters having the head and stomach as weak points, where impact weapons can also go for the hind legs. 
Dragon is the best element to use, but water is also a great option, more so than against Lunastra. Ice is a good third option, and Thunder is the worst case scenario element. Just remember, all these Elder Dragons besides Lao will flee if you don't kill them in time, and will return with a set amount of health, usually around 4000 HP or so. If you make Lao flee, he will return with his full strength. If you thought these were the last lock quests, you are gravely mistaken, as there is one final test. One last quest to prove ourselves as a monster hunter, with that literally being the name of the quest. To unlock this quest, you must clear every single village elder and feline elder quest. What untold horrors await us on this quest you might wonder? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the great arena, you must hunt a Rathalos, Tigerex, Nargakuga, and Rajang, all of which are G-ranked monsters. Now this is no easy quest, even with G-rank gear, but if you really want to test your strength, you can try it with high rank gear, but I don't recommend you do so. As a gunner with fully upgraded G-rank armor and weapon, my biggest fear was running out of bullets. This is considered an epic hunting quest, so you will receive mega potions from the monsters when or if you carve from them. Also, yes, you will actually be rewarded with G-rank materials upon completing this quest. So if you are really desperate not to play through the guild, this is the only way to get G-rank items. But like I said, this would be a tremendous task to do with only high rank gear, but I'm sure it's not impossible. At least, not with a Blade Master set, light or heavy bowgun users may run out of bullets. Even though I had G-rank gear, I did die to Nargakuga, but only once, so I still consider it a win. This was my first time unlocking this quest as well, so I was eager to see how difficult of a task it would be, and oh boy did it deliver. I used the G-rank Ash Lao gun that has fire, water, and thunder element shots. I was also using my auto reload evade plus 2 elemental attack upset, using my water shots for Rathalos, thunder for Tiger Rex, and fire for Nargakuga, saving most of my normal level 2 shots for Rasheng as he is mainly weak to ice which my gun cannot shoot. Overall this was a fun quest and now I feel like I can call myself a true monster hunter. But this video isn't over yet, we still have much to discuss regarding the training school as well as the guild quests and online play. So get ready to test your strength, because we are now headed to the arena. The training arena has a few different sections to it. The beginner training, which I already covered earlier in the video. Next is the solo training, which includes battle training, special training, and G level training. I will talk about G training after the G rank section of this video, so I don't jump the gun. There is also group training where you can take on a few quests with your friends, if you have any that still play this old relic of a game. For now, let's focus on the solo training. Battle training quests take place at the Great Arena and there is a total of 10 monsters to slay. In the Great Arena, there are 4 gathering spots to my knowledge. There is a plant you can gather mega potions from that is near some boulders at the southern part of the map. At the southeast corner you will see some barrels by these wooden spikes. This is where you can gather a supply large barrel bomb from. The northeast corner will have a similar structure where you can gather three small barrel bombs. Lastly, towards the northwestern corner is an almost identical structure where a portable shock trap can be gathered, especially with some of the more difficult quests. The special training is a little more interesting. There are five quests in total, but each quest takes place at a different map location. On these special training quests, you can gather items and slay monsters, but the items won't be the same as they normally would. You can gather items that will help you on your quest, such as supply max potions, large barrel bombs, and even demon drug, just to name a few. There is a super useful guide on the training quests that can be found on the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite game FAQ page made by Guts and Rose that has all the gathering locations as well as what items you will carve off of small monsters. As for unlocking each training quest, you will need to only encounter the monsters in question. 
each training quest will provide you with five different sets of armor, weapons, and items to go along with them. Every quest will also have a star level assigned to it, one being the easiest and five the hardest. Each set will also have a multiplier assigned to it, with 90 being the lowest and 120 being the highest. I like to use these multiplier values as an indicator of how hard the quest will be with that particular weapon slash set with the lower values being easier and the higher ones usually being more difficult. The difficulty usually boils down to how good the weapon and armor is, what skills the armor set provides, as well as what items you are given. This multiplier will factor into your overall score at the end of the quest. The other factors include clear time, quest clear, monsters slain, time attack bonus, and lastly, the item sale amount. All these variables are added together and the sum is then multiplied by the point multiplier to calculate your total points earned. Let's say everything equated to 4000 points, this would then be divided by 10 and you would receive 400 poke points. The quest clear as well as the monsters slain points are simply given upon completing the training mission. Note that slaying small monsters will factor into the overall monsters slain points on the special NG training quests. Also your fastest clear time and highest score will be added to your guild card. This is a great way to flex on your buddies. Note that your highest score and fastest time can be with different weapons due to all the variables. Going over every weapon on every single quest would probably take me a few hours to read and write, so I will spare you and I will only cover each quest talking about my personal favorite or fastest weapons. Starting off with the battle training, the first quest will pit you against the Yang Kutku, where you can choose between the sword and shield, great sword, hammer, lance, or light bow gun. My the fastest time completing this quest was with the Sandfall Light Bowgun at a clear time of 34 seconds. I was able to clear this quest so quickly because this light bowgun can rapid fire normal level 2, which you have in your inventory. All you need to do is aim for the head and the monster should die after 7 to 8 shots, depending if all of them landed on the head. Although my fastest time was with the light bowgun, my highest score was actually with the spike spear lance, coming in at 4,209 points, probably due to the fact that it had a higher multiplier at 105, unlike the light bowgun's 90. This would mean I would receive 420 poke points from the lance quest. Most of these easier quests won't give you too many points, but later on it is definitely worth farming them for poke points if you are in need of them. Next up is the Kangala Law. On this quest, our weapon options are dual blades, longsword, hunting horn, gun lance, or bow. I cleared this quest the quickest using the Velociprey Claw dual blades at a clear time of 1 minute and 49 seconds, while my highest score was 5,742 points with the Black Katana Mark I longsword. After Pink Monkey is Slimy Blind Kezu, and on this quest your options for weapons are Sword and Shield, Great Sword, Hunting Horn, Gun Lance, or Heavy Bowgun. My personal best clear time was 3 minutes and 6 seconds with the heavy bowgun, my main weapon on this account. Although my highest score was 8718 with the greatsword. Moving on to the next monster, Daimyo Hermitar, with the weapon selection being dual blades, longsword, hunting horn, lance, and bow. I slayed this crab the fastest with the dual blades at 1 minute and 32 seconds. My highest score being 8,649 points with the Lance. On to some more monkey business, we find ourselves face to face with the Blinganga. The weapon selection being Sword and Shield, Long Sword, Hammer, Lance, or Light Bowgun. 3 minutes and 16 seconds was my fastest clear time using the Light Bowgun, and my highest score was 9,813 points while using the Sword and Shield. Now, these next five quests will actually reward you with a decent bit of poke points upon completion. The evil purple chicken Yangaruga is up next, with our offensive options being dual blades, greatsword, hammer, lance, or heavy bowgun. I like how for one of the fastest and most aggressive monsters in the game, they gave us a 4 out of 5 slower moving weapons. Surprisingly, my fastest clear time was 4 minutes and 10 seconds, as well as my highest score being 12,317 points with the lance, a weapon I probably have only used in the training school. Next up is the Monster Hunter Freedom 2 flagship Tiger Rex. 
Your options being Sword and Shield, Greatsword, Hunting Horn, Lance, or Bow. For this quest, my best weapon for speed and points was the Hunting Horn. I cleared the quest in 2 minutes and 23 seconds, while I got a high score of 15,292 points. That's 1,500 poke points in under 3 minutes. The training quests don't get any easier after this, with the next monster being the Diablos. Your weapon options are Dual Blades, Great Sword Hammer, Gun Lance, or Light Bow Gun. Diablos took me a lot longer than the Tiger Rex, with my fastest time coming in at a steady 6 minutes and 34 seconds with the Light Bow Gun. As for my highest score, I got it with the Hammer at 17,215 points. Next is one of the hardest monsters, Gravios. Hard as in you will probably bounce unless you have the ESP skill. For this thick old boy, you may use the sword and shield, long sword, hammer, gun lance, or heavy bow gun. The ESP skill does come on the long sword set with the sword saint piercing, an armor piece I will talk about shortly. I also got my highest score with the longsword at 18,391 points, but my fastest time was with the sword and shield, coming in at 2 minutes and 58 seconds. To slay my little pony, you will have the options of sword and shield, longsword, hammer, gun lance, or heavy bowgun. I did farm this quest in order to get all the expanded pickaxes I needed, so I'm proud to say that I cleared this quest in 2 minutes and 28 seconds with the longsword. My highest score was with the Lance at 21,254 points. I have completed all battle training quests with every single weapon, that being a total of 50 quests, not including all the failed attempts. I also did this on both of my profiles for some reason. Don't ask me why, these are very painful memories. As well as all the quests I farmed, such as Kirin, to get the expanded pickaxes I needed. If you do clear all these quests, you will receive the Barrage Piercing. You actually get to use this helmet on the Tiger X quest using the bow. What this helmet does is it gives you 10 points and capacity, giving you the skill Capacity Up. Capacity Up gives you plus 1 to all available ammo shots for your equipped light or heavy bow guns. This means if your gun shot 4 fire shots, it can now shoot 5. This may not seem like a big difference, but for a light bow gun that can rapid fire a certain ammo type, it will bring your DPS up quite a bit, cutting out some reload times. Even better in my opinion is how it affects bows. You see, very few bows come equipped by default with a charge level of 4, most of them capping out at a level 3 charge. With capacity up, it will unlock the next charge level for bows that only have 2-3 to three charge levels. With each charge level, your damage will increase, so this skill basically makes most bows in the game more effective. My personal favorite is the Dragon Bow Chaos, arguably one of the highest DPS bows in the game. Coming in with an attack of 360 and Dragon Element of 220, while also having the ability to shoot all the coatings. By default, the charge levels of this bow are level 1 shooting pierce 2, level 2 shooting pierce 3, and level 3 shooting scatter 5. Scatter 5 is decent, especially for applying status coatings, but where this bow really shines is once you unlock the bow's level 4 charge that shoots rapid 4 arrows with the capacity up skill. Rapid arrows travel vertically and have a much farther critical damage range, making them much more practical than scatter arrows. Using this helmet you can make some pretty interesting mix sets regardless of what range weapon you are using. The biggest downside of this armor piece is obviously that it can only be utilized by range weapons and its initial defense is only 10 with its max capping out at 34. Time to talk special training. For the special training, I have not cleared every quest with all the weapons, but I have at least killed each monster once. Therefore, I cannot provide my best times and highest scores, so I will resort to just listing each quest while providing a few tips and tricks. The first quest takes place at the desert during the day, where you will hunt down the Cephedrome. Not all the weapons will come with cool drinks, so it'll be your job to gather them yourself, or possibly faint from heat exhaustion. Again, as I said earlier, the training gathering guide is almost essential for clearing these quests at a reasonable rate. Cool drinks can be gathered in areas 1 and 7. Sonic bombs, another useful item for this monster in particular, can be found in areas 7 and 10. Quest number 2 is located at the jungle during the night, where you will face the hip checking king, Plesioth. Another monster Sonic bombs are almost essential for can be found in area 9. 
Now, I'm not going to name off every useful item, mainly because many of them must be mined with a pickaxe or gathered with a bug net, so you will have to do a bit of back and forth, but it is usually worth it. Such as the supply max potion you can gather with a bug net located in area 3, or the portable shock trap that can be mined in area 7. Next on the list is Shogun Cyanitar, located at the swamp during the daytime. It looks as if all the weapons come with hot drinks, but more can be found in area 2 and 9. Also, if you're in need of more healing items, mega potions can be found in area 7. Quest 4 has us facing none other than the poster boy of Monster Hunter, King of the Skies, the Fire Wyvern, Rathalus. Other than the traps, the most useful item you can gather on this quest is probably the supply flash bombs found in area 5 and 7. Mega potions can also be gathered in area 5. Last but not least is the beast Rajang, fought in the snowy mountains. On this quest, a supply max potion can be found in area 2, and mega potions can be found in areas 4 and 6. Now, clearing all these quests with every single weapon is much more beneficial for Blade Master users. This is because after clearing the 25 quests necessary, you will unlock the Sword Saint Piercing, that helmet I mentioned earlier that gives you plus 10 points into fencing. This will activate the ESP skill that will prevent attacks from deflecting off of monsters and boulders. As many of you know, this skill is extremely useful, especially for monsters such as Gravios, where most of their body requires high sharpness levels in order not to bounce off of. Not only does bouncing do minimal damage, it also takes a few seconds to recover from, and in that time, you could be on your way back to base, laid out on a cart. If you main any Blade Master weapon, I wouldn't bother with doing all the battle training quests. Instead, focus your time on clearing all these special training quests with every single weapon. As you might have guessed by now, I rarely use any Blade Master weapons, so unlocking this armor piece wasn't too high up on my priority list. But I would like to eventually unlock it, just for bragging rights, and the occasional quest or two. This is another special armor piece with low defense, only having 20 to begin with, and ending with a max of 52. Two. Not super ideal, especially for Blade Masters who would like as much defense as possible in most cases. Now, before I even begin to talk about the treasure quests, I must first cover some useful skills and armor sets. These will make your life a whole lot easier if you're interested in embarking on these gathering focus quests. Also, I used Ronomar's Monster Hunter Freedom Unite Treasure Hunting Guide FAQ for this section of the video. This guide is basically mandatory if you wish to have the knowledge necessary to get the highest scores possible on these treasure quests. It is also worth mentioning that I already had completed G rank by the time I went about taking on these quests, so I had access to the majority of the weapons, armors, and decorations you can craft. The gathering set I use consists of the Chain Yu Helm, Mail and Van Braces while using the Maloha Skirt Yu, and the Coffee Pants for both my Blade Master and Gunner sets. You will also need a weapon with two open slots for decorations. Then you can craft six Gathering Jewels, two Blessing Jewels, four Grab and Dash Jewels, and finally one Backpacking Jewel. With all these decorations attached, your skills should look something like this. Divine Whim, making bug nets and pickaxes last longer. Gathering plus two, giving you a large chance of gathering extra items from any gathering spot. High speed gathering. Self-explanatory, you will simply gather faster than normal. And lastly, backpacking expert. This last skill will allow you to move quicker when carrying eggs, rocks, etc. This might not seem like a super useful skill, but don't worry, it is. As for my Blade Master set, my weapon of choice is the Nargakuga Longsword, Shadow of the Moon, while my bow set is equipped with the Black Bow G, with both of these weapons having two open slots, as the guide mentioned. Now you don't need these sets by any means to go out on a treasure quest, they will only lessen your pain if you want to get a high score. Also, they are just basically really good gathering sets, so if you need to go mine or gather dung, these sets will come in handy. Now you're ready to go out on a treasure quest. You must enter the guild hall and speak to the minor dude Treshi located on the far right side of the room. In the beginning of the game, only the snowy mountains will be unlocked, but I believe the other maps will become available after you visit them at least once. 
These treasure quests including the snowy mountains, jungle, desert, swamp, forest and hills, volcano, and lastly the great forest in that order. Each of these maps will have one or more large monsters present as well. I also believe all of these monsters are low rank difficulty. The objective of these quests being to obtain as many points possible before the 20 minute timer runs out. Also, similar to the special training quests, each gathering spot will not have its normal assortment of items. Instead, you will be able to find some normal items such as picks, bug nets, and bombs, while the other items will be labeled as treasure items. These can be turned into treasury for points, who is located at the base camp of each map. These treasure items are exclusive to each quest, and some can even be combined with another to create even more valuable items. Also, each location has 5 rare treasures that once obtained for the first time will appear on your guild card. That is a total of 35 rare treasures to find throughout all these quests. As of me writing this section of the video, I currently have 28 out of the 35 rare treasures. Typically, each quest has 2 rare treasures that can be gathered outright or by using a bug net, pickaxe, or fishing rod. One treasure item that must be combined with 2 other treasure items to create. One egg, bone, or rock that must be transported back to Treshi to deliver. Lastly, one rare monster carve that will also need to be transported back to base like an egg. You will basically need to gather all of these rare items in the same quest in order to get a silver or gold crown rating. The Snowy Mountains has a guide drum as the large monster with 20 points required for a silver crown and 30,000 for a gold. The jungle will have you facing a cut coup while 30,000 points will get you a silver crown and 40,000 points will get you a gold crown. Next up is Daimyo Hermitar at the desert where you will need 30,000 points for silver and 40,000 points for gold. At the swamp, the Kangalala is the main monster of the quest but there is also a Bulgrim present. With the silver crown being 30,000 points and the gold crown you will need 40,000 points. Next up is the Forest and Hills, where both Rathalos and Rathian will have rare treasure items and you will need to obtain 30,000 points for silver and 40,000 points for the gold crown. At the volcano, Gravios will be the main large monster, but an Iodrome is also present. Here you will need 40,000 points for silver and 50,000 points to obtain the gold crown. Lastly, the Great Forest has the Yangruga as its large monster, with it also requiring 40,000 points for silver and 50,000 points for the gold crown. As I said earlier, you will need to gather most of the rare treasures in a single quest for gold. For example, the Yangaruga Jewel is worth 20,000 points alone, with most basic treasure items ranging from 500 to 1,000 points. These treasure quests are a nice change from the monotony of regular hunting. This is because if you don't plan out your hunt and go in without a game plan, you most likely won't even get a gold crown reward or most of the rare treasure items. This is also one of the only competitive game modes you can play outside of Monster Hunter Dose in the entirety of the Monster Hunter franchise that I'm aware of. You could argue you could make any quest competitive, especially if you're using a weapon to annoy other hunters. But if you fail the quest, it still fails for everyone, unless that was your goal of course. I'm looking at you, Monster Hunter Tri Trolls. You can also play these treasure quests cooperatively, but you and your partner's points will not be added together. Rather, your sums will be separate from one another, but both will be shown at the end of the quest. It is also worth mentioning that a few gathering spots may be hidden behind boulders. To destroy these, you can either hit them over and over again, or use any bombs you find out while gathering. As I said earlier, I would definitely use the gathering guide for these treasure quests as it has every map location with each gathering point listed with the items that can be gathered there. At the end of each quest, your total points will be divided by 10, just like in the training school, and that total is the amount of poke points you will receive. So if you completed a quest with 30,000 points, this would equal 3,000 poke points. Probably not the fastest way to earn poke points, but if you're doing these treasure quests over and over, trying to get all the rare items as well as gold crowns, it will add up over time. Now, the guild hall quests were designed with multiplayer in mind. This means the large monsters will have quite a bit more HP than their village counterparts. The monsters fought through the guild quests often have more than double the health than they would through the village. 
This makes sense because you can have up to four players on a single quest. This of course isn't ideal for someone who wants to solo the game or doesn't have access to the internet. The guild quests are also structured similarly to the village ones, with the caveat being that the 1 and 2 star quests are useless for advancing to the next rank. By that I mean you won't further your progress by completing them other than the awards on your guild card after completing every single quest. The system was also present in Monster Hunter 1 where the 1 and 2 star quests act more like practice missions. Therefore, I will not be talking about 1 and 2 star quests, as there are no key quests to complete. For the 3 star quests and the guild, it's like a combination of the village 1 and 2 star quests. The guild also has hunter ranks assigned to each level. As you progress through the game, quests will have hunter rank limits, such as for high rank, you must be HR4 or higher to embark on most of the quests. 1, 2, and 3 star quests are all HR1 quests, while the next level will take us to HR2. I will not be going into great detail on many of these quests because I covered the majority of these monsters in the village section of the video, so refer to that or the game FAQ page if you have any questions. I will, however, go into depth on any quest I think is important enough to do so, or if I have not covered the monster in question in the village section of the video. Also, one quick note, the guild by default in level 3 has the snowy mountains, jungle, and desert pop house quests available. So if you are just starting the game, you can go to these locations and gather without needing to clear any of the quests through the village. Although there are no pop house quests for the swamp, there are two quests in level 3 that take place at the swamp. These hunting quests are the Bouldrum and Kangalala. The swamp has light crystals in area 3 and 9 that can be used to craft powerful weapons early on in the game such as the Crystal Hammer. The first key quest is Gyadrome Assault where we must face the Gyadrome in the Snowy Mountains. Next on the list is the Land Shark. Located at the desert at night, this is our first key quest where we will encounter the Cephadrome. Its description states, the alpha monster form of the Cephalos. Large and armored with black scales, they fit the appearance of a leader perfectly. Their fins hold a paralyzing toxin. I don't know if I'm colorblind, but the Cephadrome looks green to me, not black. Just like the smaller Cephalos, the Cephadrome will swim through the sand, hunting for its prey. This Poseidon Wyvern will use many moves its larger cousin the Plesioth can do, including the tailspin and hip check attacks. Resembling a hammerhead shark with legs, the Cephadrome can also shoot a powerful sandblast from its mouth. Don't let this shark fly above you, because its dorsal fin can cause paralyzation even though the dorsal fin is located at the top of the body. Don't think about it too much, you will only be as confused as I am writing this. With highly sensitive hearing, the Cephadrome can be brought to the surface with a nearby explosion or sonic bomb. Cephadrome has an extremely weak neck, back, and stomach, so go for these hit zones with all weapon types. As for elemental weakness, ice will work best, with thunder and water being good backup options. Cephadrome can typically be found in area 2 as well as 5, and will limp away to area 7 to rest and recover. Moving along, we will travel back to the desert during the day for our next key quest, the Lurking Desert Giant. On this quest, we must face the Daimyo Hermitar. Last up is the Mischief Maker key quest, located at the swamp where we must hunt the Stinky Kangalala. As I previously mentioned, this quest is a great opportunity to mine for ore. There are a few more large monster optional quests in this level, as well as a decent bit of gathering and slaying quests. The key difference between these slaying and gathering quests, and the ones found in the village, is the amount of items we must gather, or monsters we are required to slay. Quests such as Deliver 20 Special Mushroom or Slay 20 Gaia Prey. These quests may be difficult alone, although with a hunting party of 4, these quests won't take long at all. After these 4 key quests have been cleared, you will unlock your Urgent, the Ruler of the Snow. On this quest, we must hunt the Blinganga. Not an easy quest by any means, especially because this one will have more than double the HP than that of the one found in the Village Urgent. Luckily, as I mentioned previously, the low rank guild quests will provide supplies for the equivalent of 4 hunters. Therefore, if you do solo these quests, you will have an abundance of healing, rations, and hot or cool drinks to help you with these longer quests. 4 star quests in the guild seem to be a combination of the 3 and 4 star quests given by the village elder. 
Entering this level, you are now considered to be HR2. Sadly, the first key quest is a monster no hunter should ever have to face, the Plesioth. I have mentioned this forsaken Poseidon Wyvern, but now I must go into detail on how to defeat this unholy creature Capcom has cursed us with on the key quest, Master of the Giant Lake. A more appropriate name for this quest would be Master of the Hip Check or Master of Crushing Your Hopes and Dreams. If it seems like I have something against this monster, I do. Anyone who has fought this foul beast knows of its power to annoy the sh** out of you. Mainly because it will constantly jump in and out of the water as well as use its ungodly hitbox to defy all concepts of physics and hit you through quantum space and time. If I haven't mentioned hitboxes yet, they are the invisible shapes bounding all or part of a model used in a collision detection to determine whether another object collides with a model. Most of the first gen monsters don't have terrible hitboxes, and the monsters added in Unite, such as Nargakuga, actually have decent ones, but oh boy, don't get me started on the Plesioth. I can infer that due to Plesioth's enormous size and girth, it has an equally large hitbox. Although it seems like the developers never even playtested this monster, because you will constantly be hit out of nowhere when the monster seems to do just about anything. Most notably, you could be a few yards away from a hip check and you would still get hit. Or underneath the beast when it spins, nothing will even be close to touching you and you will still go flying. Alright, enough ranting, the monster's description states, an enormous, flightless, aquatic wyvern with wings that evolved into fins for swimming. Although superficially fish-like, they can move on land as well. They love frogs. Just like Gobel, you can fish the Plesioth out of water with a frog. The more practical way is just to bring a bunch of sonic bombs and throw them over the Plesioth when it is swimming in the water. While in the water, the Plesioth will use its water jet attacks and attempts to cut you in two. Once out of the water, it will primarily use the spin move or hip check attacks. Bring your best fire or thunder weapon on this quest, as these are the two strongest elements to use against this fish. Plesioth is also slightly weak to dragon and ice, but only use these if you have no other choice. For hit zone weaknesses, all weapons will want to aim for the neck or stomach, and cutting weapons can also go for the foot or tail. At the jungle, Plesioth can only go to the areas 3 and 4, so you shouldn't have much trouble finding it. This is one of the only wyverns, not including the big baddies, that has 4 body carves. The next key quest is Evening Hermitar Sonata, located at the desert during the night. Our goal of this quest being a slay 20 hermitars. This quest was easy enough to solo, but it will go much quicker with one or more hunters. After that, our next key quest is the Pincer Through the Sky. Located at the swamp during the day, we must face against the Shogun Sienatar. Luckily, the supply box will provide hot drinks because the Shogun can often be found within the cave system. Moving on, we have another slaying quest against 20 Blafangos on the key quest, Trouble in the Forest. A cut coup will also be present on this quest as well. Last up is the key quest, the Eye of Prey Leader. This quest takes place at the volcano during the night, where we must hunt down the Iodrome. The reference notes state, the alpha monster that leads an Eye of Prey pack. They are large and have a more prominent crest. Found in subtropical zones, they spit a poison that can sap the life force of Prey. Iodrome is the strongest of all the smaller bird wyverns in the game. Unlike the others though, the Eye of Prey and Iodrome look more like an amphibian having smoother skin versus the more scaly look of its cousins. Be sure to bring a few extra antidotes or herbal medicines because this drome will constantly be spitting poison globs out from its mouth. The Iodrome and Prey can also be found in the swap location. As for elemental weaknesses, the Iodrome is weak to everything, but water or thunder will do the most damage with fire oddly enough being a good second option. Strange for a monster that inhabits the volcano to be weak to fire, but whatever. There is one lock quest in this level, needing you to clear all 3 and 4 star hunting quests except meeting the Diamo to unlock. This quest is a giant dragon invades where you must defend the fortress from Lashan Lung. This is a great way to obtain the Laoshan Lung Claws you will need in order to craft your power and armor talons, if you have a few friends that is. Otherwise, if you're doing it solo, you might as well just hunt the Laoshan through the village. 
Finally, we come to the urgent quest, Absolute Power, where you must face a Tiger Rex. This quest was one of the hardest I had ever completed back on Monster Hunter Freedom 2. Being a multiplayer quest, this Tiger Rex has a lot more HP than its village equivalent. That being said, when I first did this quest all those years ago, I still sucked at Monster Hunter, and I was using the Iron Gospel Longsword, I believe. I remember I had just fainted twice and the 5 minute warning had just popped up. Luckily the Tiger X was sleeping, so I knew it must be close to death. I finally completed the quest with less than 1 minute remaining and my heart was pounding so hard I thought it was going to pop out of my chest. This was before my brother and his friend had PSPs, so I had no other option than to face him alone. Playing through a second and third time more recently, I know to bring a lot of flash bombs and traps, especially if you're doing this quest solo. Completing this quest will make your hunter rank rise to 3. The hunter rank 3 slash level 5 star quests in the guild are the equivalent of the 5 and 6 star quests for the village elder. There are only 4 key quests in this level, and all of them are hunting quests. I have already talked about all these monsters, you will need to hunt for these key quests, so this section should be fairly short. The first key quest being the Runaway Diablos where we must hunt a Diablos in the desert during the day. The next is Valor in the Swamp Zone, a key quest you guessed in the swamp. This quest target is the Gravios. After that is the King's Domain, and this is a key quest located in the forest and hills where we must hunt the Rathalos. Last but not least is the Queen's Descent, where we must hunt the Rathian at the jungle location. While this key quest list is short, each monster will have a fair bit of health, so come prepared if you're doing these quests solo. As for doing these in a hunting party, use traps to create openings for you and your teammates to deal big chunks of damage. If you really want to coordinate, have one hunter bring a sleep, light, or heavy bowgun, and have everyone bring a couple large barrel bomb plus to do some sleep bombing. As for the wraths, have everyone bring a stack of flash bombs, and these quests shouldn't give you too much trouble. One last note, clearing a giant dragon invades in 4 star will unlock the following monsters. Kushala Deora, Teostra, and Camellios. After all four key quests have been cleared, you will unlock the next urgent quest, the approaching Georin. The goal being to slay or repel the Shen Georin at the fortress location. This is a simple quest if you have two or more hunters, but solo you will probably want to bring your best gear and prepare for a long haul. If you really wanted to, you could do a heroics run on this quest if you're having trouble doing enough damage before the quest timer is up. Other than that, the rest of the quests are mostly subspecies monsters, and one quest where there are two miniature Kran Kezu located at the swamp. After passing the Shen Georin, your hunter will rank up to HR4, and you can now participate in high rank quests through the guild. Entering into high rank through the guild is much more rewarding than it is offline. I say this because you can actually go out on paw pass quests and gather all the precious high rank materials, versus trying to gather them on the hunting quests like you would through the offline village. In 6 star, you can embark on paw pass quests in the snowy mountains, jungle, and desert locations. 6 star also has a bunch of monsters to face, so you will have a lot more options for armor and weapons to craft. The biggest downside to these guild quests is the monsters will have a thousand or more HP than they would offline. The first key quest is a little misleading named the Poison Fang Duo and our goal is to hunt to Gendrum. I guess the Paralyzed Fang Duo doesn't roll off the tongue quite right. Contrary to the quest name, the Gendrum cannot actually poison you. This quest takes place at the desert during the daytime. As this is a high rank quest, you will need to bring your own supplies. For this quest, I would bring potions, steaks, and cool drinks, as well as any other items you think you might need. Gendrum's description states, The alpha monster that leads the Genprey pack. They are large and have a more prominent crest. Found in the desert, they can paralyze prey using their fangs and claws. Being such a quick monster, be ready to dodge at any moment, especially if there are Genprey in the same area. Just like the other Dromes, Gendrum only has one hit zone and it is weakest to ice then thunder element. It is weak to all of the elements, but fire would be your best third option. Both monsters will be present at the same time, so you can either split your forces or attack one monster at a time. 
If you're worried about fighting both monsters in the same area, be sure to bring a dung bomb as well. Our next key quest is Ultimate Crab Dinner, taking place in the desert during the daytime, where we must hunt two Diama Hermitar. Be sure to remember cool drinks so you aren't bumming off your friends, waiting for supplies to deliver, or needing to abandon quest. After that, the next key quest is Trapped by Yan Kutku, and this quest takes place at the swamp during the nighttime. The targets of this quest being the Yan Kutku and Blue Yan Kutku. The last key quest in 6 star is Kanga Counterattack, where we must hunt the Kangalala at the swamp during the night. There is also a Bouldrum on this quest, so bring Dung Bombs or be ready to fight two monsters at once. There are a few more monsters being optional quests, and one is a monster in our Freedom Unite edition, being the Vespoid Queen. Finally, we should unlock the next urgent quest, Lao Shan Lung Draws Near, where we must defend the fortress from the Ash and Lao Shan Lung. If you are going for the Death Stench Gunner Armor for auto reload, farming Ash and Lao is a must. You will want to craft the Emperor Lao Shan Cannon, a heavy bowgun that when fully upgraded will have 444 attack and plus 14 defense. The real attraction is the elemental ammo, with it shooting fire, water, and thunder shots. Combine this gun with an auto reload set and it should be able to take you all the way through high rank and a few levels into G rank before it is necessary to upgrade to a new gun. It is also worth mentioning that if you're more into light bow guns, the Sandfall Plus, starting at 228 and upgrading to 288 attack, can also shoot fire, water, and thunder shot with also having the ability to rapid fire normal level 2. This light bow gun should be able to get you through high rank and take you into G rank. Back to the Emperor Lao Shan cannon, I used this gun to farm the G rank Ash and Loud to make the G rank version of the gun. Also, on top of the elemental shots, it can shoot normal level 2 and all level 3 shots. Although the recoil will be high with anything other than normal or elemental shots due to how auto reload works. This is the most powerful high rank heavy bowgun as well, so it doesn't get any better than this. The hardest part about crafting this heavy bowgun is the fact that you will need 1 Lao Shan ruby and 4 wyvern stones, but the grind will be worth the effort. As for actually fighting the Lao, I would highly recommend finding one or more hunters to help you with this chonky fella. Completing this quest will bring you to Hunter Rank 5 and you will unlock 7 star quests. 7 star has a lot more quests compared to the previous high rank level with many of the quests being subspecies monsters. Although out of all the quests, only 5 of them are keys. This is a great opportunity for you and your friends to grind for some level appropriate weapons and armor to complete high rank and hopefully carry you into G rank. Along with all the high rank monsters is pop pass quests in the swamp, forests and hills as well as the volcano. Definitely take some time to mine in the swamp and volcano to obtain some of the high rank ores such as nova crystal, carbolite ore and fire cell stone. The first key quest on the list is two roars in the snow, the goal being to hunt two blingongas in the snowy mountains. The next key quest is red shadow in the swampland. This will be our first key quest where we must hunt a red kezu. While the red kezu is very similar to its normal cousin, it does have a few differences. Red kezu can be found in all the same locations as the normal kezu, but it does have a unique move. Kezus primarily live within the caves, so bring lots of hot drinks if you wish to keep your stamina. Its unique ability is to stretch its neck out and do a thrust attack at any unsuspecting hunter. Red Kezu also has all the same hit zones as the normal Kezu, but it does not have a great weakness to fire, but instead water. So don't bring any fire weapons on this quest, but instead bring your best water weapon if you have one. This is a prime example why the Emperor Lao Shan Cannon is so good. Almost every monster in the game is weak to one of the three elements it can shoot, being fire, water, and thunder, so you should always have an effective element to use. Other than that, the Red Kezu plays out about the same as any other Kezu fight, so be ready to dodge some electrical attacks or cart trying. Also, if you're looking for a good high rank support armor set, the Red Kezu armor comes with wide area plus two and recovery. Wide area will heal other hunters when you drink a potion that are in the same area as you. Recovery will increase the effectiveness of your healing items. After the Red Kezu, we face off against another subspecies, Green Plesioth, on the key quest, the Underwater Terror. This quest takes place in the desert during the daytime, while a Gindrum will also be roaming the area. 
I believe, from what I have researched, that the green and normal Plesioth are almost identical in every single way, except of course the fact that the subspecies is green. In the desert, the green Plesioth will travel between areas 6 and 7, so bring hot drinks if you're in the cave system. Also, don't forget to bring a lot of sonic bombs if the green Plesioth refuses to face you on the surface. Oddly enough, one monster I thought for sure would be in the next rank is the Rathalos. I know, I'm survived. trying to kill him right now. No! No, Carson! I rolled right into that. The name of this key quest is simply Eliminate the Rathalos that takes place at the forests and hills. The last key quest will take us to the volcano. So if you haven't mined here yet in high rank, be sure to bring a few mega pickaxes along with you for the quest Bassarios Unseen Peril. Bassarios is by no means one of the hardest monsters, but at the same time it is quite literally one of the hardest monsters sharpness wise. So bring your sharpest weapon or a lot of bombs. Finally onto the urgent quest, Land of Tremors, taking us to the snowy mountains to face not one, but two Tiger Rex. Just like the 4 star guild urgent, this quest is treacherous, especially if you are attempting to solo it. I would highly recommend you convince a friend or someone to help you with this quest to make it much easier. Flash bombs are a must have item for gunners on this quest to keep Tiger X confused as you unload all your thunder or water shots onto its head. Just be careful of its ice projectile attack because it can still use this move even when it's confused. Completing this quest will take you to 8 star and you will rank up to HR6, the last level before G rank. As you would expect, the last level of high rank contains some of the hardest high rank quests the guild has to offer. If you haven't watched the 9 star section for the offline part of the video, some of the information is relevant for this level as well. I also have a section after G rank discussing the lock quest for high rank and G rank rather than having two separate sections. Starting off strong, our first key task is the Fierce Black Horn, a quest in the desert involving hunting down a Black Diablos. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this is one quest where you don't want to forget your cool drinks. Next up is the Black Gravios on the key quest Black Rock in the Swamp. This will be our first key quest that contains a Black Gravios, so naturally I will cover it in more detail. As I have said before, Black Gravios is simply a normal Gravios that has gone through a chemical change due to very high temperatures that has caused its white gray shell to turn a smoldering black. Black Gravios are also a bit heftier than their normal counterparts, as well as being more aggressive. Black Gravios is also much more adept with its fire beam attacks and it will oftentimes sweep it across the area in order to incinerate anything that stands in front of it. While having similar hit zones to Gravios, the Black Gravios' belly is a bit tougher so it will be harder to break. On top of that, the Black Gravios only has one very effective elemental weakness, that being water. Dragon is only good to use on the stomach after it has been broken and Thunder is barely effective at all. This monster is a Blade Master's worst nightmare so I highly recommend investing in a decent light or heavy bowgun if you haven't already. If not, skills like Sharpness plus one and ESP will make your life a whole lot easier when fighting this Black Giant. After Gravios, the following key quest will have you hunting in Azur Rathalos and Pink Rathian, with the quest being appropriately named Blue Sky Pink Earth. This quest will take place at the Forest and Hills, and I would suggest you bring Dung and Flash Bombs for this crusade. Now onto a topic that will sound familiar if you have been paying attention. You will need to hunt 100 wyverns to unlock the next two key quests. If you have already done this for the two offline quests, they should already be unlocked. The first quest being Deny the Silver Rathalos, where you will slay the Silver Rathalos at the tower. The second key quest is named Finding the Gold Phantom, also at the tower where you will face the Gold Rathian. If you have cleared the Village Urgent quest for Nargakuga, two quests will be unlocked in this level to hunt the high rank Nargakuga. On top of that, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite added four epic hunting quests, as well as a Kirin and a One Horned Diablos quest to level 8. There are 9 unlockable quests, but I will save those for later. Once these 5 key quests have been completed, you should unlock your first urgent quest. The approaching Gaoran will have you defending the town against the Shen Gaoran. I believe this is one of the first key quests that takes you to the town within the guild. With the appropriate gear and an extra hunter or two, this quest shouldn't be too difficult. 
After that, the next urgent is Rise to the Summit against the Akantor. Another mission taking place at the battleground against the Akantor, but this time hopefully you have some friends to help you slay this beast. Last on the list of urgents is the one that will take you into G rank, Hypno Hypno. On this quest, we will venture to the Great Forest to face two Hypnocatrice, with each of them being G leveled monsters. If you haven't played through the offline quests, this will be your first look at the frontier map, the Great Forest. Completing this task will unlock the G one star quests, and you will become Hunter rank 7. G rank was added into Unite as the next difficulty level of quest past high rank. All the monsters in the next few levels will have even more attack power and HP scaled to a 4 person hunt. This means soloing G rank is a great accomplishment, but not one I would like to endure. I probably could have soloed most of these quests, but some of the monsters you have to face have ridiculous amounts of HP for one person to clear. Luckily, for most of these quests, I had one or more hunters helping me along the way. Right off the bat, you'll have Paw Pass quests for the Great Forest, Old Jungle, Old Desert, Old Swamp, and lastly, the Snowy Mountains. Ah yes, the old maps. If you haven't played the older games, or through the offline village quests, this is probably your first experience with the old maps. Luckily, the Paw Pass quests will provide you with a map so you can familiarize yourself with the new maps, or should I say old maps. Nonetheless, these maps will be confusing if you have never been to them. I myself have done plenty of quests on these maps and I still get confused sometimes. Along with all the new locations to explore, you will also have access to G-Rank materials such as the Emperor Cricket and Pure Crystal just to name a few. More items and areas will be available once you reach G2. There are no trash monsters such as Gyadrum or Velocidrum to face in G1. The easiest monster quest is probably the Vespoid Queen or a singular Hypnocatrice. Even the Paw Pass quests will all have harder monsters on them, or at least two medium difficulty monsters. Entering G1 will allow you to purchase the final mining point, as well as the last insect thicket. Both of these will contain G rank materials. G1 will also introduce us to two new monster subspecies, both of which are key quests. Our first key quest will take place at the old desert by the name Daimyo of Sengoku fame. All I could find on the word Sengoku is that it was a period in Japanese history where civil wars took place in the 15th and 16th centuries. How this relates to the target monster Plum Daimyo Hermitar, I do not know. Although I didn't do this for the other subspecies monsters, I would like to include the Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate descriptions for these G-Rank monsters because I believe they deserve it. Its description states, a large carapacion characterized by its distinct coloring and the massive monster skull it carries on its back. Unlike more common variants, it leaps high into the air onto its foes, making it especially deadly. Instead of the normal daimyo's monoblo skull shell, the plum daimyo possesses a diablo skull shell and will even use it offensively. While having all the same moves as its red counterpart, the plum daimyo will have a few surprises in store for the new G-rank hunters. For starters, the plum daimyo can jump high into the air and aim its body to land down on any unsuspecting hunters below. Also, when guarding, the plum daimyo will often scoop backwards, using its skull shell as a weapon to trample anything behind the monster. As for the weak points, the Plum Daimyo has the same hit zones as the normal Daimyo, so aim for the head with all the weapons if possible. Also, the same applies to the claws when broken, they will take more damage in its guarding state. Thunder, however, is no longer the most effective element to use, but it is still a good option. Instead, use an ice weapon if you have one, and fire will still do decent damage as well. If you are looking for a decent defensive G rank armor set, the Plum Daimyo has you covered. Both Blade Master and Gunner armors come with the skill Guts. The Guts skill will save your hunter from getting one-shotted if your health is above 65 points. G rank monsters have a tendency to one-shot you, especially if you are a gunner because you will have a lot less defense. If this skill works, you will be left with 1 HP, so be sure to heal back above 65 HP as quickly as possible. It is also a really good idea to start bringing life powders if you are in a hunting group so you can heal your teammates when they take a big hit. A life powder could possibly save them from carding, 
or save you from losing the quest. As for tracking the monster in the old desert, the Plum Daimyo can often be found in areas 2, 3, and 7. But don't also forget your opportunity to gather dung in areas 8 and 9 if you're in need of some fertilizer. Also, the old desert is always in the daytime, so bring a lot of cool drinks so you don't burn up before you even find the monster. The next key quest is with a familiar face that has no eyes, being the G-level Kezu. The key quest is named Old Jungle Lightning, obviously taking place at the old jungle. Now, I'm not 100% certain on the areas it can travel to, but I believe they are area 4, 7, and 10. Most of these areas are within chilly cave systems, so be sure to bring a lot of hot drinks. After that, we are headed back to the old desert for the key quest Eyes in the Underground Lake, where we must hunt a Plesioth. This quest is actually really easy for gunners to ledge cheese because the Plesioth can only be found in area 5. If you have multiple hunters, have most of them wait on the ledge and send one hunter down to Sonic bomb the fish out of the water. Then run back to the ledge and climb up once the Plesioth has made its way over to the ledge. Then you will hopefully have a minute or two of blasting Plesioth with all your ammo. This will make short work of the G-rank Plesioth, especially if you have an auto reload set. Also, don't forget to bring hot drinks as this cave is very chilly. Next up is a foul smelling subspecies, the Emerald Kangalala. The key quest is named Plagueis Pride and it is located at the old jungle. Again, I will be using the Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate description that says, a Kangalala variant with green fur and a more prominent crest. Even more ravenous than the ordinary Kangalalas, they can store a greater amount of gas in their body, which means they can produce a wider reaching flatulence when threatened or provoked. This is one monkey you don't want to mess with. The Emerald Kangala will use its fart and dung attacks as much as possible, so be sure to bring extra deodorant so you're able to heal after the inevitable happens. The Emerald Kangala can also eat a wide variety of mushrooms that allows it to have many different effects with its breath attack such as poison, paralysis, and even sleep to name a few. I'm curious if all Kangalalas eventually turn into an Emerald Kangala with age because the Emerald one just looks like an old wise but stinkier Kangalala. The Emerald Kangalala will also sometimes fart after it does a sweeping arm attack where it falls to the ground afterwards. It can also perform a massive fart attack that has a much greater range than its normal farts. When flinging its dung, three massive turds will be thrown by its tail, so get ready to dodge your Superman dive out of the way because it is terrifyingly accurate. The Emerald Kangalala will take a bit less damage compared to the normal version from all weapons on its arms and legs, so you should primarily aim for its head. Its tail does take a bit more damage than its pink relative, but I would avoid its backside unless you want to end up with soiled armor. The best advice I can give you for this monster is stay in front of it at all costs. Also, one more tip, if you bring spiked meat, the Emerald Kangala will most likely go for it, so it's a good way to poison, sleep, or paralyze the stinky beast. You will also want to avoid using a pitfall trap when the monster is in rage mode as it will fall in face first, buttocks up, and its deadly gases may be released. The Emerald Kangala is no longer weakest to fire damage. Instead, you will want to use an ice weapon, but water and thunder are still somewhat effective. The Emerald Kangala will mainly travel between areas 1, 2, and 3, with area 6 being its resting spot for when it needs a nap. Last key quest on the list is Old Swamp Shrouded in Mist, with our targets being two purple Gypsaros. Now, I am uncertain to what areas Gypsaros travels to, but I do know some of the areas are, as the quest title says, shrouded in a purple foggy mist. This makes it very hard to see in these areas, so turn up your volume and listen to audio clues for the monster's whereabouts. Or you could bring a Psycho Serum if you don't feel like searching the whole map. This quest is also a great opportunity to mine in the cave areas 7, 8, and 11 for some pure crystal. Finally, we can now face off against the G-rank flagship monster Nargakuga on the quest Ever Present Shadow. This quest will of course take place at the Great Forest. If you are looking for a decent evade armor set, look no further than the Nargakuga X armor. Both Blade Masters and Gunners will get this skill, Evade Plus 2, allowing you to roll, dive, back hop, or sidestep through attacks with more iframes. 
If I haven't talked about iframes, they stand for invulnerability frames, meaning you won't take damage in these few milliseconds. The evade skill simply extends the period that you are invulnerable. The next useful skill this armor set has is evade distance, allowing you to evade even farther than normal. Evade Distance is a great skill to pair with these slower moving weapons to allow for greater mobility. The only downside to this set is you will have attack down small, but this can be easily remedied with a few decorations. Even if you don't craft the whole armor set, if you are crafting a mixed set with either Evade or Evade Distance, the odds are you will craft one or more of these armor pieces. Clearing this quest will unlock G2 quests and will bring you to HR8. G2 will finally allow us to go on quests in both the volcano maps as well as the forest and hills. Paw Pass quests will be available for the old volcano and forest and hills. The old and normal volcano will both have new ores such as Eltalite and Melange ore. Also, these ores should start appearing in your bomb mining rewards, so stock up on all the items needed to craft more bombs. G2 also has quite the rosters of monsters to hunt, so if you haven't already, farm up a G-rank armor set and craft a few G-leveled weapons to help you clear G2 and carry you through G3. One monster me and my hunting group grinded for back in the good old days was our first key monster on the list, Lava Sleoth. Lava Sleoth Siding is the name of the quest, and the monster's description states, A Poseidon Wyvern that resides in magma. Its scales are covered by layers of cooled magma, which makes it one hard nut to crack. It swims around in the lava, spewing the molten rock it takes in as its prey. Researchers love to study its particular way of life. A monster originally from Frontier, it made its first appearance in the West within Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. The areas 9 and 10 were both added just to house this monster within their lava lakes. I do think this was a little unnecessary because many of the areas already had big pools of lava, but both area 9 and 10 have mining nodes, so I guess it isn't all that bad. The Lava Sleoth is related to the Plesioth, as its name suggests, and it has some of the same moves. Instead of water attacks, of course, the Lava Sleoth will shoot massive fireballs at its prey that will explode into smaller chunks when they impact the ground. Lava Sleoth will wriggle its body on the ground to slide towards hunters and can even change directions while doing so. Instead of jumping out of the lava to go onto the land, Lava Sleoth will swim under the ground and it will melt away and then it will explode to the surface. There is a legend Area 9 gunners can shoot the Lava Sleoth from, but they will still be in danger of its attacks. A better method for gunners that is definitely a bug is the entrance to Area 10 from Area 2. If you stand right on the border where you will enter Area 2, the Lava Sleoth cannot reach you with its body. However, if it shoots a magma ball, you will need to be ready to roll out of the way. So if you are looking for an easy way to farm this monster, this is probably the best way to do it with a ranged weapon. Luckily, this Gen 2 Lava Sleoth doesn't have an armored state like its Monster Hunter World Brethren. Impact weapons will do the most damage on its back, then wing or foot, while cutting weapons should go for the stomach or tail. The most effective element to use is water, while ice and thunder will still do somewhat decent damage. Dragon will do some damage, but fire is the worst elemental choice considering this monster literally lives in it. Now for why the Lava Sleoth has such good armor for blade masters and gunners. For one, the armor comes with the skill Terrain Damage Negated. This means stepping on the edge of lava will no longer hurt you. Next is the focus skill or short charge. This will decrease the charge times for greatsword, longsword, hammer, and bow users. With longswords, your spirit gauge will fill faster. Last but not least is the gut skill, again allowing you to survive being a one-shot. Guts and focus together is a nice balance of offensive and defensive skills to help you clear many of the G rank quests to come. After that, our next key quest is Under the Gaze of Heaven, with our cores being the Shogun Sienitar and the Terra Shogun Sienitar. Now, if you had troubles with the normal Shogun, the Terra Shogun isn't any easier. While having all the same attacks as its blue cousin, the Terra Shogun has a few more tricks up its sleeve. First up, this subspecies can only have one shell versus the normal Shogun's three different shell variants. 
Terra Shogun possesses a black Gravio skull shell, and you may receive one in the rewards if it is broken during the quest. Terra Shogun's body is an orange color, similar to clay, and it has a lot of black markings that complement its shell nicely. Using Terra's shell, it can also shoot water or piss beams from it, even when on the ground. While this quest does take place at the swamp, the Terra Shogun can also be found in the volcano. Just like the normal Shogun, Terra Shogun's claws will extend when it is enraged, but the Terra has slightly longer claws than its blue brother. Another difference is its hit zones. Terra Shogun has a harder shell, while its claws are a bit softer than its blue counterpart. The best place to aim for all weapons is still the head, but the claws will take more damage than the normal Shogun, meaning they will be easier to break. Terra Shogun is weaker to thunder than it is to ice, the opposite being so for the normal Shogun. It is also less weak to fire and has a great weakness to water, but only on its shell. With the Terra Shogun having razor sharp claws, it is only fitting that the armor does the same to your blade. The Blade Master armor comes with the sharp sword skill. This will decrease your sharpness loss by half, effectively giving you double your weapon's sharpness. To add on top of that, the armor also comes with sharpness plus one, granting most weapons the next level of sharpness. This is especially good for weapons that only have white sharpness, and with this skill active, they will become purple sharpness weapons. The biggest downside to this full set of armor is you will have at minus 40 to your base defense, but this can be brought back up with some defense decorations. However, pairing the Sienatar Z waist and legs with the chest and arms of the Sienatar U high rank pieces will give you one of the best Blade Master sets in the game. Next, pair that armor with the Skull Face Helmet, another high rank armor piece, and a weapon with at least one open slot. Then with the help of a lot of expert decorations and one artisan decoration, you will have the skills Reckless Abandon 3, giving you 30% more affinity, Sharpness plus 1, and Sharp Sword. All of these skills combined will make for an amazing G-Rank Blademaster armor set. As for Gunners, the Terra Shogun set will grant you Reload Speed plus 2, great for light and heavy bowgun users alike, as well as Pierce Shot slash Pierce Bow Up. This skill will give your pierce shots and arrows a 10% damage buff. Next key quest up is your run of the mill Rathalos, except this time the quest takes place at the old volcano. The quest name is A King Robed in Smoke. This will be our first key quest through the guild that takes place at the old volcano, so bring some mega pickaxes to mine some of those sweet, sweet G rank ores. Also, don't forget your cool drinks, or you may have to abandon quest or you'll have to beg your friends to share, assuming that you're in a hunting party. Both Blade Master and Gunner armors for Rathalos come with Attack Up Large, so odds are you will need these materials if crafting an Attack Up mix set. Also, Rathalos has some really good fire weapons, so get your hands on these for any monsters that are super weak to fire. Next is just an ordinary Rathian located at the Old Swamp. The name of this key quest is Her Eternal Majesty. Rathian's armor is great for anyone looking for more HP, as it comes with plus 50 points to your base health, and it also comes with the recovery skill. Rathian weapons will also come equipped with poison damage, great for faster hitting weapons. The last key quest is Wild Monk of the Dunes, located at the desert during the day, so stock up on cool drinks before departing. On this voyage, we must hunt the Copper Blanganga, the last new subspecies added in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Copper Blanganga is a solitary creature who roams the desert sands without a gang of Blango to escort him. Its fur has become a dark brown to better help it blend in with its surrounding environment. The Copper Blanganga has adapted very well to its new environment. This includes the attacks it will use to defend itself if ever threatened. These new attacks consist of throwing massive boulders that can bounce around, crushing anything in their path, as well as a sandy breath it can spray at will. This sandy breath will confuse anyone caught in its stench. The Copper Blanganga can also jump high in the air with a rock and throw it down on any unsuspecting hunters. Copper Blanganga really likes rocks, so many of its attacks will involve a boulder one way or another, so be on the lookout for projectiles at all times. 
The wiki states you will need an ice weapon in order to break its fangs, similar to how you need a dragon element weapon to break Tio or Luna's horns. Also, compared to the normal Blanganga, Copper Blanganga has much thicker fur that will cause many weapons to bounce off of it. You will need at least a white sharpness weapon to cut through most of its body and a purple sharpness weapon to cut through its back legs. Blade Masters should focus their attacks on the head if possible and resort to hitting the tail or arms if the head is out of reach. Gunners should only aim for the head, but if you have to, the front arms will also take some damage. Ice is the best element to bring on this hunt, while water is a good second option if you don't have any ice weapons. Thunder is the weakest element that will still do damage, while fire and dragon are useless. Just like the regular Blanganga, Copper Blanganga is a very fast paced monster, so be prepared to dodge or block a lot facing this monster, especially if you're using a slower weapon. If you're looking for some high attack weapons, Copper Blanganga has you covered. The C Blango Destructor Longsword is one of the highest DPS longswords in the game. Also, the Desert Tail Light Bowgun is the only gun that can rapid fire normal level 3 shots. Its gunner armor is also amazing because it comes with the highly sought after auto reload skill and an added bonus of having normal slash rapid bow up. This makes all normal shots or rapid arrows do 10% more damage, a great skill to pair with its light bow gun. Now I will talk about one of the lock quests in this level, even though I said I would wait until after G rank. I would like to discuss this quest because this monster has one of the most powerful heavy bow guns in the game. This quest is of course Lao Shan Lung Draws Near, where we must slay or repel the G rank Ash and Lao Shan Lung. Now the quest itself is more tedious than difficult, but if you want any of its G rank weapons, you are in for a treat. If that treat was the equivalent of chewing on rusty nails for 5 hours. Each weapon, the ultimate Lao Shan cannon included, require a Lao Shan Heavenly Scale. Heavenly Scales are basically the G rank equivalent of a plate or ruby, meaning you usually only have a 1-2% to chance of receiving the item. So theoretically, you could fight Lao 99 times and never even get one. Unlike most G rank monsters that with the right gear you can clear in about 5-6 to six minutes, maybe 10 if you're having a hard time or running it solo, while also having the ability to capture the monster to increase your chances of higher quality rewards, the Lao Shan Lung will take you a minimal of 20 to 25 minutes. In that time, you could have killed slash captured 3 to 4 Rathalos. The only way to increase your chances of heavenly skills is to break parts on Lao's body. Now, my brother's friend having extremely good luck received the heavenly scale on our first to third run. I got the heavenly scale on the third to fourth run, but my brother, who is notorious for having some of the worst luck, probably got it on the tenth quest. Okay, here's a little edit. I was just watching the footage back. I actually got my heavenly scale on the second quest, and funnily enough, I watched all the footage back of us fighting Ash and Lao Shan Lung, and my brother did get it on his 10th try of fighting the G rank Ash and Lao Shan Lung. So we basically spent about five or more hours of our lives just trying to get one singular item in this game. So that's just how crazy your luck can be sometimes. Oh god, I can't see. I know, I love how his face disappears right when you get up to it. I think I got it. Hey. I think you got it. No fucking way. Now, I will have to go watch the footage back, but I swear all we did was the same quest over and over for days where we would play for 3-4 to four hours each day just to craft this heavy bowgun. Luckily, we had a solid group and the HP cheat activated so we knew when to stop wasting our time, and we could go wait in the last area to deal the remaining 1000 HP. As I stated before, you cannot deal any damage past 1000 HP until the Lao reaches the final area. Now that I think about it, this quest would be much faster if it took place at the town instead of the fortress. The ultimate Lao Shan cannon is good for the same reason as a high rank counterpart. Super high attack of 540 before adding a power barrel, and it can shoot fire, water, and thunder shots. 
Pair this gun with the skills Auto Reload, Evade Plus 2, and Elemental Attack up, and you have yourself what I consider to be one of the best heavy bowgut sets in the game. You can almost clear just about any quest in the game using this very set and weapon. I say almost because this next monster is only weak to Ice and Dragon, making the Lao Cannon not the best option. Our urgent to get into G3 is the Floating Dragon, where we journey to the tower in order to slay the Yamasukami. Me. Yama isn't your typical elder dragon, and its description states, An elder dragon that floats through the sky. A bite of earth, a drink of forest, it's a veritable god of the sky, made of the richest soil. Ancient trees grow thick on its back, like a mountain. It's rumored to live near a forlorn, remote tower. The Elder Dragon Yama has been classified as such because it doesn't fit into any other monster category, much like the Kirin. Yama resembles a Cthulhu-like Lovecraftian horror. Yama is covered in moss as well as many other plants that grow over its massive body and tentacles. While it has four large tentacles, it also has two whiskers that hang over its mouth. Yama's mouth is uncanny as it resembles a human mouth with a set of teeth, gums, and tongue. This fight takes place at an altered version of a crumbling tower where Yama floats in the center and the hunters can run along a flat edge or jump down below. Yama will float close to the ledge so the hunters can hit its tentacles, whiskers, as well as its mouth and eyes when it gets close enough. Yama will use its massive tentacles to swipe away at its opponents and can even spin around very quickly to slap any hunter who forgot to duck or jump off the ledge to avoid this attack. Yama can also create a massive wind tunnel to suck in hunters. This is a one-shot move if your defense isn't high enough or if you don't have the gut skill. Speaking of the gut skill, this was one of the only ways me and my hunting group first cleared this monster because we had a hard time avoiding this move. So if you're having trouble with Yama as well, go craft the Plum Daimyo or Lava Seoth armor sets. While Yama cannot be captured, if you throw Trank Bombs at him while he's doing the wind tunnel attack, Yama will fall down and you can jump on its back to carve. Something I have never noticed is you can tell how much health Yama has just by looking at the size of its stomach. At the beginning of the fight it will be its full size and it will get smaller when you make it fall down from damaging it. After it has fallen twice due to damage, it will be fully sunken in, meaning it will be close to death. Another interesting move is Yama will spit out a swarm of great thunderbugs to harass hunters so beware of being paralyzed. These great thunderbugs may also explode when threatened so dispose of them quickly or be ready to roll. Gunners will have a harder time of doing optimal damage as its mouth is its weakest point to shot damage. Your best bet is to use a pierce like ammo to aim inside its mouth and Yama is only weak to ice and dragon elements. If you can't hit the mouth, aim for Yama's eyeballs instead. As for melee users, your weakest point is the eyes then mouth. These hit zones won't always be available to you, but you will do a lot more damage on the rest of its body and tentacles than gunners will. I actually failed this quest quite a bit trying to solo it with a heavy bowgun, then I looked up its hit zones for gunners and realized its arms and body barely take any shot damage. So if you have the option, melee is probably your best bet, but if you're going to use a gun, make sure you aim for its weak points. Yama has a few decent para weapons and a thunder bow. Where its equipment really shines is in the armor department. Both armor sets come with the quick eating skill, which is decent, but the melee set comes with ESP. This skill comes in handy for the more dense monsters such as Kirin or Gravios. The gunner armor comes with capacity up, which isn't bad either. After you defeat the floating mossy octopus, you will finally reach HR9 and G3 quests. G3 is the final level of G rank and contains the hardest quests in the game. This level also contains 9 lock quests that I will talk about later in the video. I would consider all of these monsters in G3 to be in-game monsters, and what comes with defeating these beasts is their in-game armor and weapons. You will most likely have to grind for gear in this level in order to clear the final urgent quest to come. Right off the bat we have Tiger X for our first key quest, Absolute Power. Kirk, you're not going to be able to do much this quest. He's going to be flashed the entire time. Oh god, no! Why didn't you guys tell me he was right there? Did we just I fail the quest? Did kill all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. That was great. 
Tiger X has some very powerful G rank weapons that have purple sharpness but negative affinity. The armor on the other hand has earplugs and quick eating with the gunner set having auto tracker and the melee set having trank guru. Not the best armor unless you really want earplugs. This quest takes place at the snowy mountains, so don't forget your hot drinks. The next key quest is Black Phalange, where we must face two Black Diablos in the old desert location. Black Diablos has some of the highest raw weapons in the game, with some of them even having a bit of affinity. Both of Black Diablos' armor sets will come with Expert Plus One and Hear Protection, while the Blade Master set will have the Sharpness skill and the Gunner set will come with Reload Speed. After that, our next target is the Gravios on the key quest, Armored Supremacy. Gravios doesn't have the best weapons attack-wise, but some of the weapons do come with Poison Element. Also, the armor is geared towards shielded weapons, having the skills Guard Up and Guard Plus One. This quest does take place at the Old Swamp. Next, we come to some rare species monsters, with our first being Silverathalos on the key quest Explore the Unexplored. This quest and the next will both take place at the tower. Silverathalos will allow you to craft some of the best fire weapons in the game. These will be useful for our upcoming urgent quests, so be sure to farm those heavenly scales. Speaking of heavenly scales, you will need a grand total of 5 of them to complete the full Silverathalos armor set. This set will come with attack up medium that can easily be brought up to attack up large with a few decorations. The melee set will come with the ESP skill, while gunners will get the pierce shot up skill. Gold Rathian will be our next target on the key quest, a single beam of moonlight. Now, Gold Rathian armor has the best skill for anyone looking to farm for rare materials. Both armor sets will come with the Fate skill that increases your chances for better rewards and the Tranquilizer skill that will often give you more rewards for capturing a monster. The only downside to this set that gives you luck is you will need pretty good luck in order to craft it. Each armor piece will need one Rathian Heavenly skill for a total of five. After Gold Rathian is our final key quest, the Approaching Gaoran, where we must slay or repel the Shen Gaoran. This quest will once again be located at the town, so no waiting for Shen to slowly walk from area to area. Shen's G rank weapons have high attack, and its armor will come with the gut skill. Both armor sets will have quick resistance, while the melee armor will come with guard plus one, and the gunner set will have recoil reduction plus one. That was all the key quests, and once they have all been completed, you should have your urgent. For the last time, I would like to skim over a few of the optional quests, but not any of the locked ones. I am saving the best for last. First up, G3 has 6 epic hunting quests, all of which have you facing 2 or more monsters. Besides those quests, there are 2 monsters that are worth mentioning. Now, I have mentioned this monster 12 times before, but I haven't actually covered it as it has no key, urgent, or lock quests, so I might as well cover it here. There are 2 Kirin quests in G3, one of them being at the tower where you face the rafts, and the other quest takes place at the old swamp. Your reference notes have this to say about it. The Kirin is said to glow a faint blue, but so few have seen it, the details are scarce. It is apparently capable of calling forth lightning at will. Kirin material is very valuable. Kirin is labeled as an elder dragon even though it looks nothing like its so-called relatives. You will need a very sharp weapon to cut through its body, so primarily aim for its head or horn. Kirin has a mane of fur as well as a little patch on its tail that glow a luminescent white. Its body is covered in rock solid light blue and black scales. Kirin is one of the quickest monsters you will face due to its small size and is often very hard to hit. Kirin can summon lightning strikes around its body to ward off any foes. Kirin will often use its horn to charge at or gouge its enemies. This monster has to be fast, with one of its main predators being Rajang. Oddly enough, Kirin's horn has a separate hit zone from its head. As I said before, all weapons should aim for the head and horn, while also avoid hitting its body. For elemental weakness, the Kirin is weak to everything except thunder, but you should use a fire or water weapon as your first option. Ice is still somewhat effective, and dragon will do a little damage as well, but I would recommend fire above all else. For weapons, the Kirin has some of the best thunder weapons in the game, while its armor will give you the elemental attack up skill. I did have to farm Kirin in order to craft my heavy bowgun mix set. Taking a quick look at my G rank heavy bowgun set, I have the Kirin Horn X. This being the Blade Master helmet because it has plus 4 to elemental attack and double the defense of the gunner armor. 
Narg Vest X for the chest, Shinobi Coat Heaven Arms. You will need a clear hiring Fatalis for these, by the way. Kirin Shorts X, and finally, Obituary Femur X for the legs. With my Ultimate Lao Shan Cannon equipped, giving me an extra slot, you will also need some Evade Decos and Auto Reload Decos. The latter are not cheap, by the way, needing a Cantor Spikes to craft them. Once all the decorations are set, you will have Evade Plus 2, Auto Reload, and Elemental Attack up. Evade plus 2 will allow you to roll through moves much easier, perfect for slow moving heavy bowgun users who have to roll to dodge just about anything. Then the auto reload and elemental attack up skills paired with the Lao Shan cannon that can shoot fire, water, and thunder shots makes it good for slaying almost every monster in the game. This is the set I use on 90% of the hunts I go on, only equipping other sets if I want to gather or try out a different weapon. If you're interested in trying out Heavy Bowgun, I highly recommend you try out this mix set. I also have a bow set that uses all Kirin X armor except for the helmet. Instead, I use the Barrage Piercing, gifted to you after clearing all the battle training quests that gives you capacity up. With this set, I have Elemental Attack up, Capacity up, Runner, a skill that makes stamina usage reduced, and lastly, Divine Protection. Divine Protection gives you a 25% chance at taking 30% reduced damage from all attacks. This is one of my favorite sets to hunt Elder Dragons with because I pair it with the Dragon Bow Chaos that was crafted from the Lao Shan Lung materials. This bow does 360 attack with 220 dragon attack that gets raised up to 260 with elemental attack up. This set is especially good for Lunastra and Teostra who both need dragon element in order to break their horns. Also, capacity up with this bow unlocks its level 4 charge that is rapid level 4, arguably the best arrow type. This bow can also shoot every single coating in the game, making it very versatile. Another interesting quest is Child of Destruction, where your target will be a Rajang. This is no ordinary Rajang, however, it is a furious Rajang. This Rajang will already have its golden fur and also has no tail. Furious Rajang was first introduced in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite as well. You will receive gold Rajang materials from this monster. These materials can be used to craft some really good weapons and armor. The Blade Master set will give you the skills Focus, Dragon Resistance plus 5, and Sharpness plus 1. The Gunner set is another one of my bow sets that I use except I have the Barrage Piercing instead of the Rajang Helmet. With this set I have the skills Focus, Capacity Up, Dragon Resistance plus 5, Normal Slash Rapid Up, and Stealth. This is my only set that I have currently that gives me 5 positive skills. Another set that pairs really nice with the Dragon Bow Chaos. One last useful quest you unlock after defeating both the Gold Rathian and Silver Rathalos is a quest where you can face both of these monsters in the arena. Each monster will have less health than their individual quest, making it a great quest to farm for heavenly scales. The only downside to this quest is you will have to face both of these monsters at the same time in the arena. A good strategy is to bring a bunch of flash bombs and have your hunting party all focus on the Silver Rathalos first, as he has less HP than the Rathian. Now for our final urgent quest, Absolute Zero, where the White God awaits us. You can lose. For the last time, the Poke Village Chief requests our aid. This village already owes you so much, but we need you now more than ever. I truly believe it has to be you. Please, go forth to the Snowy Mountain Peak and fight the final fight. As the quest details state, this quest will take place atop the Snowy Mountain Peak where a base camp had once been set up long ago, but has been abandoned for years due to the area being inhospitable. Sonic bombs quickly. Oh, where do I go? Oh. You die, Kirk. You die. I go way too soon. God, he's drifting. I think we need to go fight him on Kirk's side. It's the only way we're safe. The only way we'll survive. Exactly. Looks like his tail is the weak spot for the gun. Interesting. Whoa, I didn't know you were the Plesioff. What the <laughs> fuck? You can lose his description states. A mysterious wyvern said to only appear after large avalanches deep in the snowy mountains. 
often seen crushing ice balls and rocks into powder in its stride. It's known to the guild as Eucanlos, although there are whispers it may be the White God. Eucanlos being classified as a flying wyvern that cannot fly, it closely resembles and is related to a Cantor. Eucanlos will have just about double the HP as the high rank guild a Cantor, meaning this is one of the chunkiest boys in the game. Instead of the large black spikes that dot the Acantor's back, the Eucanlos has huge, silvery gray plates that cover its body resembling large fins. Its face is relatively small on its otherwise massive body, but it does have a nice jawline. In fact, its jaw acts like a huge shovel Eucanlos will use to scoop or slice through the rock-solid ice. With its jaw, it will often launch huge chunks of ice at its enemies and dig underground to then swim through the ice, utilizing the sharp fins on its back. So be sure to stand clear when the Eucanlos starts swimming in your direction. To add to its destructive power, the Eucanlos can produce a sub-zero beam of ice. It will blast any hunter that threatens it. All melee weapons should primarily focus their attacks on the head, while impact users can also hit the neck and stomach. Gunners, on the other hand, are better attacking from the rear, aiming for the monster's massive tail. If the tail is out of range, you can then go for the head. Eucanlos is weakest to fire damage, but thunder and dragon weapons will be effective as well. Eucanlos will take less damage in its rage state, but don't let that keep you from wailing on the beast. This quest is remarkably hard, as well as cold, so bring lots of hot drinks and healing items. Just like the quest in the battleground, you will spawn in the same area as the monster, so be ready to run at the beginning of the quest. There is a gathering point located to the left of the entrance from the base camp where you can gather hot drinks, many whetstones, and thawing agent. I also forgot to mention the Eucanlos can freeze you solid, so be sure to bring some thawing agent or gather some if you run out. And I really shouldn't have to say this, but for this quest I would definitely bring at least a Ancient Potion or a couple Max Potions. Soloing this quest is a true test of your skill, but if you have the option, I would at least bring one or more hunters to aid you slay this behemoth. If you do end up hunting in a party, I would bring a few life powders to heal your allies. It is worth mentioning, a YouTuber named Deathstrike does speedruns of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. He is also one of the only hunters who is legendary enough to do Eucanlos percent speedruns, where he will start a new game, play through the guild until he defeats Eucanlos. This man is an absolute unit. He has some really good tips and tricks for this game, many of which I used in this video. That being said, to get through the game fast, he will use the best weapons and armor that he can craft without doing too much farming. From what I could gather, he uses heavy and light bow guns in low rank, then the light bow gun for most of high rank, and finally switching to hammer and G rank. In his most recent run posted on his YouTube channel, he cleared Eucanlos in 26 hours. This is an insane time because I'm guessing most players would still be in lower high rank around the 26 hour mark. Looking back at my older footage, I didn't clear Eucanlos until I was past 150 hours on my samurai profile. Being one of the final monsters in the game, it has some good gear to back up its hype. All weapons have a Eucanlos version, with all of them having extremely high raw attack and a decent bit of ice damage. The downsides to these weapons is their low sharpness levels and negative affinity. On top of that, each weapon and armor piece will require a Eucanlos stone the rarest drop from the monster. The Eucanlos armor set is the third most defensive set in the game, with the Blade Master set having ESP, Quake Res, and Sharpness plus one. However, the Gunner set is not as impressive, only having reload speed increased and capacity up. This being the final urgent quest means you technically beat the game from a story standpoint. All of Polk Village was being evacuated because of the Eucanlos, and we have stopped the threat. This may have been the final urgent quest, but there are still more quests to complete. Also, more training missions I have yet to discuss. These training quests being the G level training. Now, I won't spend a long time on this section, as I am still in the process of completing all these quests, but I will give a brief overview and some insight to a few strategies for each location. Also, I would really like to get to the lock quest, so I'm sorry if this section seems a little rushed. 
Just like the other training quests, all these monsters have a star level assigned to them, although even the one star Hypno is a challenge. With 8 different monsters, each of them having 5 weapons to choose from, the G training has a total of 40 quests to clear. The first monster being the Hypnocatrice, located at the Great Forest. Your weapon options are Sword and Shield, Longsword, Hunting Horn, Gun Lance, and Bow. The Great Forest can be quite confusing, so be sure to use the Gathering Guide as well as the Training Gathering Guide to aid you on these quests. Area 1 has some potions, and you can also gather an old bug net. You will need a bug net to gather a Supply Max Potion in Area 4. I almost always go for the Supply Max Potion at some point, due to the G-leveled monster's damage output. Area 4 also contains a spot to gather Iron Pickaxes that can be used to mine traps in Area 2 and 3. Quest number 2 is located at the Old Jungle, where you will try not to smell the Emerald Kangalala. The weapons provided you on this quest are Dual Blades, Greatsword, Hammer, Lance, and the Heavy Bowgun. The Old Jungle has some useful items to aid you on this stinky monkey quest. First, go to Area 2 and gather some mini whetstones and potions. Then head to Area 5 to gather Iron Pickaxes, Poison Throwing Knives, and the Book of Combos 1 if you plan on combining anything. Head back through Area 2 to gather hot drinks, you will be needing these for Areas 9 and 10. At this point, the Emerald Kangala may appear in Area 2, and you can either stay to fight him or run past to make your way to Area 8. Here, gather a few Psycho Serum, then go to Area 9 and mine the two Supply Barrel Bombs. Finally, Area 10 has a Far Caster, Shock Trap, and a Supply Max Potion. I usually save my bombs for when the Emerald Kangalala goes to sleep towards the end of its life. After that, we will bake in the sun of the old desert where we must cook up the Plum Daimyo Hermitar. Our offensive choices being the Sword and Shield, Greatsword, Hunting Horn, Lance, and Light Bowgun. My old desert route isn't very effective, so I will just list off the good items. First, Area 1 has a map, paintballs, and some mini whetstones. Area 3 has a demon drug and some potions. In Area 4 you can gather iron pickaxes and some cool drinks. Area 5 has rations and two spots where you can gather a supply max potion, but for one of them you will need a bug net. Area 6 is loaded having hot drinks, trap tool, a shock trap, and two supply large barrel bombs. Lastly, areas 8 and 9 both have mega potions. Sliding in is our next red-eyed opponent, the Nargakuga, located once again at the Great Forest. Our weapon options are Dual Blades, Long Sword, Hammer, Gun Lance, and Light Bow Gun. Back at the Old Desert, our brown sandy monkey friend, the Copper Blanganga, awaits us. The weapons for this quest include Dual Blades, Great Sword, Hammer, Gun Lance, and Bow. Heating up the difficulty, we must face the Lava Slioth at the Volcano. Our weapons of mass destruction for this quest are Sword and Shield, Great Sword, Hunting Horn, Lance, and Heavy Bow Gun. Area 1 has a Supply Max Potion, but you will need picks that can be found in Areas 3 or 9. Area 2 has Cool Drinks and lots of Bombs. Area 6 also has Bombs, a Pitfall Trap, and Mega Potions. Area 10 also has Mega Potions as well as some Poison Throwing Knives. Cutting in is our next opponent at the Old Swamp location is the Terra Shogun Sienitar. This time we equip ourselves with the Dual Blades, Longsword, Hunting Horn, Lance, or Light Bowgun. If you are as confused as I am hunting in the Old Swamp, a map can be found in Area 2 along with some Paintballs. Iron pickaxes can be found in area 3 along with rations, a demon drug, and max potions, but you will need a bug net for the max potion. Bug nets can be gathered in area 8 where you can also mine some supply large barrel bombs. Mega potions can be found in areas 10 and 11. Last up, the quickest to anger is the Rajang found at the old volcano. Our final weapon options are sword and shield, longsword, hammer, gun lance, and bow. Iron pickaxes will be very useful on this quest, and you can gather them in areas 3 and 7. Area 2 has the supply max potion in a mining node. Area 3 you can mine supply large barrel bombs, and area 4 you can mine a shock trap. Cool drinks can also be found in area 4 and 7. I wish I could have added all my best times and high scores, but I still had about 12 to 20 quests to complete. This would have taken time away from finishing this video that I've been working on for over a year now. If you do however finish every G training quest with every single weapon, you will get arguably one of the most useful armor pieces in the game. This is a miscellaneous helmet called the Ambitious Piercing. 
The skill that comes with it is plus 15 points into fate, giving you the luck booster skill. Being even better than the good luck skill, this one armor piece alone will give you a greater chance for increased rewards. Using Athena's armor set search, you can whip up a plethora of different mix sets to use with this armor piece. Once I obtain it, I already have a mix set that will give me elemental attack up, auto reload, and finally the luck booster skill. This is basically the same heavy bow gun set I'm already using, just without evade plus two, so I better be more careful when I end up using it. Some of you may know why I chose to put this section before I talked about the locked quests. With that being said, I will finally discuss the final monsters you can face in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Now, we can finally talk about the locked quests for the guild. All of these quests will have you clearing other quests in order to unlock them. First, I will discuss the high rank locked quests. All of these can be found in HR6 or 8 star. There are three Elder Dragons that have a total of two quests each that are locked in this level. In order for them to appear, you must clear all the quests in the previous two levels, 6 and 7 star, except for the epic hunting quests for them to be unlocked. The only non-epic hunting quest you don't have to clear is Meeting of the Blangangas. After that you should unlock Kushala Deora, Camellios, and Teostra. I have already covered all these Elder Dragons in the offline high rank section. The next three locked high rank quests are much more difficult. First is the Legendary Black Dragon quest where you must slay the Fatalis. Fatalis is a black dragon and being such, not much is known about the beast. It can be found at the Castle Shrade location, a map specifically made to face this monster. To unlock this quest, you must first clear each battle training quest with at least one weapon for it to appear. I will go into greater detail on these quests towards the end of this section. The next quest is the End Times, and our task is to slay the Crimson Fatalis. You must slay the Black Fatalis once for this quest to appear, and it takes place at the battleground, so bring your cool drinks. The last locked high rank quest is the Ancestral Dragon, and our target is to slay the White Fatalis atop the tower. To unlock the White Fatalis, you must first slay three Lao Shan, three Fatalis, one of them being a Crimson, three Kirin, and five of every other Elder Dragon, including the Lunastra that can only be fought offline. Obviously this will take some time if you haven't been actively slaying these Elder Dragons. Also, this is a great time to start mining from the Ancient Greatsword found in the cave of the Poke Village farm. You will need Elder Dragon Bones in order to mine from the Greatsword, and it will regenerate after each quest, meaning you can practically mine from it indefinitely. You will receive Dark Stones and pieces that can be used to craft various weapons and armor. Now, let's look at the G rank lock quests. I have already mentioned the Ashen Lao found in G2, where you must clear all epic hunting quests in G1 and 2 for it to become available. I only bring this up again because after you clear this quest, the G rank Kushala, Camellios, and Teoster will all become unlocked in G3. Just like in high rank, each Elder Dragon will have two quests to clear. All of these Elder Dragons get a compound skill that is specific to each of their individual armor sets. Starting off with the Camellios armor, you will have the Frosty Protection skill if you have the full set equipped. This skill grants the user Snow Resistance and Dragon Windbreaker, making this set a direct counter to the Kishala Deora. Along with that you will have the High Grade Earplug and Stealth skills. The Stealth skill will make it so large monsters target you less than your other teammates. Taking a look at the Kushala set, it will give you the Metallic Protection skill that will negate terrain damage and give you plus 10 to your fire resistance, making this set a direct counter to Teostra and Lunastra. The Blade Master set will give you Evade and Sharpness plus 1, while the Gunner set will give you Reload and the Recoil skills. Lastly, the Teostra and Lunastra armor sets will both be giving you the Fiery Protection skill. When active, this skill will make you immune to poison, theft, and fatigue. This skill is an obvious counter to Camellios. First, looking at Lunastra's armor, whom many of you know doesn't actually have a G rank quest, so instead the armor will use some G rank Teo materials and the rest will be Luna materials. Her set will give you wide area and the health recovery items improve skills. As for the Teo set, it will give you Reckless Abandon plus 3. 
giving you plus 30% affinity to your weapons. Now for the ultimate test of your strength that comes along with these next three quests. First is the G level Fatalis quest with the same name as its high rank counterpart, the legendary Black Dragon. To unlock this quest, you must complete all G training monsters with at least one weapon. Now you can see why I saved this section for last. Again, this quest will take place at Castle Shrade, an area first introduced in the very first Monster Hunter. This area serves as a special arena to fight Fatalis. This castle is very old, possibly built by the same people who constructed the tower, and it is now in ruins, abandoned long ago. This castle belonged to the Shrade Kingdom that was lost over a thousand years prior to the events of Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Castle Shrade was a central hub of the kingdom, with it having a city to the east, Riveru, and another to the west, Verudu. A thousand years ago, without warning, the kingdom was struck with disaster. After the dust cleared, the once beautiful sky where you could see for miles in all directions is now covered in dark haunting clouds, leaving the once great kingdom in eternal shadow. This will be the arena we shall face the Black Beast. You won't start at the base camp, but the supply box will be filled to the brim with items such as first aid meds, rations, supply large barrel bombs, and ballista. The map is split into two different courtyards. One has the Dragonator, a cannon, and ballista, while the other has a soul cannon. Fatalis will fly between these areas every few minutes or so. The Shrade Kingdom sits just north of the Henrum Mountains that stretch all the way down to present day Mineguard and its small village neighbor to the east, Kokoto Village. While most monsters have an image in the reference book, crude but well enough illustrated as to get the monster's imagery across, Fatalis simply has a question mark and its description states, a legendary black dragon said to have prowled these lands from the days of old. Many skilled hunters have sought to challenge it, but none ever returned. A monster shrouded in mystery. This quest comes from a benevolent monarch stating the legendary black dragon. It really exists then. We've prepared all instruments of war to assist you in your quest to destroy the dragon. The fate of the nation lies in your hands. Fatalis is an actual dragon unlike the wyverns we face in the game having two arms, legs, and wings. Fatalis also looks like what most of us probably think of when we imagine dragons compared to the other elder dragons in the game. A large, four-horned head with a massive jaw laden with razor-sharp teeth sits atop a long neck. Fatalis is covered in black scales, and its spine is decorated with spikes that protrude all the way down to the tip of its lengthy tail, also sporting a pale chest and underbelly that is anything but soft. Mysterious as this dragon is, there is a legend, or should I say, THE legend of the black dragon. This can be found in your hunter's trivia located inside your home. The legend states, Hasn't there been a song stuck in your head? A song sung by children all across the land. A song with soul, sung diligently in the streets and in the alleys. What is that song? The legend of death. Death by a giant wyvern has been revived. It is the legend of the black dragon. Everyone should know it as it is based on the famous fairy tale. However, I think the fact that everyone is singing this song is actually a sign. They say the children are always first to foretell the changing of the world. They are said to have a special sense for these kind of things. I have gathered as much information as I could from the corners of this world, and I have told those who should be told. However, no one believes me. This is why I've begged for a few pages in Hunting Life, to explain the legend to all who care to learn. The legend of the black dragon is said to exist everywhere, and while there are changes in the lyrics depending on the location, the content of the song is the same. So please understand that the lyrics printed below are representative of the song as I know it. The lyrics may differ where you are located. The legend of the black dragon, when the world is full of wyverns. The legend is revived, meat is eaten, bone is crunched, and blood is sucked up dry. He burns the earth and melts through iron. He boils the rivers and mows down trees. 
He awakens the winds and lights an inferno. He is called Fatalis, the wyvern of destiny. He is called Fatalis, the wyvern of destruction. Call for help, run for your lives, and don't forget to pray to the skies. He is called Fatalis, the wyvern of destiny. He is called Fatalis, the wyvern of destruction. Fatalis, Fatalis, heaven and earth are yours. Fatalis, Fatalis, heaven and earth are yours. Now, Fatalis has almost as much HP as Laoshan Lung, literally being 666 HP short of the Colossal Elder Dragon. Now imagine if Laoshan actually fought back when you were attacking it. Fatalis can just about one-shot you with the majority of its moves, many of its attacks involving massive fireballs it will shoot from its mouth. Also, Fatalis will do a ton of chip damage simply by whacking you with its tail when it turns around. This is why if you are hunting in a group, which you should, have all the hunters in your group stay close to one another to avoid this lethal tail. Fatalis will often use its massive body or feet to crush any nearby hunters, so beware of these moves if you are a melee user. Fatalis will also do a similar attack to the Rathalos where it will fly high in the air and then blast fireballs down on you and your allies. Bombs are basically mandatory to bring on this quest because every part of this black dragon's body will take little to no damage from traditional weapons. Everything down from its long neck to its feet are very damage resistant. Therefore, all weapons should focus their attacks on its head and face as these are two different hit zones. Fatalis is weak to all elements, but dragon is by far the most effective. Oddly enough, after dragon is fire element, followed closely by ice. Lastly, water and thunder are tied for least effective. While all weapons except the light and heavy bowguns can deal consistent dragon elemental damage, bowguns are better off using fire element. Personally, I like to use a dragon bow for this quest, but it will take a long time to actually slay the Fatalis using this method solo. You have 50 minutes to clear this quest, but the Fatalis will be repelled at 25 minutes if you have brought it down about one fourth of its total health. The health will then be carried over to the next quest, similar to how the other Elder Dragons work. For best rewards, you will want to break the horns twice, and then the third time will break its eye. You can also break the wings and chest, although going for these two spots will result in a lower damage output, so use the ballista or bombs if possible. Now, in a group of 3-4 to four hunters, it still may take you 3-4 to four hunts in order to finally slay this beast. After you have slayed the beast, you can carve a total of 9 times three times from the head, upper, and lower body. Fatalis can also be affected by all status effects, but no traps will work on this Elder Dragon, including flash bombs. As you might have guessed, Fatalis equipment is some of the best gear to have in this game. The greatsword we can mine from at Poke Farm is obviously a massive Fatalis greatsword said to have once belonged to the ancestor of the village elder, discovered only after you beat Tigerex and use its screamer to shatter the ice. Mining for the Dark Stones and Pieces is more of an endgame grind because this is when you will actually have a bunch of Elder Dragon Bones to use up. Fatalis has some amazing dragon weapons and decent gear, as well as even having a special skill tied to the armor. I'm not going to include the high rank armor, as in my opinion, it is just a waste of time to craft it, when you could just go craft some low tier G rank armor instead. Also, all the high rank Fatalis armors come with two negative skills. The G rank Fatalis armor will grant melee users sharpness plus one, while gunners will receive pierce shot up. Both armor sets will have evade distance up and resist status. Resist status being the exclusive skill only found on the G rank Fatalis armor, it will make you completely immune to sleep, poison, paralysis, and the faint status effects. This armor also has high elemental resistance except for dragon resistance. This makes it great for fighting just about any monster, especially anything that can inflict status elements. Our next mission is once again by the same name as its high rank counterpart, the End Times. On this quest at the battleground, we will face the Crimson Fatalis. In order to unlock this quest, we must first slay the Fatalis and clear all Elder Dragon quests, including the Kirin. Yes, you heard me correctly, but if you have already unlocked the White Fatalis in high rank, you should be close to unlocking this quest if you haven't already. This means you must clear 18 quests at the village, 
25 through the guild for a total of 43 Elder Dragon quests you must clear. Obviously, this does not include all the quests you will have to clear in order for these Elder Dragon quests to appear in the first place. The client requesting us to undertake this quest is quite interesting. It comes from a Scarlet Mystery Man saying, It appears the time has finally come. The bloodstained scales of the red dragon have graced the earth again in flaming glory. If you can stop this beast. Now, this word choice is odd with him saying the bloodstained scales of the red dragon have graced the earth again in flaming glory. Almost as if it is a good thing. Which any fatalis by no means is a grace to anything. Quite the opposite actually. Unless, this Scarlet Mystery Man is hoping for the destruction this dragon will bring. This quest is probably the hardest to unlock, especially if you haven't done a lot of the village quests. Crimson Fatalis was first introduced in Monster Hunter G. Crimson Fatalis has become one with the volcanic belt it calls home, harnessing its fiery power and rage. While the majority of its body is still black, some of the shells and scales on its chest, neck, and the tip of its wings have turned a darker red color due to the years of exposure of the volcano. Crimson Fatalis also has one massive horn compared to the other three that crown its head. The Crimson Fatalis is much more deadly to gunners versus melee users as many of its attacks are ranged or geared towards faraway targets such as one of its attacks where it will swoop forward with its massive wings, knocking down anything in its path. This is basically a death sentence if you are hit by it, much like many of its other moves. Crimson Fatalis can also make it rain down fireballs that will inflict serious damage if you are hit by or even near the explosion. It can summon these fireballs simply by biting the sky and bright balls of light will be shown on the ground, indicating where each meteor will impact. However, if you stand directly in front of the monster, you will usually be safe from the meteors. Crimson Fatalis will also just shoot fireballs out of its mouth, aiming directly for any hunter in sight. Crimson Fatalis shares all the same weaknesses and weak points as its black counterpart. This is even more baffling than before because the Crimson Fatalis literally lives inside a volcano surrounded by fire, yet it is still weak to fire damage. Although again, Dragon is much more effective. In addition to its weaknesses, you will be devastated to hear that once Crimson Fatalis enters its rage state, it will go into armor mode. In armor mode, all hit zones and elemental effectiveness will do minimal damage. So if you are a gunner or bow user, save all your coatings slash elemental ammo except for water and thunder for when the Crimson Fatalis is out of rage mode. When enraged, the chest of the beast will glow a brightish red-orange color and its attacks will become even more destructive. Due to this armor mode, it is a good idea to bring bombs or explosive ammo as explosions ignore hit zones so they will still do a ton of damage. Also, if you have room, bring combines for a lot more bombs. Just try not to blow yourself up. This also makes the Gun Lance a really good weapon to use for this monster because its shells will ignore the Crimson's armor state. Just note that in armored mode, you will need ESP as to not bounce off the monster. This literally makes the Crimson Fatalis the hardest monster in the game. Now, the battleground complements the Crimson Fatalis with its streams of magma that will burn you if you get too close. You better come prepared on this quest, as unlike Castle Shrade, there is no bed to rest for HP or a supply box filled with healing items and rations. So bring a lot of cool drinks, mega slash max potions, and hope you can best this beast. Also, without the aid of any siege weapons like the previous quest, it is up to you, your hunting party, and the weapons slash tools you have brought on this quest to bring down this Crimson Terror. Now let's look at the gear you can get from this furious beast. Starting with the melee armor, you will have the sharpness plus one skill with the fully equipped set. As for gunners, instead of artisan, you will have the capacity up skill, great for bows and bow gunners alike. Both armor sets will have evade plus one and negative recovery speed. The last and exclusive skill to the Crimson Fatalis armor is the Fury skill. Fury is a combination of guts and adrenaline plus two. Adrenaline plus two will increase your defense 90 points and also give you a 30% attack boost when your health is below 40%. 
This works great with the gut skill because you can survive an attack, then in turn receive a buff to both your offense and defense. This is arguably one of the best sets in the game and is why I crafted the gunner set for myself. Finally, we have reached the pinnacle, the final boss. The last quest we can unlock, the ancestral dragon atop the highest peak of a man-made creation, taunting its creator's descendants as it flies in the heavens above like a false star shining down only to bring destruction to those who oppose its order. A dragon that brings order to its kind through the chaos it causes. White Fatalis. Our client is once again this malevolent scarlet mystery man stating, he, he, he. The time has come. Here is your invitation to the ball. Wear your Sunday best and bring your greatest weapon, for it is time to go to the dance with the King of Disaster. Another odd choice of wording, as your Sunday best usually is referring to the clothes you would wear to church or only on special occasions. Nothing is known of this mystery man, or in Japan he is referred to as Man in Red. Other than that, this client is the majority of the Black Dragon quests across all the Monster Hunter titles. I would love to hear all your theories on this subject in the comments down below. To unlock this final quest, you must first slay the Crimson Fatalis and all G-Rank Epic Hunting quests. So in reality, you only need to clear all G3 quests because you should have already cleared the other epic hunting quests in order to unlock the Crimson Fatalis in the first place. One thing I haven't talked about as much as I should have is monster themes. Both Fatalis and Crimson Fatalis share a theme that is just a different version of the Rathalos theme with added chorus. Only the toughest monsters in Monster Hunter have a theme with an accompanying chorus and this stays true throughout the whole Monster Hunter series. Many themes are specific to monsters or locations you are fighting at. White Fatalis comes with its own theme that makes the fight even more epic than it already is. The White Fatalis, also known as the Old Fatalis, was first introduced in Monster Hunter Dose. Black Dragons have been in almost every game after this one, but I wish they would have added more new ones in some of the games like World, instead of just reusing the already known Black Dragons. Also, I was pretty disappointed that Sunbreak didn't add or even bring back any Black Dragons for that expansion. Alright, no more ranting for a few more minutes. The White Fatalis doesn't resemble its black or red counterparts as they were both much darker. The White Fatalis, as the name suggests, is covered in luminescent scales and has a strip of glowing fur that flows down its spine and tail. White Fatalis also has a glowing beard and branching horns that resemble antlers. Once the ancient beast is enraged, its chest and throat will begin to glow red and a storm of red lightning will engulf the beast. This red-white lightning will be its main form of attacks, as it can summon lightning strikes at will, similar to the Crimson's meteor attack. Again, if you stand in front of the Fatalis, this move shouldn't hit you. White Fatalis can also shoot red balls of lightning from its mouth while on the ground or flying above. These are very deadly and will probably one-shot you as well. White Fatalis can also wrap its claw in lightning to swipe at any hunters that stand too close to it. Hammer users will be sad to hear that it is impossible to stun this great beast with their bonking sticks. Although, White Fatalis can be put to sleep and paralyzed. One move you will have to look out for is when White Fatalis flies to the top of the tower to call forth a devastating lightning storm where lightning strikes will strike for a solid 15 to 20 seconds or so. Being struck by one of these bolts is an instant cart, so I suggest you tilt your camera looking down at the ground, then run to the opposite side of the map from Fatalis. Then just sprint back and forth, roll or invincible dive if you have to in order to spare your life. At a certain HP threshold, the wiki states at 50%, the white Fatalis will enter its armored state. Similar to the Crimson Fatalis, melee weapons will need ESP for most of its body, and it will take a fraction of the damage while in armored mode. So be sure to use your bombs, cluster shot, and wavering fire at this point of the quest. The wiki states it will leave its armored state when it reaches 25% HP. Also while in armor mode, its attacks will deal even more damage than they did before. Just like the other Fatalis, you can break the horns, chest, wings, and scar its eye to receive extra rewards. 
With those rewards, you can craft yourself the White Fatalis armor with its specialized skills Edge Master for melee and Steady Hand for gunners. Edge Master will give you sharpness plus one and attack up large with the melee set, also having the constitution skill that will decrease stamina usage by half. Steady Hand will give you all shot bonuses, those being at normal slash rapid, pierce, and pellet slash spread shot up. Both Normal and Pierce will get a 10% increase in damage, while Pellet slash Spread will receive a 30% increase in damage. The Gunner set will also come with Constitution, but the downsides to these sets is you will have negative fate, but you should be able to gem it out if you choose to do so. One thing I also failed to mention is all the Fatalis armor will require not only Fatalis materials, but also other very rare materials from other monsters for each piece. Also, much like the other Fatalis weapons, the white Fatalis weapons will have decent attack as well as dragon damage. To craft these weapons, you will need to upgrade them from the black weapons path that are crafted from the dark stones and pieces. Once you have cleared a Cantor offline and the Unkelos online, all the Fatalis both in high and G rank, you might think to yourself, I have finally beat the game. I guess it is a matter of opinion on what you consider beating the game, but you have only scratched the surface at this point. Referring to the guild card at the awards section, you will see there are still things to be done, quests to clear, and gear to craft. I myself am still working on completing many of these awards that I have not unlocked after more than 300 hours of gameplay. Some are easy such as the village chief's gloves where you must clear all 1 and 2 star village quests. Others are downright diabolical, and by others I mean the majority of the awards, such as the King's Crown and Miniature Crown awards. For each of these, you must get a gold crown for all large or small monsters. Or what about the Wyvern's Artisan Hammer, where you must craft four fully upgraded weapons of each weapon type? Or even worse is the Members card. To unlock this award, you must craft 50 Yes, I said 50 G-level weapons that are only available after you defeat Yukanlos. Each of these weapons costs a staggering 100,000 zenny. That, multiplied by 50, is 5 million zenny in total. You would need to clear the Yukanlos quest 84 times, this quest being the highest paying at 60,000 zenny, just to pay for all these weapons. You could also sell some of the monster parts you are hoarding. But screw that, I didn't farm Silver Rathalos 50 times just to sell the 30 or so shells I have lying around. I guess I'll have to ramp up power seed production and sell 35,715 of those bad boys to my kitchen staff. Trinya's Flag is another ridiculous award you receive by sending Trinya on 100 trips worth 1500 poke points. One award I am only a few thousand guild points away from receiving is the Flower Bouquet from the guild, where you will need 1 million guild points to obtain it. Now, it is up to you if you want to spend your time grinding for these awards, they are basically the equivalent of achievements nowadays, but it does give some meaning to playing Monster Hunter Freedom Unite after you've cleared both the main stories and the final special quests. It also gives you the opportunity to try out new weapons and armor, whether that be through training missions or crafting new ones to test out yourself. Now when I created this section of the video, back when each section was just a category I would write about, I never thought I would try to unlock many of these achievements. But as I played more and more, I became obsessed with clearing all the quests, trying out new weapons and armor, and even going out on treasure quests in hope of getting the rare treasure items. Unlike the modern Monster Hunter titles, there are only so many quests to clear and gear to craft, but I feel like it is definitely enough to keep someone entertained long after they have beat the final monster, or even after clearing Fatalis. Monster Hunter World and Sunbreak both have much different endgames compared to Monster Hunter Freedom Unite where you can endlessly upgrade your weapons and armor, endlessly clear new investigations and anomaly quests with no end in sight. Now that is not a bad thing by any means, you will have plenty of content to take part in, but for me it's not super appealing. 
I can also see how these awards are unappealing and even pointless, but Monster Hunter Freedom Unite is a lot less complex than the newer titles. All the Monster Hunter games have different end games, and it is up to you if you want to keep playing or move on to something else. Whether that be starting a new game, trying a new weapon, going for speedrun records, or playing a whole new game entirely is up to you. Finally, there are some weapons that are much harder to obtain than others. These are the Rust slash Ancient Stone weapons. There is a guide that will explain the process of obtaining these weapons much better than I could on the FAQ page uploaded by Iceman. There are five different types of Rust Stone and Ancient Stone weapons. These stones can be polished at the blacksmith for 1000 zenny. In the polishing process, you will have a chance to obtain a rusted or worn weapon depending on if you used a rust or ancient stone. But there is also a chance you will only get a normal weapon, so be sure to save your game before polishing any stones so you don't end up wasting anything. These worn or rusted weapons will eventually upgrade into some form of an Elder Dragon weapon the majority of the time. In order to obtain these stones, you must first mine in the volcano at area 6 or 8, or at the old volcano in area 8. If you are mining for these items, you will be best off using a gathering set with the skills such as Gathering Plus 2, High Speed Gathering, and Divine Whim. Also be sure to take the opportunity to collect as many regular stones as you can to craft more bomb material. I say this because I tend to run out of flash bombs and they are very useful for many monsters as a gunner. Also another task you can embark on is clearing all the training missions with all the training weapons to obtain the three miscellaneous armor pieces. This in turn will grant you awards with each level completed. Along with clearing all the quests to obtain these awards, you will stumble upon some quests that will be quite memorable. Now, when I say memorable quests, I'm not talking about the obvious urgent quest or special slash unlocked quest that I already covered. I mean the quests you don't forget about, whether that be because they are cool and interesting, or miserably bad or significantly more difficult than other quests, such as the golden fish quests. There are a few quests where you must deliver three golden fish, that's all fine and good. Just bring a ton of bait and you should be able to clear it in 15 minutes or so. The golden fish quest I'm referring to is the Deliver 8 golden fish quest found at the guild hall in 4 star low rank. Now if you had a group of 4 hunters, this quest probably wouldn't be too bad, but if you embark on it solo, this might be downright impossible. My brother and I went on this quest and we had gone through 20 to 30 bait each before we had a total of 8 golden fish. It didn't help that you can only get golden fish from areas 1 and 6 when there is also a fishing spot in area 7 where my brother was fishing at for some time. I only realized after 10 to 20 minutes of him having bad luck like always that area 7 doesn't have any golden fish. The most useful bait by far on this quest is the golden fish bait that you can craft from combining firefly and snake bee larva. But you can only carry 5 of these golden fish bait at a time. Also only golden fish will go for this bait, so if there are none in the area you will have to use a different bait until one appears. That's why you should bring mega fishing fly, crickets for combines, and worms. Note that you will be given worms in the supply box, but some extra will come in handy. I will have to watch the footage back, but this quest took us a long time and I thought we might have to abandon quest and try it again. As I was losing hope, my brother discovered that the fish will reset if you leave the area and come back, making the process much quicker. Overall, this is a terrible quest and I would argue is more challenging than just going out on a regular hunting quest. I am glad the newer Monster Hunter titles no longer have fishing quests, rather just requests from random NPCs and whatnot. Also in low rank is another quest where you must slay 50 Vespoids. If I haven't mentioned these annoying creatures yet, they are basically an oversized wasp that can sting you and cause paralysis. I can only imagine how painful this quest would be as a melee user. Thankfully, my brother assisted me, and we both had guns. While it didn't take as long as the goldenfish quest and we both had ranged weapons, the Vespoid are still hard to hit as if they know you're going to attack them. Then, they will suddenly change directions or fly all over the place. To make things worse, in the same level there is a Slay 50 Hornitar quest. Hornitar are the blue beetle creatures that are usually slowly walking on the ground until they see a hunter, then they will start hopping like a grasshopper and try and eat you. These little buggers are much easier to hit with a melee weapon, but we still use guns for this quest. 
With both of these missions being the low rank guild, it would be much easier with a party of four to complete them. I already talked about the one-eared Garuga, so I won't discuss that again, but I only mentioned the one-horned Demon King Diablos quest in 8 star high rank. This Diablos wasn't too bad on this profile because me and my brother both had G rank gear, but oh man when we first tried this quest back in the day, it kicked our butts. First off, we were using high rank gear and long swords, not guns. Secondly, this Diablos has more health than many of the G rank monsters and it hits like a tank. We probably tried this quest 5 or 10 times and failed. But on one run, it was starting to get late at night, and mind you, I was in middle school so I still had a bedtime. We had probably been hunting it for 20 to 30 minutes, but the Diablos was showing no signs of weakness. My mom came into the room and stated that it was time for me to go to bed. I told her, just a few more minutes and I would be done with this quest. A few minutes go by and we're still hunting the Diablos. The next time she comes back in, she wasn't going to take no for an answer, so I reluctantly abandoned the quest and went into my room. This was even worse than failing a quest in my opinion, because the next morning I asked my brother if he finished the quest, and he did. It took him a lot longer because he had to finish it solo, but I will never forget that one horned beast. Now I'm not trying to say don't listen to your parents, but I totally could have just ran back to base for a few minutes, waited for my mom to think I was asleep, and then finish the quest with my brother in my room. I wish any of you the best of luck that embark on this quest with high rank gear, as it was treacherous. There are some other quests that are quite interesting, but you can only get them by downloading them. These of course are the DLC quests. There is also some other downloadable content I would like to discuss as well. There are event quests you can download that can be embarked on from the guild hall. A bonus section is also an option where you can download the DLCs such as the Peddling Granny items and Piggy fashions. The Peddling Granny items is probably the most useful DLC because it allows you to purchase items such as raw meat and dragon toadstools. You can also download challenge quests that will appear in the group training section. Many of these event and challenge quests will reward you with exclusive tickets you will not be able to obtain otherwise. These tickets are used to craft special weapons and armor. I am surprised to see for the event quest Twin Terrors you must hunt to Rajang and you can receive a Veggie Elder Ticket Sky as a reward. I wonder if you still need to have a Platinum Guild Card to obtain these tickets. Either way, this is the best way to farm for these sky tickets used to trade with the Veggie Elder to receive heavenly scales. Another cool, or should I say hot quest, is High Altitude King, where you must face a G rank Akantor. This Akantor has the same amount of health as the Ucanlos. Clearing this quest will reward you with great stones that can be used to craft the G Blade, an epic looking greatsword with a G burned into its sides. One more quest I found quite interesting is a White Beam of Light, where you must fight a G rank White Fatalis that has less HP than the normal White Fatalis quest in G3. You will have to slay this Fatalis in one quest however. Back in the day on the PSP, all you had to do was go to downloads, then choose the quest you wanted. There was a limit of 6 quests you could have at a time, but it was easy enough to just delete some of the event or challenge quests you didn't want to make room for new ones. Nowadays on the PSP emulator, the process is a bit more tricky. Luckily there is a website that explains the process out in steps, and I was able to successfully download some of the event quests and bonus content that I wanted. That was all the stuff you could download in-game, but some people have been hard at work on other downloadable content for the game. People have actually created texture packs for this game similar to the Minecraft texture packs that upscale some of the textures. These texture packs breathe new life into the game and is a great improvement for anyone that doesn't like the old PSP textures. I tested these texture packs out myself and I love some of the new textures, but others such as Gold Rathian are a little off-putting with the color choice. So you may have seen these textures already throughout this video as I did have the pack active for some time. I also love the old textures and the nostalgia that comes with them. I don't mind the old textures so I eventually uninstalled the texture pack to get the original feel for the game. Also, as of late 2023, a few mods have been added to the Nexus mod manager. I haven't downloaded any myself, but I am intrigued by these creators and the possibility for more mods in the future. Incognito Man has also created a Freedom Unite complete project I have yet to explore myself that adds many amazing features like adding all the event quests and challenge quests into the game, guild hall drink buffs, full chest access in the gathering hall, and much more. This is apparently, using his words exactly, 
Ghostly, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite localization ported over and Japanese exclusive content translated to English. Overall, a super cool project any Monster Hunter Freedom Unite fan should definitely check out, myself included. If you guys want to see gameplay of this, I saw SD Shepard, a YouTuber that inspired me to make Monster Hunter videos, live stream some of this awesome content. With that, I will now come to my final thoughts on this amazing game. Monster Hunter has always been one of my favorite game franchises of all time. Monster Hunter Freedom Unite in particular is still one of my favorite games, even with all the quality of life changes added in the newer titles. That doesn't mean this game is perfect though. Many things could have been improved upon between Monster Hunter Freedom 2 and Unite. Too big of hitboxes, little to no game information on skills and damage calculations, and unforgiving RNG through many of the game's mechanics just to name a few. But it's the little things in this game that add up to make it the amazing experience many fans know and love. These simple melodies and epic musical performances scattered throughout the game, amazing weapon slash armor design, and the accomplishment you get after soloing a G rank quest are all the things that keep drawing me back to this decade old game. I hope this video sheds light on Monster Hunter Freedom Unite and the older games as a whole, that they can still add up to their newer, more user-friendly counterparts. Yes, many of the quality of life changes are hard to lose, but you gain a whole new experience where you can approach certain monsters or quests much differently than you would in the newer games. I wanted to thank all the content creators that inspired me to make this project, such as Patrician TV, SD Shepard and the Teamwork cast, Jacob Monster Hunter, and Super Rad to name a few. I also wanted to thank all my friends and family for supporting me on making this video. Especially my brother and Kirk who helped me clear most of the game online as we got our old hunting party back together. I also wanted to thank my girlfriend who had to deal with me recording for hours and hours on end in our office. I will post links to many of the sources I used in this video for anyone that wishes to look further into the information I used for this video. This project would not have been possible without all the authors that posted on the Monster Hunter Freedom Unite game FAQ website, so another big thanks to all of them. Most importantly, I want to thank all my viewers that have made it this far in the video, and of course all of my subscribers. I wouldn't have made this video in the first place if it wasn't for all of you amazing people. As always, I hope you all are having a wonderful day, and I will see you all in the Gathering Hall. Peace out.